Chapter Twenty Four of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty Four. Treats on a very poor subject, but is a short one and may be found of importance in this history. It was no unfit messenger of death who had disturbed the quiet of the matron's room. Her body was bent by age, her limbs trembled with palsy, her face, distorted into a mumbling leer, resembled more the grotesque shaping of some wild pencil than the work of nature's hand. Alas! How few of nature's faces are left alone to gladden us with their beauty! The cares and sorrows and hungerings of the world change them as they change hearts, and it is only when those passions sleep and have lost their hold for ever that the troubled clouds pass off and leave heaven's surface clear. It is a common thing for the countenances of the dead, even in that fixed and rigid state, to subside into the long-forgotten expression of sleeping infancy, and settle into the very look of early life. So calm, so peaceful, do they grow again, that those who knew them in their happy childhood kneel by the coffin's side in awe, and see the angel even upon earth. The old crone tottered along the passages and up the stairs, muttering some indistinct answers to the chiding of her companion. Being at length compelled to pause for breath, she gave the light into her hand, and remained behind to follow as she might, while the more nimble superior made her way to the room where the sick woman lay. It was a bare garret room, with a dim light burning at the farther end. There was another old woman watching by the bed. The parish apothecary's apprentice was standing by the fire, making a toothpick out of a quill. "'Cold night, Mrs. Corney,' said this young gentleman, as the matron entered. "'Very cold indeed, sir,' replied the mistress in her most civil tones, and dropping a curtsy as she spoke. "'You should get better colds out of your contractors,' said the apothecary's deputy, breaking a lump on the top of the fire with a rusty poker. "'These are not at all the sort of thing for a cold night.' "'They're the port's choosing, sir,' returned the matron. "'The least they could do would be to keep us pretty warm, for our places are hard enough.' The conversation was here interrupted by a moan from the sick woman. "'Oh!' said the young man, turning his face towards the bed, as if he had previously quite forgotten the patient. "'Is all U.P. there, Mrs. Corney?' "'It is, is it, sir?' asked the matron. "'If she lasts a couple of hours, I shall be surprised,' said the apothecary's apprentice, intent upon the toothpick's point. "'It's a break-up of the system altogether. Is she dozing, old lady?' The attendant stooped over the bed to ascertain, and nodded in the affirmative. "'Then perhaps she'll go off in that way, if you don't make a row,' said the young man. "'Put the light on the floor. She won't see it there.' The attendant did as she was told, shaking her head meanwhile, to intimate that the woman would not die so easily. Having done so, she resumed her seat by the side of the other nurse, who had by this time returned. The mistress, with an expression of impatience, wrapped herself in her shawl, and sat at the foot of the bed. The apothecary's apprentice, having completed the manufacture of the toothpick, planted himself in front of the fire, and made good use of it, for ten minutes or so. When apparently growing rather dull, he wished Mrs. Corney joy of her job, and took himself off on tiptoe. When they had sat in silence for some time, the two old women rose from the bed, and crouching over the fire, held out their withered hands to catch the heat. The flame threw a ghastly light on their shrivelled faces, and made their ugliness appear terrible, as, in this position, they began to converse in a low voice. "'Did she say any more, any dear, while I was gone?' inquired the messenger. "'Not a word,' replied the other. "'She plucked and tore at her arms for a little time, but I held her hands, and she soon dropped off. She hasn't much strength in her, so I easily kept her quiet. I ain't so weak for an old woman, although I am on parish allowance. No, no.' "'Did she drink the hot wine the doctor said she was to have?' demanded the first. "'I tried to get it down.' rejoined the other, but her teeth were tight-set, and she clenched the mug so hard that it was as much as I could do to get it back again. So I drank it, and it did me good." 
looking cautiously round, to ascertain that they were not overheard, the two hags cowered nearer to the fire, and chuckled heartily. "'I mind the time,' said the first speaker, "'when she would have done the same, and made rare fun of it afterwards.' "'Aye, that she would,' rejoined the other. "'She had a merry heart. A many, many beautiful corpses she laid out, as nice and neat as waxwork. My old eyes have seen them, aye, and those old hands touched them too, for I have helped her scores of times." Stretching forth her trembling fingers as she spoke, the old creature shook them exultingly before her face, and fumbling in her pocket, brought out an old-time discoloured tin snuff-box, from which she shook a few grains into the outstretched palm of her companion, and a few more into her own. While they were thus employed, the matron, who had been impatiently watching until the dying woman should awaken from her stupor, joined them by the fire, and sharply asked how long she was to wait. "'Not long, mistress,' replied the second woman, looking up into her face. "'We have none of us long to wait for death. Patience, patience. He'll be here soon enough for us all.' "'Hold your tongue, you doting idiot!' said the matron sternly. "'You, Martha, tell me, has she been in this way before?' "'Often,' answered the first woman. "'But we'll never be again,' added the second one. "'That is, she'll never wake again but once. And mind, mistress, that won't be for long.' "'Long or short,' said the matron snappishly, "'she won't find me here when she does wake. Take care, both of you. How you worry me again for nothing! It's no part of my duty to see all the old women in the house die, and I won't. That's more. Mind that, you impudent old harridans. If you make a fool of me again, I'll soon cure you, I warrant you." She was bouncing away, when a cry from the two women, who had turned towards the bed, caused her to look round. The patient had raised herself upright, and was stretching her arms towards them. Who's that? she cried in a hollow voice. Hush, hush, said one of the women, stooping over. Lie down, lie down. I'll never lie down again, alive, said the woman, struggling. I will tell her. Come here, nearer. Let me whisper in your ear." She clutched the matron by the arm, and forcing her into a chair by the bedside, was about to speak, when looking round, she caught sight of the two old women bending forward in the attitude of eager listeners. "'Turn them away,' said the woman drowsily. "'Make haste! Make haste!' The two old crones, chiming in together, began pouring out many piteous lamentations, that the poor dear was too far gone to know her best friends, and were uttering sundry protestations that they would never leave her, when the superior pushed them from the room, closed the door, and returned to the bedside. On being excluded, the old ladies changed their tone, and cried through the keyhole that old Sally was drunk, which, indeed, was not unlikely, since, in addition to a moderate dose of opium, prescribed by the apothecary, she was labouring under the effects of a final taste of gin and water, which had been privily administered, in the openness of their hearts, by the worthy old ladies themselves. "'Now, listen to me,' said the dying woman aloud, as if making a great effort to revive one latent spark of energy. "'In this very room, in this very bed, I once nursed a pretty young creature that was brought into the house, with her feet cut and bruised with walking, and all soiled with dust and blood. She gave birth to a boy, and died. Let me think. What was the year again?" "'Never mind the year,' said the impatient auditor. "'What about her?' "'I,' murmured the sick woman, relapsing into a former drowsy state. "'What about her? What about? I know!" she cried, jumping fiercely up, her face flushed and her eyes starting from her head. I robbed her! 
so I did. She wasn't cold. I tell you she wasn't cold when I stole it. Stole what, for God's sake? cried the matron with a gesture as if she would call for help. It, replied the woman, laying her hand over the other's mouth, the only thing she had. She wanted clothes to keep her warm and food to eat. But she had kept it safe and had it in her bosom. It was gold, I tell you, rich gold that might have saved her life. Gold? echoed the matron, bending eagerly over the woman as she fell back. Go on, go on. Yes, what of it? Who was her mother? When was it? She charged me to keep it safe, replied the woman with a groan, and trusted me as the only woman about her. I stole it in my heart when she first showed it me, hanging around her neck, and the child's death, perhaps, is on me besides. They would have treated him better if they had known it all. Known what? asked the other. Speak. The boy grew so like his mother, said the woman, rambling on, and not heeding the question, that I could never forget it when I saw his face. Oh, poor girl, poor girl, she was so young, too, such a gentle lamb. Wait, there's more to tell. I've not told you all, have I? No, no, replied the matron, inclining her head to catch the words, as they came more faintly from the dying woman. Be quick, or it may be too late. The mother, said the woman, making a more violent effort than before, the mother, when the pains of death first came upon her, whispered in my ear, that if her baby was born alive and thrived, the day might come when it would not feel so much disgraced to hear its poor young mother named. And, oh, kind heaven, she said, folding her thin hands together, whether it be boy or girl, raise up some friends for it in this troubled world, and take pity upon a lonely, desolate child, abandoned to its mercy. "'The boy's name?' demanded the matron. "'They called him Oliver,' replied the woman feebly. "'The gold I stole was—' "'Yes, yes, what?' cried the other. She was bending eagerly over the woman to hear her reply, but drew back instinctively, as she once again rose slowly and stiffly into a sitting posture— then clutching the coverlet with both hands, muttered some indistinct sounds in her throat, and fell lifeless on the bed. "'Stone dead!' said one of the old women, hurrying in as soon as the door was opened. "'And nothing to tell after all,' rejoined the matron, walking carelessly away. The two crones, to all appearance, too busily occupied in the preparations for their dreadful duties to make any reply, were left alone hovering about the body. End of chapter 24「Chapter 25 of Oliver Twist This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens Chapter 25 Wherein this history reverts to Mr. Fagan and Company while these things were passing in the country workhouse, Mr. Fagan sat in the old den, the same from which Oliver had been removed by the girl, brooding over a dull smoky fire. He held a pair of bellows upon his knee, with which he had apparently been endeavouring to rouse it into more cheerful action. But he had fallen into deep thought, and with his arms folded on them, and his chin resting on his thumbs, fixed his eyes abstractedly on the rusty bars. At a table behind him sat the artful Dodger, Master Charles Bates, and Mr. Chitling, all intent upon a game of whist, the artful taking dummy against Master Bates and Mr. Chitling. The countenance of the first-named gentleman, peculiarly intelligent at all times, 
acquired great additional interest from his close observance of the game, and his attentive perusal of Mr. Chittling's hand, upon which, from time to time, as occasion served, he bestowed a variety of earnest glances, wisely regulating his own play by the result of his observations upon his neighbour's cards. It being a cold night, the Dodger wore his hat, as indeed was often his custom within doors. He also sustained a clay pipe between his teeth, which he only removed for a brief space when he deemed it necessary to apply for refreshment to a quart pot upon the table, which stood ready filled with gin and water for the accommodation of the company. Master Bates was also attentive to the play, but being of a more excitable nature than his accomplished friend, it was observable that he more frequently applied himself to the gin and water, and moreover indulged in many jests and irrelevant remarks, all highly unbecoming a scientific rubber. Indeed, the artful, presuming upon their close attachment, more than once took occasion to reason gravely with his companion upon these improprieties, all of which remonstrances Master Bates received an extremely good part, merely requesting his friend to be blowed, or to insert his head in a sack, or replying with some other neatly turned witticism of a similar kind, the happy application of which excited considerable admiration in the mind of Mr. Chitling. It was remarkable that the latter gentleman and his partner invariably lost, and that the circumstance, so far from angering Master Bates, appeared to afford him the highest amusement, inasmuch as he laughed most uproariously at the end of every deal, and protested that he had never seen such a jolly game in all his born days. "'That's two doubles and the rub,' said Mr. Chitling, with a very long face as he drew half a crown from his waistcoat pocket. "'I never see such a feller as you, Jack.' "'You win everything, even when we've good cards. Charlie and I can't make nothing of him.' Either the master or the manner of this remark, which was made very ruefully, delighted Charlie Bates so much that his consequent shout of laughter roused the Jew from his reverie, and induced him to inquire what was the matter. "'Matter, Fagin!' cried Charlie. "'I wish you had watched the play. Tommy Chitlin hasn't won a point, and I went partners with him against the artful and dumb.' "'Aye, aye,' said the Jew with a grin, which sufficiently demonstrated that he was at no loss to understand the reason. "'Chime again, Tom, chime again.' "'No more of it for me, thank ye, Bacon,' replied Mr. Chittling. "'I've had enough. That here Dodger has such a run of luck that there's no standing again him.' <laughs> "'My dear,' replied the Jew. "'You must get up very early in the morning to win against the Dodger.' "'Morning,' said Charlie Bates. "'You must put your boots on overnight, and have a telescope at each eye, and an opera glass between your shoulders if you want to come over him.' Mr. Dawkins received these handsome compliments with much philosophy, and offered to cut any gentleman in company for the first picture-card at a shilling at a time. Nobody accepting the challenge, and his pipe being by this time smoked out, he proceeded to amuse himself by sketching a ground plan of Newgate, on the table with a piece of chalk, which had served him in lieu of counters, whistling meantime with peculiar shrillness. "'How precious dull you are, Tommy,' said the Dodger, stopping short, when there had been a long silence, and addressing Mr. Chitling. "'What do you think he's thinking of, Fagin?' "'How should I know, my dear?' replied the Jew, looking round as he plied the bellows. "'About his losses, maybe? Or the little retirement in the country that he's just left, eh? <laughs> Is that it, my dear?' "'Not a bit of it,' replied the Dodger, stopping the subject of discourse as Mr. Chittling was about to reply. "'What do you say, Charlie?' "'I should say,' replied Master Bates with a grin, "'that he was uncommon sweet upon Betsy.' See how he's a-blushing? <laughs> oh, my eye! Here's a merry-go-rounder! Tom Chitlin's in love! Oh, Fagin, Fagin, what a spree!" Thoroughly overpowered with the notion of Mr. Chitling being the victim of the tender passion, Master Bates threw himself back in his chair with such violence that he lost his balance and pitched over upon the floor, where, the accident abating nothing of his merriment, he lay at full length until his laugh was over when he resumed his former position, and began another laugh. "'Never mind him, my dear,' said the Jew, winking at Mr. Dawkins, 
and giving Master Bates a reproving tap with the nozzle of the bellows. "'Betsy's a fine girl. Stick up to her, Tom. Stick up to her.' "'What I mean to say, Fagin,' replied Mr. Chitling, very red in the face, "'is that that isn't anything to anybody here.' "'No more it is,' replied the Jew. "'Charney will talk. Don't mind him, my dear. Don't mind him. Betsy's a fine girl. Do as she bids you, Tom, and you will make your fortune.' "'So I do do as she bids me,' replied Mr. Chitling. "'I shouldn't have been milled if it hadn't been for her advice. But it turned out a good job for you, didn't it, Fagin?' and what six weeks of it? It must come, some time or another, and why not in the winter time when you don't want to go out a walking so much, eh, Fagin? Ah, to be sure, my dear, replied the Jew. You wouldn't mind it again, Tom, would you? asked the Dodger, winking upon Charlie and the Jew, if Bet was all right. I mean to say that I shouldn't, replied Tom angrily. There, now. Ah, who say as much as that I should like to know, eh, Fagin? Nobody, my dear, replied the Jew. Not a soul, Tom. I don't know one of them that would do it besides you. Not one of them, my dear. I might have got clear off if I'd spit upon her, mightn't I, Fagin? Angrily pursued the poor half-witted dupe. A word from me would have done it, wouldn't it, Fagin? To be sure it would, my dear replied the Jew. "'But I didn't blab it, did I, Fagin?' demanded Tom, pouring question upon question with great volubility. "'No, no, to be sure,' replied the Jew. "'You were too stout-hearted for that. A deal too stout, my dear.' "'Perhaps I was,' rejoined Tom, looking round. "'And if I was, what's to laugh at in that, eh, Fagin?' The Jew, perceiving that Mr. Chitling was considerably roused, hastened to assure him that nobody was laughing, and to prove the gravity of the company appealed to Master Bates, the principal offender. But, unfortunately, Charlie, in opening his mouth to reply that he was never more serious in his life, was unable to prevent the escape of such a violent roar that the abused Mr. Chitling, without any preliminary ceremonies, rushed across the room and aimed a blow at the offender who, being skilled in evading pursuit, ducked to avoid it, and chose his time so well that it lighted on the chest of the merry old gentleman, and caused him to stagger to the wall, where he stood panting for breath, while Mr. Chitling looked on in intense dismay. "'Hark!' cried the Dodger at this moment. "'I hear the tinkler!' Catching up the light, he crept softly upstairs. The bell was rung again, with some impatience, while the party were in darkness. After a short pause, the Dodger reappeared and whispered Fagin mysteriously. "'What?' cried the Jew. "'Alone?' The Dodger nodded in the affirmative, and, shading the flame of the candle with his hand, gave Charlie Bates a private intimation, in dumb show, that he had better not be funny just then. Having performed this friendly office, he fixed his eyes on the Jew's face, and awaited his directions. The old man bit his yellow fingers, and meditated for some seconds, his face working with agitation the while, as if he dreaded something, and feared to know the worst. At length he raised his head. "'Where is he?' he asked. The Dodger pointed to the floor above, and made a gesture as if to leave the room. "'Yes,' said the Jew, answering the mute inquiry. "'Bring him down. Hush! Quiet, Charlie. Gently, Tom. Scarce. Scarce. This brief direction to Charlie Bates, and his recent antagonist, was softly and immediately obeyed. There was no sound of their whereabout when the Dodger descended the stairs, bearing the light in his hand, and followed by a man in a coarse smock-frock, who, after casting a hurried glance round the room, pulled off a large wrapper which had concealed the lower portion of his face, and disclosed, all haggard, unwashed and unshorn, the features of Flash Toby Crackett. "'How are you, Faggy?' said this worthy, nodding to the Jew. "'Pop that shawl away in my caster, Dodger, so that I may know where to find it when I cut. That's the time of day. 
"'You'll be a fine young cracksman afore the old far now.' With these words he pulled up the smock-frock, and, winding it round his middle, drew a chair to the fire, and placed his feet upon the hob. "'See there, Faggy,' he said, pointing disconsolately to his top-boots. "'Not a drop of day in Martin since you know when. Not a bubble of blacking, by Jove. But don't look at me in that way, man. All in good time. I can't talk about business till I've eat and drank. So produce the sustenance, and let's have a quiet fill-out for the first time these three days.' The Jew motioned to the dodger to place what eatables there were upon the table, and seating himself opposite the housebreaker, waited his leisure. To judge from appearances, Toby was by no means in a hurry to open the conversation. At first, the Jew contented himself with patiently watching his countenance, as if to gain from its expression some clue to the intelligence he brought, but in vain. He looked tired and worn, but there was the same complacent repose upon his features that they always wore, and through dirt and beard and whisker there still shone unimpaired the self-satisfied smirk of flash Toby Crackett. Then the Jew, in an agony of impatience, watched every morsel he put into his mouth, pacing up and down the room, meanwhile in irrepressible excitement. It was all of no use. Toby continued to eat with the utmost outward indifference, until he could eat no more. Then, ordering the dodger out, he closed the door, mixed a glass of spirits and water, and composed himself for talking. First and foremost, Faggy,' said Toby. "'Yes, yes,' interposed the Jew, drawing up his chair. Mr. Crackett stopped to take a draught of spirits and water, and to declare that the gin was excellent. Then, placing his feet against the low mantelpiece, so as to bring his boots to about the level of his eye, he quietly resumed. First and foremost, Faggy,' said the housebreaker, "'how's Bill?' "'What?' screamed the Jew, starting from his seat. "'Why, you don't mean to say,' began Toby, turning pale. "'Mean?' cried the Jew, stamping furiously on the ground. "'Where are they? Sykes and the boy! Where are they? Where have they been? Where are they hiding?' "'Why have they not been here?' "'A crack failed,' said Toby faintly. "'I know it,' replied the Jew, tearing a newspaper from his pocket and pointing to it. "'What more?' "'They fired and hit the boy. We cut over the fields at the back, with him between us, straight as the crow flies, through edge and ditch. They gave chase. Damn! The whole country was awake, and the dogs upon us.' "'The boy!' "'Bill had him on his back, and scudded like the wind. "'We stopped to take him between us. "'His head hung down, and he was cold. "'They were close upon our heels, every man for himself, and each from the gallows. "'We parted company, and left the youngster lying in a ditch. "'Alive or dead, that's all I know about him.' "'The Jew stopped to hear no more, but uttering a loud yell, "'and twining his hands in his hair, rushed from the room and from the house.' End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 of Oliver Twist – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter 26 – In which a mysterious character appears upon the scene, and many things, inseparable from this history, are done and performed. The old man had gained the street corner before he began to recover the effect of Toby Crackett's intelligence. He had relaxed nothing of his unusual speed, but was still pressing onward in the same wild and disordered manner, when the sudden dashing past of a carriage, and a boisterous cry from the foot-passengers who saw his danger, drove him back upon the pavement. Avoiding as much as was possible all the main streets, and skulking only through the byways and alleys, he at length emerged on Snow Hill. Here he walked even faster than before. Nor did he linger until he had again turned into a court, when, as if conscious that he was now in his proper element, he fell into his usual shuffling pace, and seemed to breathe more freely. Near to the spot on which Snow Hill and Hoban Hill meet, opens, 
upon the right hand as you come out of the city, a narrow and dismal alley leading to Saffron Hill. In its filthy shops are exposed for sale huge bunches of second-hand silk handkerchiefs of all sizes and patterns, for here reside the traders who purchase them from the pickpockets. Hundreds of these handkerchiefs hang dangling from pegs outside the windows or flaunting from the doorposts, and the shelves within are piled with them. Confined as the limits of Field Lane are, it has its barber, its coffee shop, its beer shop, and its fried fish warehouse. It is a commercial colony of itself, the emporium of petty larceny, visited at early morning and setting in of dusk by silent merchants who traffic in dark back parlours and who go as strangely as they come. Here the clothesman, the shoe vamper, and the rag merchant display their goods as signboards to the petty thief. Here stores of old iron and bones and heaps of mildewy fragments of woollen stuff and linen rust and rot in the grimy cellars. It was into this place that the Jew turned. He was well known to the sallow denizens of the lane, for such of them as were on the lookout to buy or sell nodded familiarly as he passed along. He replied to their salutations in the same way, but bestowed no closer recognition until he reached the further end of the alley, when he stopped to address a salesman of small stature, who had squeezed as much of his person into a child's chair as the chair would hold, and was smoking a pipe at his warehouse door. "'Why, the sight of you, Mr. Fagin, would cure the hop me said this respectable trader in acknowledgment of the Jew's inquiry after his health. "'The neighbourhood was a little too hot, Lively,' said Fagin, elevating his eyebrows and crossing his hands upon his shoulders. "'Well, I heard that complaints of it once or twice before,' replied the trader. "'But it soon cools down again. Don't you find it so?' Fagin nodded in the affirmative. Pointing in the direction of Saffron Hill, he inquired whether any one was up yonder to-night. "'That's the cripples,' inquired the man. The Jew nodded. "'Let me see,' pursued the merchant, reflecting. "'Yes, there's some half a dozen of them gone in. That I knows. I don't think your friend's there.' "'Sykes is not, I suppose?' inquired the Jew with a disappointed countenance. "'Lorn is wentus, as the lawyers say,' replied the little man, shaking his head and looking amazingly sly. "'Have you got anything in my line to-night?' "'Nothing to-night,' said the Jew, turning away. "'Are you going out to the cripples, Fagin?' cried the little man, calling after him. "Stop." "'I don't mind if I have a drop there with you.' But as the Jew, looking back, waved his hand to intimate that he preferred being alone, and, moreover, as the little man could not very easily disengage himself from the chair, the sign of the cripples was, for a time, bereft of the advantage of Mr. Lively's presence. By the time he had got upon his legs, the Jew had disappeared. So Mr. Lively, after ineffectually standing on tiptoe, in the hope of catching sight of him, again forced himself into the little chair, and, exchanging a shake of the head with a lady in the opposite shop, in which doubt and mistrust were plainly mingled, resumed his pipe with a grave demeanour. The three cripples, or rather the cripples, which was the sign by which the establishment was familiarly known to its patrons, was the public-house in which Mr. Sykes and his dog have already figured. Merely making a sign to a man at the bar, Fagin walked straight upstairs, and opening the door of a room, and softly insinuating himself into the chamber, looked anxiously about, shading his eyes with his hand, as if in search of some particular person. The room was illuminated by two gaslights, the glare of which was prevented by the barred shutters and closely drawn curtains of faded red from being visible outside. The ceiling was blackened, to prevent its colour from being injured by the flaring of the lamps, and the place was so full of dense tobacco smoke that at first it was scarcely possible to discern anything more. By degrees, however, as some of it cleared away through the open door, an assemblage of heads, as confused as the noises that greeted the ear, 
might be made out, and as the eye grew more accustomed to the scene, the spectator gradually became aware of the presence of a numerous company, male and female, crowded round a long table, at the upper end of which sat a chairman with a hammer of office in his hand, while a professional gentleman with a bluish nose, and his face tied up for the benefit of a toothache, presided at a jingling piano in a remote corner. As Fagin stepped softly in, the professional gentleman, running over the keys by way of prelude, occasioned a general cry of order for a song, which, having subsided, a young lady proceeded to entertain the company with a ballad and four verses, between each of which the accompanist played the melody all through, as loud as he could. When this was over, the chairman made a sentiment, after which the professional gentleman on the chairman's right and left volunteered a duet, and sang it with great applause. It was curious to observe some faces which stood out prominently from among the group. There was the chairman himself, the landlord of the house, a coarse, rough, heavy-built fellow, who, while the songs were proceeding, rolled his eyes hither and thither, and, seeming to give himself up to joviality, had an eye for everything that was done, and an ear for everything that was said, and sharp ones, too. Near him were the singers, receiving with professional indifference the compliments of the company, and applying themselves in turn to a dozen proffered glasses of spirits and water, tendered by their more boisterous admirers, whose countenances, expressive of almost every vice in almost every grade, irresistibly attracted the attention by their very repulsiveness. Cunning, ferocity, and drunkenness in all its stages were there, in their strongest aspect, and women, some with the last lingering tinge of their early freshness almost fading as you looked, others with every mark and stamp of their sex utterly beaten out, and presenting but one loathsome blank of profligacy and crime. Some mere girls, others but young women, and none past the prime of life, formed the darkest and saddest portion of this dreary picture. Fagin, troubled by no grave emotions, looked eagerly from face to face while these proceedings were in progress but apparently without meeting that of which he was in search. Succeeding at length in catching the eye of the man who occupied the chair, he beckoned to him slightly, and left the room as quietly as he had entered it. "'What can I do for you, Mr. Fagin?' inquired the man, as he followed him out to the landing. "'Won't you join us? They'll be delighted, every one of them.' The Jew shook his head impatiently, and said in a whisper, "'Is he here?' "'No,' replied the man. "'And no news of Barney?' inquired Fagin. "'None,' replied the landlord of the cripples, for it was he. "'He won't stir till it's all safe. Depend on it, they're on the scent down there, and that if he moved he'd blow upon the thing at once. He's all right enough, Barney is, else I should have heard of him. I'll pound it. That Barney's managing properly. Let him alone for that.' "'Will he be here to-night?' asked the Jew, laying the same emphasis on the pronoun as before. "'Monks, do you mean?' inquired the landlord, hesitating. "'Hush!' said the Jew. "'Yes.' "'Certain,' replied the man, drawing a gold watch from his fob. "'I expect him here before now. If you wait ten minutes, he'll be—' "'No, no,' said the Jew hastily as though, however desirous he might be to see the person in question, he was nevertheless relieved by his absence. "'Tell him I came here to see him, and that he must come to me to-night. No, say, to-morrow. As he is not here, to-morrow will be time enough.' "'Good,' said the man. "'Nothing more?' "'Not a word now,' said the Jew, descending the stairs. "'I say,' said the other, looking over the rails and speaking in a hoarse whisper, "'What a time this would be for a cell! I've got Phil Barker here, so drunk that a boy might take him.' "'Ah, but it's not Phil Barker's time,' said the Jew, looking up. "'Phil has something more to do before we can afford to part with him. So go back to the company, my dear.' and tell them to lead merry lives while they last." 
the landlord reciprocated the old man's laugh, and returned to his guests. The Jew was no sooner alone than his countenance resumed its former expression of anxiety and thought. After a brief reflection, he called a hack cabriolet, and bade the man drive towards Bethnal Green. He dismissed him within some quarter of a mile of Mr. Sykes's residence, and performed the short remainder of the distance on foot. Now, muttered the Jew as he knocked at the door, if there is any deep play here, I shall have it out of you, my girl, cunning as you are. She was in her room, the woman said. Fagin crept softly upstairs and entered it without any previous ceremony. The girl was alone, lying with her head upon the table and her hair straggling over it. She has been drinking thought the Jew coolly, or perhaps she is only miserable. The old man turned to close the door, as he made this reflection. The noise thus occasioned roused the girl. She eyed his crafty face narrowly, as she inquired to his recital of Toby Crackett's story. When it was concluded, she sank into her former attitude, but spoke not a word. She pushed the candle impatiently away, and once or twice, as she feverishly changed her position, shuffled her feet upon the ground, but this was all. During the silence, the Jew looked restlessly about the room, as if to assure himself that there were no appearances of Sykes having covertly returned. Apparently satisfied with his inspection, he coughed twice or thrice, and made as many efforts to open a conversation, but the girl heeded him no more than if he had been made of stone. At length he made another attempt, and rubbing his hands together, said in his most conciliatory tone, "'And where should you think Bill was now, my dear?' The girl moaned out some half-intelligible reply, that she could not tell, and seemed from the smothered noise that escaped her to be crying. "'And the boy, too?' said the Jew, straining his eyes to catch a glimpse of her face. "'Poor little child! Left in a ditch, Nance!' "'Only think—' "'A child,' said the girl, suddenly looking up, "'is better where he is than among us. "'And if no harm comes to Bill from it, "'I hope he lies dead in the ditch, "'and that his young bones may rot there.' "'What?' cried the Jew, in amazement. "'Aye, I, I do,' returned the girl, meeting his gaze. "'I shall be glad to have him away from my eyes, "'and to know that the worst is over. "'I can't bear to have him about me.' The sight of him turns me against myself and all of you. Pooh, said the Jew scornfully. You're drunk. Am I? cried the girl bitterly. It's no fault of yours if I am not. You'd never have me anything else, if you had your will. Except now, the humour doesn't suit you, does it? No, rejoined the Jew furiously. It does not. Change it, then responded the girl with a laugh. "'Change it!' exclaimed the Jew, exasperated beyond all bounds by his companion's unexpected obstinacy, and the vexation of the night. "'I will change it. Listen to me, you drab. Listen to me, who with six words can strangle Sykes as surely as if I had his bull's throat between my fingers now. If he comes back, and leaves the boy behind him, if he gets off free, and dead or alive, fails to restore him to me, murder him yourself if you would have him escape, Jack Ketch, and do it the moment he sets foot in this room, or mind me, it will be too late." "'What is all this?' cried the girl involuntarily. "'What is it?' pursued Fagin, mad with rage, when the boy's worth hundreds of pounds to me, am I to lose what chance threw me in the way of getting safely through the whims of a drunken gang that I could whistle away the lives of, and me bound, too, to a born devil that only wants the will and has the power to—to—" to... <sighs> Panting for breath, the old man stammered for a word, and in that instant checked the torrent of his wrath and changed his whole demeanour. A moment before, his clenched hands had grasped the air, his eyes had dilated, and his face grown livid with passion. 
but now he shrunk into a chair, and, cowering together, trembled with the apprehension of having himself disclosed some hidden villainy. After a short silence, he ventured to look around at his companion. He appeared somewhat reassured, on beholding her in the same listless attitude from which he had first roused her. "'Nancy, dear,' croaked the Jew in his usual voice, "'did you mind me, dear?' "'Don't worry me now, Fagin,' replied the girl, raising her head languidly. "'If Bill has not done it this time, he will another. He has done many a good job for you, and will do many more when he can, and when he can't, he won't. So no more about that.' "'Regarding this boy, my dear,' said the Jew, rubbing the palms of his hands nervously together. "'The boy must take his chance with the rest,' interrupted Nancy hastily. "'And I say again, I hope he is dead, and out of harm's way, and out of yours. That is, if Bill comes to no harm. And if Toby got clear off, Bill's pretty sure to be safe, for Bill's worth two of Toby any time.' "'And—' "'About what I was saying, my dear,' observed the Jew, keeping his glistening eye steadily upon her. "'You must say it all over again, if it's anything you want me to do,' rejoined Nancy. "'And if it is, you had better wait till to-morrow. You put me up for a minute, but now I'm stupid again.' Fagin put several other questions, all with the same drift of ascertaining whether the girl had profited by his unguarded hints. But she answered them so readily— and was withal so utterly unmoved by his searching looks, that his original impression of her being more than a trifle in liquor was confirmed. Nancy, indeed, was not exempt from a failing which is very common among the Jews' female pupils, and in which, in their tenderer years, they were rather encouraged than checked. Her disordered appearance, and a wholesale perfume of Geneva which pervaded the apartment, afforded strong confirmatory evidence of the justice of the Jews' supposition and when, after indulging in the temporary display of violence above described, she subsided, first into dullness, and afterwards into a compound of feelings, under the influence of which she shed tears one minute, and in the next gave utterance to various exclamations of, Never say die, and diverse calculations as to what might be the amount of the odds, so long as a lady or gentleman was happy. Mr. Fagin, who had had considerable experience of such matters in his time, saw with great satisfaction that she was very far gone indeed. Having eased his mind by this discovery, and having accomplished his twofold object of imparting to the girl what he had, that night, heard, and of ascertaining with his own eyes that Sykes had not returned, Mr. Bagan again turned his face homeward, leaving his young friend asleep with her head upon the table. It was within an hour of midnight. The weather being dark and piercing cold, he had no great temptation to loiter. The sharp wind that scoured the streets seemed to have cleared them of passengers, as of dust and mud, for few people were abroad, and they were to all appearance hastening fast home. It blew from the right quarter for the Jew, however, and straight before it he went, trembling and shivering as every fresh gust drove him rudely on his way. He had reached the corner of his own street, and was already fumbling in his pocket for the door-key when a dark figure emerged from a projecting entrance which lay in deep shadow, and, crossing the road, glided up to him unperceived. "'Fagin!' whispered a voice close to his ear. "'Ah!' said the Jew, turning quickly round. "'Is that—' "'Yes,' interrupted the stranger. "'I have been lingering here these two hours. Where the devil have you been?' "'On your business, my dear.' replied the Jew, glancing uneasily at his companion, and slackening his pace as he spoke. "'On your business all night?' "'Oh, of course,' said the stranger with a sneer. "'Well, and what's come of it?' "'Nothing good,' said the Jew. "'Nothing bad, I hope,' said the stranger, stopping short, and turning a startled look on his companion. The Jew shook his head, and was about to reply— when the stranger, interrupting him, motioned to the house before which they had by this time arrived, remarking that he had better say what he had got to say under cover, for his blood was chilled with standing about so long, and the wind blew through him. Fagin looked as if he could have willingly excused himself from taking home a visitor at that unseasonable hour, 
and, indeed, muttered something about having no fire. But his companion, repeating his request in a peremptory manner, he unlocked the door, and requested him to close it softly, while he got a light. "'It's as dark as the grave,' said the man, groping forward a few steps. "'Make haste!' "'Shut the door!' whispered Fagin from the end of the passage. As he spoke, it closed with a loud noise. "'That wasn't my doing,' said the other man, feeling his way. "'The wind blew it too, or it shut of its own accord, one or the other. Look sharp with the light, or I shall knock my brains out against something in this confounded hole.' Fagin stealthily descended the kitchen stairs. After a short absence, he returned with a lighted candle and the intelligence that Toby Crackett was asleep in the back room below, and that the boys were in the front one. Beckoning the man to follow him, he led the way upstairs. "'We can say the few words we've got to say in here, my dear,' said the Jew, throwing open a door on the first floor. "'And as there are holes in the shutters, and we never show lights to our neighbours, we'll set the candle on the stairs. There. With those words, the Jew, stooping down, placed the candle on an upper flight of stairs, exactly opposite to the room door. This done, he led the way into the apartment, which was destitute of all movables save a broken armchair, and an old couch or sofa without covering, which stood behind the door. Upon this piece of furniture the stranger sat himself with the air of a weary man, and the Jew, drawing up the armchair opposite, they sat face to face. It was not quite dark. The door was partially open, and the candle outside threw a feeble reflection on the opposite wall. They conversed for some time in whispers, though nothing of the conversation was distinguishable beyond a few disjointed words here and there. A listener might easily have perceived that Fagin appeared to be defending himself against some remarks of the stranger, and that the latter was in a state of considerable irritation. They might have been talking, thus, for a quarter of an hour or more, when Monks, by which name the Jew had designated the strange man several times in the course of their colloquy, said, raising his voice a little, "'I tell you again, it was badly planned. Why not have kept him here among the rest, and made a sneaking, snivelling pickpocket of him at once?' "'Only hear him!' exclaimed the Jew, shrugging his shoulders. "'Why, do you mean to say you couldn't have done it if you had chosen?' demanded Monk sternly. Haven't you done it with other boys scores of times? If you had had patience for a twelve-month at most, couldn't you have got him convicted and sent safely out of the kingdom, perhaps for life? Whose turn would that have served, my dear? inquired the Jew humbly. Mine, replied Monks. But not mine, said the Jew submissively. He might have become of use to me. When there are two parties to a bargain, it is only reasonable that the interests of both should be consulted, is it, my good friend?" "'What, then?' demanded Monks. "'I saw it was not easy to train him to the business,' replied the Jew. "'He was not like other boys in the same circumstances.' "'Curse him, no,' muttered the man, "'or he would have been a thief long ago. "'I had no hold upon him to make him worse,' pursued the Jew, anxiously watching the countenance of his companion. "'His hand was not in. I had nothing to frighten him with, which we always must have in the beginning, or we labour in vain. What could I do? Send him out with the Dodger and Charlie? We had enough of that at first, my dear. I trembled for us all.' "'That was not my doing,' observed Monks. "'No, no, my dear,' renewed the Jew, "'and I don't quarrel with it now, because, if it had never happened, you might never have clapped eyes on the boy to notice him, and so led to the discovery that it was him you were looking for. Well, I got him back for you by means of the girl, and then— she begins to favour him. Throttle the girl, said Monks impatiently. Why, we can't afford to do that just now, my dear, replied the Jew, smiling. And, besides, 
that sort of thing is not in our way, or one of these days I might be glad to have it done. I know what these girls are, Monks, well. As soon as the boy begins to harden, she'll care no more for him than for a block of wood. You want him made a thief? If he is alive, I can make him one from this time, and if— if— said the Jew, drawing nearer to the other. It's not likely, mind. But if the worst comes to the worst, and he is dead— It's no fault of mine if he is, interposed the other man with a look of terror, and clasping the Jew's arm with trembling hands. Mind that, Fagin. I had no hand in it. Anything but his death I told you from the first. I won't shed blood. It's always found out, and haunts a man besides. If they shot him dead, I was not the cause. Do you hear me? Fire this infernal den. What's that? What? cried the Jew, grasping the coward round the body with both arms as he sprung to his feet. Where? Yonder, replied the man, glaring at the opposite wall. A shadow. I saw the shadow of a woman, in a cloak and bonnet, pass along the wainscot like a breath. The Jew released his hold, and they rushed tumultuously from the room. The candle, wasted by the draught, was standing where it had been placed. It showed them only the empty staircase, and their own white faces. They listened intently. A profound silence reigned throughout the house. "'It's your fancy,' said the Jew, taking up the light, and turning to his companion. "'I'll swear I saw it,' replied Monks, trembling. "'It was bending forward when I saw it first, and when I spoke, it darted away.' The Jew glanced contemptuously at the pale face of his associate, and, telling him he could follow if he pleased, ascended the stairs. They looked into all the rooms. They were cold, bare, and empty. They descended into the passage, and thence into the cellars below. The green damp hung upon the low walls. The tracks of the snail and slug glistened in the light of the candle, but all was still as death. "'What do you think now?' said the Jew, when they had regained the passage. "'Besides ourselves, there's not a creature in the house, except Toby and the boys, and they're safe enough. See here.' As a proof of the fact, the Jew drew forth two keys from his pocket, and explained that when he first went downstairs, he had locked them in, to prevent any intrusion on the conference. This accumulated testimony effectually staggered Mr. Monks. His protestations had gradually become less and less vehement, as they proceeded in their search without making any discovery. And now he gave vent to several very grim laughs, and confessed it could only have been his excited imagination. He declined any renewal of the conversation, however, for that night, suddenly remembering that it was past one o'clock, and so the amiable couple parted. End of chapter 26《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》
Towards this end, indeed, he had purposed to introduce, in this place, a dissertation touching the divine right of beadles, and elucidative of the position that a beadle can do no wrong, which could not fail to have been both pleasurable and profitable to the right-minded reader, but which he is unfortunately compelled, by want of time and space, to postpone to some more convenient and fitting opportunity on the arrival of which he will be prepared to show that a beadle properly constituted, that is to say, a parochial beadle, attached to a parochial workhouse, and attending in his official capacity the parochial church, is, in right and virtue of his office, possessed of all the excellences and best qualities of humanity, and that to none of those excellences can mere companies beadles, or court of law beadles, or even chapel of ease beadles, save the last, and they in a very lowly and inferior degree, lay the remotest sustainable claim. Mr. Bumble had recounted the teaspoons, re-weighed the sugar-tongs, made a closer inspection of the milk-pot, and ascertained to a nicety the exact condition of the furniture, down to the very horsehair seats of the chairs, and had repeated each process full half a dozen times, before he began to think that it was time for Mrs. Corney to return. Thinking begets thinking. As there were no sounds of Mrs. Corney's approach, it occurred to Mr. Bumble that it would be an innocent and virtuous way of spending the time, if he were further to allay his curiosity by a cursory glance at the interior of Mrs. Corney's chest of drawers. Having listened at the keyhole, to assure himself that nobody was approaching the chamber, Mr. Bumble, beginning at the bottom, proceeded to make himself acquainted with the contents of the three long drawers which, being filled with various garments of good fashion and texture, carefully preserved between two layers of old newspapers, speckled with dried lavender, seemed to yield him exceeding satisfaction. Arriving in course of time at the right-hand corner drawer, in which was the key, and beholding therein a small padlocked box, which, being shaken, gave forth a pleasant sound, as if of the chinking of coin, Mr. Bumble returned with a stately walk to the fireplace and, resuming his old attitude, said, with a grave and determined air, "'I'll do it.' He followed up this remarkable declaration by shaking his head in a waggish manner for ten minutes, as though he were remonstrating with himself for being such a pleasant dog. And then he took a view of his legs and profile with much seeming pleasure and interest. He was still placidly engaged in this latter survey, when Mrs. Corney, hurrying into the room, threw herself in a breathless state on a chair by the fireside, and covering her eyes with one hand, placed the other over her heart, and gasped for breath. "'Mrs. Corney,' said Mr. Bumble, stooping over the matron, "'what is this, ma'am? Has anything happened, ma'am? Pray answer me. I'm on—on—' Mr. Bumble, in his alarm, could not immediately think of the word tenterhooks, so he said, broken bottles. "'Oh!' "'Mr. Bumble!' cried the lady. "'I have been so dreadfully put out!' "'Put out, ma'am?' exclaimed Mr. Bumble. "'Who has dared to—' "'I know,' said Mr. Bumble, checking himself with native majesty. "'This is them wishes paupers.' "'It's dreadful to think of,' said the lady, shuddering. "'Then don't think of it, ma'am.' rejoined Mr. Bumble. "'I can't help it,' whimpered the lady. "'Then take something, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble, soothingly. "'A little of the wine?' "'Not for the world,' replied Mrs. Corney. "'I couldn't. Oh, the top shelf in the right-hand corner. Oh!' Uttering these words, the good lady pointed distractedly to the cupboard, and underwent a convulsion from internal spasms. Mr. Bumble rushed to the closet, and, snatching a pint green glass bottle from the shelf, thus incoherently indicated, filled a teacup with its contents, and held it to the lady's lips. Oh, I'm better now, said Mrs. Corney, falling back after drinking half of it. Mr. Bumble raised his eyes piously to the ceiling in thankfulness, and bringing them down again to the brim of the cup, lifted it to his nose. Peppermint! exclaimed Mrs. Corney, in a faint voice, smiling gently on the beadle as she spoke. Uh, "'Try it. Uh, there's a little—a uh, little—something uh, else in it.' Mr. Bumble tasted the medicine with a doubtful look, smacked his lips, took another taste, and put the cup down empty. "'It's very comforting,' 
said Mrs. Corney. "'Very much so indeed, ma'am,' said the beadle. As he spoke, he drew a chair beside the matron, and tenderly inquired what had happened to distress her. "'Nothing,' replied Mrs. Corney. "'I'm a foolish, excitable, weak creature.' "'Not weak, ma'am,' retorted Mr. Bumble, drawing his chair a little closer. "'Are you a weak creature, Mrs. Corney?' "'We're all weak creatures,' said Mrs. Corney, laying down a general principle. "'So we are,' said the beadle. Nothing was said on either side for a minute or two afterwards. By the expiration of that time, Mr. Bumble had illustrated the position by removing his left arm from the back of Mrs. Corney's chair, where it had previously rested, to Mrs. Corney's apron-string, round which it gradually became entwined. "'We are all weak creatures,' said Mr. Bumble. Mrs. Corney sighed. "'Don't sigh, Mrs. Corney,' said Mr. Bumble. "'I can't help it.' said Mrs. Corney, and she sighed again. "'This is a very comfortable room, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble, looking round. "'Another room, and this, ma'am, would be a complete thing.' "'It would be too much for one,' murmured the lady. "'But not for two, ma'am,' rejoined Mr. Bumble, in soft accents. "'Eh, Mrs. Corney?' Mrs. Corney drooped her head, when the beadle said this. The beadle drooped his, to get a view of Mrs. Corney's face. Mrs. Corney, with great propriety, turned her head away, and released her hand to get at her pocket-handkerchief, but insensibly replaced it in that of Mr. Bumble. "'The board allows you coals, don't they, Mrs. Corney?' inquired the beadle, affectionately pressing her hand. "'And candles,' replied Mrs. Corney, slightly returning the pressure. "'Coals, candles, and house rent free," said Mr. Bumble. "'Oh, Mrs. Corney, what an angel you are!' The lady was not proof against this burst of feelings. She sank into Mr. Bumble's arms, and that gentleman, in his agitation, imprinted a passionate kiss upon her chaste nose. "'Such parochial perfection!' exclaimed Mr. Bumble rapturously. "'You know that Mr. Slout is worse to-night, my fascinator?' "'Yes.' replied Mrs. Corney, bashfully. "'He can't live a week, the doctor says,' pursued Mr. Bumble. "'He is the master of this establishment. His death will cause a vacancy. That vacancy must be filled up. Oh, Mrs. Corney, what a prospect this opens! What an opportunity for a jining of arts and housekeepings!' said Mr. Bumble, bending over the bashful beauty. "'The one little—' little, little word, my blessed Corney. Yeah, yeah, yes, sighed out the matron. One more, pursued the beadle. Compose your darling feelings for only one more. When is it to come off? Mrs. Corney twice essayed to speak, and twice failed. At length, summoning up courage, she threw her arms around Mr. Bumble's neck, and said it might be as soon as ever he pleased, and that he was a irresistible duck. Matters being thus amicably and satisfactorily arranged, the contract was solemnly ratified in another teacupful of the peppermint mixture, which was rendered the more necessary by the flutter and agitation of the lady's spirits. While it was being disposed of, she acquainted Mr. Bumble with the old woman's decease. "'Very good,' said that gentleman, sipping his peppermint. "'I'll call at Sowerberry's as I go home, and tell him to send to-morrow morning. Was it that as frightened you, love?' "'It wasn't anything particular, dear,' said the lady evasively. "'He must have been something, love,' urged Mr. Bumble. "'Won't you tell your own bee?' "'Not now,' rejoined the lady. "'One of these days.' "'After we're married, dear.' "'After we're married!' exclaimed Mr. Bumble. "'It wasn't any impudence from any of them male paupers as—' "'No, no, love,' interposed the lady hastily. "'If I thought it was,' continued Mr. Bumble, "'if I thought as any one of them had dared to lift his vulgar eyes to that lovely countenance—' 
"'They wouldn't have dared to do it, love,' responded the lady. "'They had better not,' said Mr. Bumble, clenching his fist. "'Let me see any man, parochial or extra-parochial, as would presume to do it, and I can tell him that he wouldn't do it a second time.' Unembellished by any violence of gesticulation, this might have seemed no very high compliment to the lady's charms, but, as Mr. Bumble accompanied the threat with many warlike gestures, she was much touched with this proof of his devotion, and protested with great admiration that he was indeed a dove. The dove then turned up his coat-collar, and put on his cocked hat, and having exchanged a long and affectionate embrace with his future partner, once again braved the cold wind of the night, merely pausing for a few minutes in the male pauper's ward to abuse them a little with the view of satisfying himself that he could fill the office of workhouse-master with needful acerbity. Assured of his qualifications, Mr. Bumble left the building with a light heart, and bright visions of his future promotion, which served to occupy his mind until he reached the shop of the undertaker. Now Mr. and Mrs. Sowerberry, having gone out to tea and supper, and Noah Claypole, not being at any time disposed to take upon himself a greater amount of physical exertion than is necessary to a convenient performance of the two functions of eating and drinking, the shop was not closed, although it was past the usual hour of shutting up. Mr. Bumble tapped with his cane on the counter several times, but attracting no attention, and beholding a light shining through the glass window of the little parlour at the back of the shop, he made bold to peep in and see what was going forward, and when he saw what was going forward, he was not a little surprised. The cloth was laid for supper. The table was covered with bread and butter, plates and glasses, a porter-pot, and a wine-bottle. At the upper end of the table, Mr. Noah Claypole lolled negligently in an easy chair, with his legs thrown over one of the arms, an open clasp-knife in one hand, and a mass of buttered bread in the other. Close beside him stood Charlotte, opening oysters from a barrel, which Mr. Claypole condescended to swallow with remarkable avidity. A more than ordinary redness in the region of the young gentleman's nose, and a kind of fixed wink in his right eye, denoted that he was in a slight degree intoxicated. These symptoms were confirmed by the intense relish with which he took his oysters, for which nothing but a strong appreciation of their cooling properties in cases of internal fever could have sufficiently accounted. "'Here's a delicious fat one, Noah, dear,' said Charlotte. "'Try him, do, only this one.' "'What a delicious thing is a oyster,' remarked Mr. Claypole, after he had swallowed it. "'What a pity it is. A number of them should ever make you feel uncomfortable, isn't it, Charlotte?' "'It's quite a cruelty,' said Charlotte. "'So it is,' acquiesced Mr. Claypole. "'Aren't you fond of oysters?' "'Not over much,' replied Charlotte. I like to see you eat em, Noah, dear, better than eatin' em myself. Law, said Noah reflectively, how queer. Have another, said Charlotte. Here's one with such a beautiful, delicate beard. I can't manage any more, said Noah. I'm very sorry. Come here, Charlotte, and I'll kiss you. What? said Mr. Bumble, bursting into the room. Say that again, sir. Charlotte uttered a scream and hid her face in her apron. Mr. Claypole, without making any further change in his position than suffering his legs to reach the ground, gazed at the beadle in drunken terror. "'Say it again, you wild, audacious fellow,' said Mr. Bumble. "'How dare you mention such a thing, sir? And how dare you encourage him, you insolent minx?' "'Kiss her!' exclaimed Mr. Bumble, in strong indignation. "'Fah! Oh, I didn't mean to do it!' said Noah, blubbering. "'She's always a-kissing of me, whether I like it or not.' "'Oh, Noah!' cried Charlotte, reproachfully. "'You are. You, you know you are,' retorted Noah. "'She's always a-doing of it, Mr. Bumble, sir. She chucks me under the chin, please, sir, and, and, and makes all, all manner of love.' "'Silence!' cried Mr. Bumble, sternly. "'Take yourself downstairs, ma'am. Noah, you shut up the shop.' Say another word till your master comes home at your peril, and when he does come home, tell him that Mr. Bumble said he was to send the old woman's shell after breakfast tomorrow morning. Do you hear, sir? Kiss him, cried Mr. Bumble, holding up his hands. 
the sin and wickedness of the lower orders in this parochial district is frightful. If Parliament don't take their abominable courses under consideration, this country's ruined, and the character of the peasantry gone for ever. With these words, the beadle strode with a lofty and gloomy air from the undertaker's premises. And now that we have accompanied him so far on his road home, and have made all necessary preparations for the old woman's funeral, let us set on foot a few inquiries after young Oliver Twist, and ascertain whether he be still lying in the ditch where Toby Crackett left him. End of chapter 27「Twenty Eight of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Twenty Eight. Looks after Oliver and proceeds with his adventures. Wolves tear your throats, muttered Sykes, grinding his teeth. Oh, I wish I was among some of you. You'd howl the horse for it. As Sykes growled forth this imprecation, with the most desperate ferocity that his desperate nature was capable of, he rested the body of the wounded boy across his bended knee, and turned his head for an instant to look back at his pursuers. There was little to be made out in the mist and darkness, but the loud shouting of men vibrated through the air, and the barking of the neighbouring dogs, roused by the sound of the alarm-bell, resounded in every direction. "'Stop!' "'You white-livered hound!' cried the robber, shouting after Toby Crackett, who, making the best use of his long legs, was already ahead. "'Stop!' The repetition of the word brought Toby to a dead standstill, for he was not quite satisfied that he was beyond the range of pistol-shot, and Sykes was in no mood to be played with. "'Bear a hand with the boy!' cried Sykes, beckoning furiously to his confederate. "'Come back!' Toby made a show of returning, but ventured in a low voice, broken for want of breath, to intimate considerable reluctance as he came slowly along. "'Quicker!' cried Sykes, laying the boy in a dry ditch at his feet, and drawing a pistol from his pocket. "'Don't play booty with me!' At this moment the noise grew louder. Sykes, again looking round, could discern that the men who had given chase were already climbing the gate of the field in which he stood and that a couple of dogs were some paces in advance of them. "'He's all up, Bill!' cried Toby. "'Drop the kid, and show him your heels!' With this parting advice, Mr. Crackett, preferring the chance of being shot by his friend to the certainty of being taken by his enemies, fairly turned tail and darted off at full speed. Sykes clenched his teeth, took one look around, threw over the prostrate form of Oliver the cape in which he had been hurriedly muffled, ran along the front of the hedge, as if to distract the attention of those behind, from the spot where the boy lay, paused, for a second, before another hedge which met it at right angles, and whirling his pistol high into the air, cleared it at a bound, and was gone. "'Ho, ho, there!' cried a tremulous voice in the rear. "'Pincher! Neptune! Come here! Come here!' The dogs, who in common with their masters, seemed to have no particular relish for the sport in which they were engaged, readily answered to the command. Three men, who had by this time advanced some distance into the field, stopped to take counsel together. "'My advice, or at least raise, I should say, my orders, is,' said the fattest man of the party, "'that we immediately go home again.' "'I'm agreeable to anything which is agreeable to Mr. Giles,' said a shorter man who was by no means of a slim figure, and who was very pale in the face, and very polite, as frightened men frequently are. "'I shouldn't wish to appear ill-mannered, gentlemen,' said the third, who had called the dogs back. "'Mr. Giles ought to know.' "'Certainly,' replied the shorter man. "'And whatever Mr. Giles says, it isn't our place to contradict him. No, no, I, I know my situation. Thank my stars, I know my situation.' To tell the truth, the little man did seem to know his situation, and to know perfectly well that it was by no means a desirable one, for his teeth chattered in his head as he spoke. "'You are afraid, Brittles,' said Mr. Giles. "'I ain't," said Brittles. "'You are,' said Giles. "'You're a falsehood, Mr. Giles,' 
said Brittles. "'You're a lie, Brittles,' said Mr. Giles. Now, these four retorts arose from Mr. Giles's taunt, and Mr. Giles's taunt had arisen from his indignation at having the responsibility of going home again, imposed upon himself under cover of a compliment. The third man brought the dispute to its close most philosophically. "'I'll tell you what it is, gentlemen,' said he. "'We're all afraid.' "'Speak for yourself, sir,' said Mr. Giles, who was the palest of the party. "'So I do,' replied the man. "'It's natural and proper to be afraid under such circumstances. I am.' "'So am I,' said Brittles. "'Only there's no call to tell a man he is so bounceably.' These frank admissions softened Mr. Giles, who had once owned that he was afraid, upon which they all three faced about and ran back again with the completest unanimity, until Mr. Giles, who had the shortest wind of the party, as was encumbered with the pitchfork, most handsomely insisted on stopping to make an apology for his hastiness of speech. "'But it is wonderful,' said Mr. Giles, when he had explained, "'what a man will do when his blood is up. I should have committed murder, I know I should, if we'd caught one of them rascals.' As the other two were impressed with a similar presentiment, and as their blood, like his, had all gone down again. Some speculation ensued upon the cause of this sudden change in their temperament. "'I know what it was,' said Mr. Giles. "'It was the gate.' "'I shouldn't wonder if it was,' exclaimed Brittles, catching at the idea. "'You may depend upon it,' said Giles, "'that that gate stopped the flow of the excitement. I felt all mine suddenly going away as I was climbing over it.' By a remarkable coincidence, the other two had been visited with the same unpleasant sensation at that precise moment. It was quite obvious, therefore, that it was the gate, especially as there was no doubt regarding the time at which the change had taken place, because all three remembered that they had come in sight of the robbers at the instant of its occurrence. This dialogue was held between the two men who had surprised the burglars and a travelling tinker who had been sleeping in an outhouse, and who had been roused, together with his two mongrel curs, to join in the pursuit. Mr. Giles acted in the double capacity of butler and steward to the old lady of the mansion. Brittles was a lad of all work who, having entered her service a mere child, was treated as a promising young boy still, though he was something past thirty. Encouraging each other with such converse as this, but keeping very close together notwithstanding, and looking apprehensively round, whenever a fresh gust rattled through the boughs, the three men hurried back to a tree, behind which they had left their lantern, lest its light should inform the thieves in what direction to fire. Catching up the light, they made the best of their way home at a good round trot, and long after their dusky forms had ceased to be discernible, the light might have been seen twinkling and dancing in the distance like some exhalation of the damp and gloomy atmosphere through which it was swiftly borne. The air grew colder, as day came slowly on, and the mist rolled along the ground like a dense cloud of smoke. The grass was wet, the pathways and low places were all mire and water, the damp breath of an unwholesome wind went languidly by, with a hollow moaning. Still, Oliver lay motionless and insensible on the spot where Sykes had left him. Morning drew on apace. The air became more sharp and piercing as its first dull hue, the death of night, rather than the birth of day, glimmered faintly in the sky. The objects which had looked dim and terrible in the darkness grew more and more defined, and gradually resolved into their familiar shapes. The rain came down, thick and fast, and pattered noisily among the leafless bushes. But Oliver felt it not, as it beat against him, for he still lay stretched, helpless and unconscious, on his bed of clay. At length, a low cry of pain broke the stillness that prevailed, and uttering it, the boy awoke. His left arm, rudely bandaged in a shawl, hung heavy and useless at his side. The bandage was saturated with blood. He was so weak that he could scarcely raise himself into a sitting posture. When he had done so, he looked feebly round for help, and groaned with pain. Trembling in every joint, from cold and exhaustion, he made an effort to stand upright, but— shuddering from head to foot, fell prostrate on the ground. After a short return of the stupor in which he had been so long plunged, Oliver, 
urged by a creeping sickness at his heart, which seemed to warn him that if he lay there he must surely die, got upon his feet and essayed to walk. His head was dizzy, and he staggered to and fro like a drunken man, but he kept up nevertheless, and, with his head drooping languidly on his breast, went stumbling onward, he knew not whither. And now hosts of bewildering and confused ideas came crowding on his mind. He seemed to be still walking between Sykes and Crackett, who were angrily disputing, for the very words they said sounded in his ears, and when he caught his own attention, as it were, by making some violent effort to save himself from falling, he found that he was talking to them. Then he was alone with Sykes, plodding on as on the previous day, and as shadowy people passed them, he felt the robber's grasp upon his wrist. Suddenly he started back at the report of firearms. There rose into the air loud cries and shouts. Lights gleamed before his eyes. All was noise and tumult, as some unseen hand bore him hurriedly away. Through all these rapid visions there ran an undefined, uneasy consciousness of pain, which wearied and tormented him incessantly. Thus he staggered on, creeping almost mechanically between the bars of gates, or through the hedge-gaps as they came in his way, until he reached a road. Here the rain began to fall so heavily that it roused him. He looked about, and saw that at no great distance there was a house, which perhaps he could reach. Pitying his condition, they might have compassion on him, and if they did not, it would be better, he thought, to die near human beings than in the lonely open fields. He summoned up all his strength for one last trial, and bent his faltering steps towards it. As he drew nearer to this house, a feeling came over him that he had seen it before. He remembered nothing of its details, but the shape and aspect of the building seemed familiar to him. That garden wall! On the grass inside he had fallen on his knees last night, and prayed the two men's mercy. It was the very house they had attempted to rob. Oliver felt such fear come over him, when he recognised the place, that, for the instant, he forgot the agony of his wound, and thought only of flight. Flight! He could scarcely stand. And if he were in full possession of all the best powers of his slight and youthful frame, whither could he fly? He pushed against the garden gate. It was unlocked, and swung open on its hinges. He tottered across the lawn, climbed the steps, knocked faintly at the door, and, his whole strength failing him, sunk down against one of the pillars of the little portico. It happened that about this time Mr. Giles, Brittles, and the Tinker were recruiting themselves, after the fatigues and terrors of the night, with tea and sundries in the kitchen. Not that it was Mr. Giles's habit to admit to too great familiarity the humbler servants, towards whom it was rather his wont to deport himself with a lofty affability, which, while it gratified, could not fail to remind them of his superior position in society. But death, fires, and burglary make all men equals. So Mr. Giles sat with his legs stretched out before the kitchen fender, leaning his left arm on the table, while with his right he illustrated a circumstantial and minute account of the robbery, to which his bearers, but especially the cook and housemaid, who were of the party, listened with breathless interest. "'It was about half-past two, said Mr. Giles, "'or I wouldn't swear that it might have been a little nearer three when I woke up, and turning round in my bed, as it might be so—here Mr. Giles turned round in his chair, and pulled the corner of the tablecloth over him to imitate bedclothes—'I fancied I heard a noise.' At this point of the narrative, the cook turned pale, and asked the housemaid to shut the door, who asked Brittles, who asked the tinker, who pretended not to hear. "'Heard a noise,' continued Mr. Giles. "'I says at first, this is illusion, and was composing myself off to sleep, when I heard the noise again, distinct.' "'What sort of a noise?' asked the cook. "'A kind of a busting noise.' replied Mr. Giles, looking round him. "'More like the noise of powder in an iron bar and a nutmeg grater,' suggested Brittles. "'It was when you heard it, sir,' rejoined Mr. Giles. "'But at this time it had a busting sound. 
I've turned down the clothes, continued Giles, rolling back the tablecloth, sat up in bed, and listened. The cook and housemaid simultaneously ejaculated, Law! and drew their chairs closer together. I heard it now, quite apparent, resumed Mr. Giles. Somebody, I says, is forcing of a door or window. What's to be done? I'll call up that poor lad, Brittles, and save him from being murdered in his bed, or his throat, I says, may be cut from his right ear to his left, without his ever knowing it. Here all eyes were turned upon Brittles, who fixed his upon the speaker, and stared at him with his mouth wide open, and his face expressive of the most unmitigated horror. "'I tossed off the clothes,' said Giles, throwing away the tablecloth, and looking very hard at the cook and housemaid, got softly out of bed, drew on a pair of ladies present, Mr. Giles, murmured the tinker, of shoes, sir, said Giles, turning upon him, and laying great emphasis on the word, seized a loaded pistol that always goes upstairs with the plate basket, and walked on tiptoes to his room. Bittles, I says, when I had woke him, don't be frightened. "'So you did,' observed Brittles in a low voice. "'We're dead men, I think, Brittles,' I says," continued Giles. "'But don't be frightened.' "'Was he frightened?' asked the cook. "'Not a bit of it,' replied Mr. Giles. "'He was as firm, uh, pretty near as firm, as I was.' "'I should have died at once, I'm sure, if it had been me,' observed the housemaid. "'You're a woman,' retorted Brittles, plucking up a little. "'Brittles is right,' said Mr. Giles, nodding his head approvingly. "'From a woman nothing else was to be expected. We, being men, took a dark lantern that was standing on Brittles' hob, and groped our way downstairs in the pitch dark, as it might be so.' Mr. Giles had risen from his seat, and taken two steps with his eyes shut to accompany his description with appropriate action, when he started violently, in common with the rest of the company, and hurried back to his chair. The cook and housemaid screamed. "'It was a knock,' said Mr. Giles, assuming perfect serenity. "'Open the door, somebody.' Nobody moved. "'It seems a strange sort of a thing, a knock coming at such a time in the morning,' said Mr. Giles surveying the pale faces which surrounded him, and looking very blank himself. But the door must be opened. Do you hear? Somebody?" Mr. Giles, as he spoke, looked at Brittles. But that young man, being naturally modest, probably considered himself nobody, and so held that the inquiry could not have any application to him. At all events he tendered no reply. Mr. Giles directed an appealing glance at the tinker, but he had suddenly fallen asleep. The women were out of the question. "'If Brittles would rather open the door in the presence of witnesses,' said Mr. Giles, after a short silence, "'I'm ready to make one.' "'So am I,' said the tinker, waking up, as suddenly as he had fallen asleep. Brittles capitulated on these terms, and the party being somewhat reassured by the discovery, made on throwing open the shutters, that it was now broad day, took their way upstairs, with the dogs in front. The two women, who were afraid to stay below, brought up the rear. By the advice of Mr. Giles, they all talked very loud, to warn any evil-disposed person outside that they were strong in numbers, and by a master stoke of policy, originating in the brain of the same ingenious gentleman, the dogs' tails were well pinched in the hall to make them bark savagely. These precautions having been taken, Mr. Giles held on fast by the tinker's arm, to prevent his running away, as he pleasantly said, and gave the word of command to open the door. Brittles obeyed. The group, peeping timorously over each other's shoulders, beheld no more formidable an object than poor little Oliver Twist, speechless and exhausted, who raised his heavy eyes, and mutely solicited their compassion. "'A boy!' exclaimed Mr. Giles valiantly pushing the tinker into the background. "'What's the matter with the—eh? Why, Brittles, look here! 
don't you know? Brittles, who had got behind the door to open it, no sooner saw Oliver than he uttered a loud cry. Mr. Giles, seizing the boy by one leg and one arm, fortunately not the broken limb, lugged him straight into the hall, and deposited him at full length on the floor thereof. "'Here he is!' bawled Giles, calling in a state of great excitement up the staircase. "'Here's one of the thieves, ma'am! Here's a thief, miss! Wounded, miss! I shot him, miss! And Brittles held the light!' "'In a lantern, miss!' cried Brittles, applying one hand to the side of his mouth, so that his voice might travel the better. The two women-servants ran upstairs to carry the intelligence that Mr. Giles had captured a robber, and the tinker busied himself in endeavouring to restore Oliver, lest he should die before he could be hanged. In the midst of all this noise and commotion, there was heard a sweet female voice, which quelled it in an instant. "'Giles?' whispered the voice from the stairhead. "'I'm here, miss.' replied Mr. Giles. "'Don't be frightened, miss. I ain't much injured. He didn't make a very desperate resistance, miss. I was soon too many for him.' "'Hush!' replied the young lady. "'You frightened my aunt as much as the thieves did. Is the poor creature much hurt?' "'Wounded desperate, miss,' replied Giles, with indescribable complacency. "'He looks as if he was a going, miss,' bawled Brittles in the same manner as before. "'Wouldn't you like to come and look at him, miss, in case he should?' "'Hush! Pray! There's a good man,' rejoined the lady. "'Wait quietly only one instant, while I speak to aunt.' With a footstep as soft and gentle as the voice, the speaker tripped away. She soon returned, with the direction that the wounded person was to be carried carefully upstairs to Mr. Giles's room, and that Brittles was to saddle the pony, and betake himself instantly to Chertsey from which place he was to dispatch with all speed a constable and doctor. "'But won't you take one look at him first, miss?' asked Mr. Giles, with as much pride as if Oliver were some bird of rare plumage that he had skilfully brought down. "'Not one little peep, miss?' "'Not now, for the world,' replied the young lady. "'Poor fellow! Oh, treat him kindly, Giles, for my sake.' The old servant looked up at the speaker as she turned away, with a glance as proud and admiring as if she had been his own child. Then, bending over Oliver, he helped to carry him upstairs with the care and solicitude of a woman. End of chapter 28「Chapter 29 of Oliver Twist – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Twenty Nine. Has an introductory account of the inmates of the house to which Oliver resorted. In a handsome room, though its furniture had rather the air of old fashioned comfort than of modern elegance, there sat two ladies at a well spread breakfast table. Mr. Giles, dressed with scrupulous care in a full suit of black, was in attendance upon them. He had taken his station some halfway between the sideboard and the breakfast table, and, with his body drawn up to its full height, his head thrown back, and inclined the merest trifle on one side, his left leg advanced, and his right hand thrust into his waistcoat, while his left hung down by his side, grasping a waiter, looked like one who laboured under a very agreeable sense of his own merits and importance. Of the two ladies, one was well advanced in years, but the high-backed oaken chair in which she sat was not more upright than she. Dressed with the utmost nicety and precision, in a quaint mixture of bygone costume, with some slight concessions to the prevailing taste, which rather served to point the old style pleasantly than to impair its effect, she sat, in a stately manner, with her hands folded on the table before her. Her eyes, and age had dimmed but little of their brightness, were attentively upon her young companion. The younger lady was in the lovely bloom and springtime of womanhood, at that age when if ever angels be for God's good purpose enthroned in mortal forms, they may be, without impiety, supposed to abide in such as hers. She was not past seventeen, cast in so slight and exquisite a mould, so mild and gentle, so pure and beautiful, that earth seemed not her element nor its rough creatures her fit companions. The very intelligence that shone in her deep blue eyes, 
and was stamped upon her noble head, seemed scarcely of her age, or of the world. And yet the changing expression of sweetness and good humour, the thousand lights that played about the face, and left no shadow there, above all, the smile, the cheerful, happy smile, were made for home and fireside peace and happiness. She was busily engaged in the little offices of the table. Chancing to raise her eyes as the elder lady was regarding her, she playfully put back her hair, which was simply braided on her forehead, and threw into her beaming look such an expression of affection and artless loveliness, that blessed spirits might have smiled to look upon her. "'And Brittles has been gone upwards of an hour, has he?' asked the old lady, after a pause. "'An hour and twelve minutes, ma'am,' replied Mr. Giles, referring to a silver watch, which he drew forth by a black ribbon. "'He is always slow,' remarked the old lady. "'Brittles always was a slow boy, ma'am,' replied the attendant, and seeing, by the by, that Brittles had been a slow boy for upwards of thirty years, there appeared no great probability of his ever being a fast one. "'He gets worse instead of better, I think,' said the elder lady. "'It is very inexcusable in him, if he stops to play with any other boys,' said the young lady, smiling. Mr. Giles was apparently considering the propriety of indulging in a respectful smile himself, when a gig drove up to the garden gate, out of which there jumped a fat gentleman who ran straight up to the door, and who, getting quickly into the house by some mysterious process, burst into the room, and nearly overturned Mr. Giles and the breakfast-table together. "'I never heard of such a thing!' exclaimed the fat gentleman. "'My dear Mrs. Maylie, bless my soul, in the silence of the night, too, I never heard of such a thing!' With these expressions of condolence, the fat gentleman shook hands with both ladies, and, drawing up a chair, inquired how they found themselves. "'You ought to be dead—positively dead with the fright,' said the fat gentleman. "'Why didn't you send? Bless me! My man should have come in a minute, and so would I, and my assistant would have been delighted, or anybody, I'm sure, under such circumstances. Oh, dear, dear, so unexpected, in the silence of the night, too." The doctor seemed especially troubled by the fact of the robbery having been unexpected and attempted in the night-time, as if it were the established custom of gentlemen in the house-breaking way to transact business at noon, and to make an appointment by post a day or two previous. "'And you, Miss Rose?' said the doctor, turning to the young lady. "'I—oh, very much so, indeed,' said Rose, interrupting him. "'But there is a poor creature upstairs, whom Aunt wishes you to see.' "'Ah, to be sure,' replied the doctor. "'So there is. That was your handiwork, Giles, I understand.' Mr. Giles, who had been previously putting the teacups to rights, blushed very red, and said that he had had that honour. "'Honour, eh?' said the doctor. "'Well, I don't know. Perhaps it's as honourable to hit a thief in a back kitchen as hit your man at twelve paces. Fancy that he fired in the air, and you've fought a duel, Giles.' Mr. Giles, who thought this light treatment of the matter an unjust attempt at diminishing his glory, answered respectfully that it was not for the like of him to judge about that, but he rather thought it was no joke to the opposite party. "'Gad! That's true,' said the doctor. "'Where is he? Show me the way. I'll look in again as I come down, Mrs. Maylie. That's the little window that he got in at, eh? Well, I couldn't have believed it." Talking all the way, he followed Mr. Giles upstairs. And while he is going upstairs, the reader may be informed that Mr. Losburn, a surgeon in the neighbourhood, known through a circuit of ten miles round as the doctor, had grown fat more from good humour than from good living and was as kind and hearty, and withal as eccentric an old bachelor, as will be found in five times that space by any explorer alive. The doctor was absent much longer than either he or the ladies had anticipated. A large flat box was fetched out of the gig, and a bedroom bell was rung very often, and the servants ran up and down stairs perpetually, from which tokens it was justly concluded that something important was going on above. At length he returned and in reply to an anxious inquiry after his patient, looked very mysterious, and closed the door, carefully. "'This is a very extraordinary thing, Mrs. Maylie,' said the doctor, standing with his back to the door, as if to keep it shut. "'He is not in any danger, I hope,' said the old lady. "'Why, 
"'That would not be an extraordinary thing under the circumstances,' replied the doctor, "'though I don't think he is. Have you seen the thief?' "'No,' rejoined the old lady. "'Nor heard anything about him?' "'No.' "'I beg your pardon, ma'am,' interposed Mr. Giles, "'but I was going to tell you about him when Dr. Losburn came in.' The fact was, that Mr. Giles had not, at first, been able to bring his mind to the avowal that he had only shot a boy. Such commendations had been bestowed upon his bravery, that he could not, for the life of him, help postponing the explanation for a few delicious minutes, during which he had flourished in the very zenith of a brief reputation for undaunted courage. "'Rose wished to see the man,' said Mrs. Maylie, "'but I wouldn't hear of it.' "'Hm!' rejoined the doctor. "'There is nothing very alarming in his appearance. Have you any objection to see him in my presence?' "'If it be necessary,' replied the old lady, "'certainly not.' "'Then I think it is necessary,' said the doctor. "'At all events, I am quite sure that you would deeply regret not having done so if you postponed it. He is perfectly quiet and comfortable now. Allow me, Miss Rose, will you permit me? Not the slightest fear. I pledge you my honour. End of chapter 29「Chapter thirty of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter thirty. Relates what Oliver's new visitors thought of him. With many loquacious assurances that they would be agreeably surprised in the aspect of the criminal, the doctor drew the young lady's arm through one of his, and offering his disengaged hand to Mrs. Maylie, led them with much ceremony and stateliness upstairs. "'Now,' said the doctor, in a whisper, as he softly turned the handle of the bedroom door, "'let us hear what you think of him. He has not been shaved very recently, but he don't look at all ferocious, notwithstanding. Stop, though. Let me first see that he is in visiting order.' Stepping before them, he looked into the room, motioning them to advance, he closed the door when they had entered, and gently drew back the curtains of the bed. Upon it, in lieu of the dogged, black-visaged ruffian they had expected to behold, there lay a mere child, worn with pain and exhaustion, and sunk into a deep sleep. His wounded arm, bound and splintered up, was crossed upon his breast. His head reclined upon the other arm, which was half hidden by his long hair, as it streamed over the pillow. The honest gentleman held the curtain in his hand, and looked on, for a minute or so, in silence. Whilst he was watching the patient thus, the young lady glided softly past, and, seating herself in a chair by the bedside, gathered Oliver's hair from his face. As she stooped over him, her tears fell upon his forehead. The boy stirred and smiled in his sleep, as though these marks of pity and compassion had awakened some pleasant dream of a love and affection he had never known. Thus a strain of gentle music, or the rippling of water in a silent place, or the odour of a flower, or the mention of a familiar word, will sometimes call up sudden dim remembrances of scenes that never were in this life, which vanish like a breath, which some brief memory of a happier existence, long gone by, would seem to have awakened, which no voluntary exertion of the mind can ever recall. "'What can this mean?' exclaimed the elder lady. "'This poor child can never have been the pupil of robbers.' "'Vice,' said the surgeon, replacing the curtain, "'takes up her abode in many temples, and who can say that a fair outside shall not enshrine her?' "'But at so early an age,' urged Rose. "'My dear young lady,' rejoined the surgeon mournfully, shaking his head, "'crime, like death, is not confined to the old and withered alone.' The youngest and fairest are too often its chosen victims. But can you, oh, can you really believe that this delicate boy has been the voluntary associate of the worst outcasts of society? said Rose. The surgeon shook his head, in a manner which intimated that he feared it was very possible, and observing that they might disturb the patient, led the way into an adjoining apartment. 
But even if he has been wicked, pursued Rose, think how young he is. Think that he may never have known a mother's love, or the comfort of a home, that ill usage and blows, or the want of bread, may have driven him to herd with men who have forced him to guilt. Aunt, dear aunt, for mercy's sake, think of this, before you let them drag this sick child to a prison, which in any case must be the grave of all his chances of amendment. Oh, as you love me, and know that I have never felt the want of parents in your goodness and affection, but that I might have done so, and might have been equally helpless and unprotected with this poor child. Have pity upon him before it is too late. My dear love, said the elderly lady, as she folded the weeping girl to her bosom, do you think I would harm a hair of his head? Oh, no, replied Rose eagerly. No, surely, said the old lady. My days are drawing to their close, and may mercy be shown to me as I show it to others. What can I do to save him, sir? Let me think, ma'am, said the doctor. Let me think. Mr. Losburn thrust his hands into his pockets, and took several turns up and down the room, often stopping and balancing himself on his toes, and frowning frightfully. After various exclamations of, "'I've got it now!' and, "'No, I haven't!' and as many renewals of the walking and frowning, he at length made a dead halt, and spoke as follows. "'I think, if you give me a full and unlimited commission to bully Giles, and that little boy Brittles, I can manage it. Giles is a faithful fellow, and an old servant, I know, but you can make it up to him in a thousand ways, and reward him for being such a good shot besides. You don't object to that?" "'Unless there is some other way of preserving the child,' replied Mrs. Maylie. "'There is no other,' said the doctor. "'No other. Take my word for it.' "'Then my aunt invests you with full power,' said Rose, smiling through her tears. "'But pray, don't be harder upon the poor fellows than is indispensably necessary.' "'You seem to think—' retorted the doctor, that everybody is disposed to be hard-hearted to-day, except yourself, Miss Rose. I only hope, for the sake of the rising male sex generally, that you may be found in as vulnerable and soft-hearted a mood by the first eligible young fellow who appeals to your compassion. And I wish I were a young fellow, that I might avail myself on the spot of such a favourable opportunity for doing so as the present." "'You are as great a boy as poor Brittles himself,' returned Rose, blushing. Well, said the doctor, laughing heartily, that is no very difficult matter. But to return to this boy, the great point of our agreement is yet to come. He will wake in an hour or so, I dare say, and although I have told that thick-headed constable fellow downstairs that he mustn't be moved or spoken to on peril of his life, I think we may converse with him without danger. Now I make this stipulation, that I shall examine him in your presence, and that if, from what he says, we judge, and I can show to the satisfaction of your cool reason that he is a real and thorough bad one, which is more than possible, he shall be left to his fate, without any farther interference on my part, at all events." "'Oh, no, aunt!' entreated Rose. "'Oh, yes, aunt,' said the doctor. "'Is it a bargain?' "'He cannot be hardened in vice,' said Rose. "'It is impossible.' "'Very good.' retorted the doctor, then so much the more reason for acceding to my proposition." Finally the treaty was entered into, and the parties thereunto sat down to wait, with some impatience, until Oliver should awake. The patience of the two ladies was destined to undergo a longer trial than Mr. Losburn had led them to expect, for hour after hour passed on, and still Oliver slumbered heavily. It was evening, indeed before the kind-hearted doctor brought them the intelligence that he was at length sufficiently restored to be spoken to. The boy was very ill, he said, and weak from the loss of blood, but his mind was so troubled with anxiety to disclose something, that he deemed it better to give him the opportunity than to insist upon his remaining quiet until next morning, which he should otherwise have done. The conference was a long one. Oliver told them all his simple history and was often compelled to stop by pain and want of strength. 
It was a solemn thing to hear, in the darkened room, the feeble voice of the sick child, recounting a weary catalogue of evils and calamities which hard men had brought upon him. Oh, if when we oppress and grind our fellow-creatures, we bestowed but one thought on the dark evidences of human error, which, like dense and heavy clouds, are rising slowly, it is true, but not less surely, to heaven, to pour their after-vengeance on our heads. If we heard at one instant, in imagination, the deep testimony of dead men's voices, which no power can stifle, and no pride shut out, where would be the injury and injustice, the suffering, misery, cruelty, and wrong, that each day's life brings with it? Oliver's pillow was smoothed by gentle hands that night, and loveliness and virtue watched him as he slept. He felt calm and happy, and could have died without a murmur. The momentous interview was no sooner concluded, and Oliver composed to rest again, than the doctor, after wiping his eyes, and condemning them for being weak all at once, betook himself downstairs to open upon Mr. Giles. And finding nobody about the parlours, it occurred to him that he could perhaps originate the proceedings with better effect in the kitchen. So into the kitchen he went. There were assembled, in that lower house of the domestic parliament, the women-servants, Mr. Brittles, Mr. Giles, the tinker, who had received a special invitation to regale himself for the remainder of the day, in consideration of his services, and the constable. The latter gentleman had a large staff, a large head, large features, and large half-boots, and he looked as if he had been taking a proportionate allowance of ale, as indeed he had. The adventures of the previous night were still under discussion for Mr. Giles was expatiating upon his presence of mind when the doctor entered. Mr. Brittles, with a mug of ale in his hand, was corroborating everything before his superior said it. "'Sit still,' said the doctor, waving his hand. "'Thank you, sir,' said Mr. Giles. "'Mrs. wished some ale to be given out, sir, and as I felt no ways inclined for my own little room, sir, and was disposed for company, I am taking mine among him here.' Brittles headed a low murmur, by which the ladies and gentlemen generally were understood to express the gratification they derived from Mr. Giles's condescension. Mr. Giles looked round with a patronising air, as much as to say that so long as they behaved properly, he would never desert them. "'How is the patient to-night, sir?' asked Giles. "'So-so,' returned the doctor. "'I am afraid. You have got yourself into a scrape there, Mr. Giles.' "'I hope—' "'You don't mean to say, sir,' said Mr. Giles, trembling, "'that he's going to die. "'If I thought it, I should never be happy again. I, "'I wouldn't cut a boy off. "'No, not even Brittles here, "'not for all the plate in the county, sir. "'That's not the point,' said the doctor mysteriously. "'Mr. Giles, are you a Protestant?' Y "'Yes, sir. I, I, I hope so,' faltered Mr. Giles, who had turned very pale. "'And what are you, boy?' said the doctor, turning sharply upon Brittles. "'Law, uh, bless me, sir,' replied Brittles, starting violently. "'I'm the same as Mr. Giles, sir.' "'Then tell me this,' said the doctor. "'Both of you, both of you. "'Are you going to take upon yourselves to swear that that boy upstairs "'is the boy that was put through the little window last night? "'Out with it. Come, we are prepared for you.' The doctor, who was universally considered one of the best-tempered creatures on earth, made this demand in such a dreadful tone of anger, that Giles and Brittles, who were considerably muddled by ale and excitement, stared at each other in a state of stupefaction. "'Pay attention to the reply, constable, will you?' said the doctor, shaking his forefinger with great solemnity of manner, and tapping the bridge of his nose with it, to bespeak the exercise of that worthy's utmost acuteness. "'Something may come of this before long.' The constable looked as wise as he could, and took up his staff of office, which had been reclining indolently in the chimney-corner. "'It's a simple question of identity, you will observe,' said the doctor. "'That's <coughs> what, what it is, sir,' replied the constable, coughing with great violence, for he had finished his ale in a hurry, and some of it had gone the wrong way. "'Here's the house broken into,' said the doctor, "'and a couple of men—' Catch one moment's glimpse of a boy, in the midst of gunpowder, smoke, and in all the distraction of alarm and darkness, 
here's a boy come to that very same house next morning, and because he happens to have his arm tied up, these men lay violent hands upon him, by doing which they place his life in great danger, and swear he is the thief. Now, the question is, whether these men are justified by the fact? If not, in what situation do they place themselves? The constable nodded profoundly. He said, if that wasn't the law, he would be glad to know what was. "'I ask you again,' thundered the doctor, "'are you, on your solemn oaths, able to identify that boy?' Brittles looked doubtfully at Mr. Giles. Mr. Giles looked doubtfully at Brittles. The constable put his hand behind his ear to catch the reply. The two women and the tinker leaned forward to listen. The doctor glanced keenly round. When a ring was heard at the gate, and at the same moment the sound of wheels. "'It's the runners!' cried Brittles, to all appearance much relieved. "'The what?' exclaimed the doctor, aghast in his turn. "'The Bow Street officers, sir,' replied Brittles, taking up a candle. "'Me and Mr. Giles sent for him this morning.' "'What?' cried the doctor. "'Yes,' replied Brittles. "'I sent a message up by the coachman, and I only wonder they weren't here before, sir.' "'You did, did you? Then confound your slow coaches down here. That's all,' said the doctor, walking away. End of chapter 30「Thirty One of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Thirty One. Involves a critical position. Who's that? inquired Brittles, opening the door a little way, with the chain up, and peeping out, shading the candle with his hand. Open the door replied a man outside. "'It's the officers from Bow Street. Have we sent two to to-day?' Much comforted by this assurance, Brittles opened the door to its full width, and confronted a portly man in a greatcoat, who walked in, without saying anything more, and wiped his shoes on the mat, as coolly as if he lived there. "'Just send somebody out to relieve my mate, will you, young man?' said the officer. "'He's in the gig, a mind in the prad. Have you got a courtier's here, that you could put it up in for five or ten minutes?" Brittles replying in the affirmative, and pointing out to the building, the portly man stepped back to the garden gate, and helped his companion to put up the gig, while Brittles lighted them in a state of great admiration. This done, they returned to the house, and, being shown into a parlour, took off their great coats and hats, and showed like what they were. The man who had knocked at the door, was a stout personage of middle height, aged about fifty, with shiny black hair, cropped pretty close, half-whiskers, a round face and sharp eyes. The other was a red-headed, bony man, in top-boots, with a rather ill-favoured countenance, and a turned-up sinister-looking nose. "'Tell your governor that Blathers and Duff is here, will you?' said the stouter man, smoothing down his hair, and laying a pair of handcuffs on the table. Oh. "'Good evening, master. Can I have a word or two with you in private, if you please?' This was addressed to Mr. Losburn, who now made his appearance. That gentleman, motioning Brittles to retire, brought in the two ladies, and shut the door. "'This is the lady of the house,' said Mr. Losburn, motioning towards Mrs. Maylie. Mr. Blathers made a bow. Being desired to sit down, he put his hat on the floor, and taking a chair, motioned to Duff to do the same. The latter gentleman, who did not appear quite so much accustomed to good society, or quite so much at his ease in it, one of the two, seated himself, after undergoing several muscular affections of the limbs, and the head of his stick into his mouth, with some embarrassment. "'Now, with regard to this here robbery, master,' said Blathers, "'what are the circumstances?' Mr. Losburn, who appeared desirous of gaining time, recounted them at great length, and with much circumlocution. Messrs. Blathers and Duff looked very knowing, meanwhile, and occasionally exchanged a nod. "'I can't say for certain till I see the work, of course,' said Blathers, "'but my opinion at once is—I don't mind committing myself to that extent—that 
that this wasn't done by a yokel, eh, Duff? Certainly not, replied Duff. And translating the word yokel for the benefits of the ladies, I apprehend your meaning to be that this attempt was not made by a countryman, said Mr. Losburn with a smile. That's it, master, replied Blathers. This is all about the robbery, is it? All, replied the doctor. Now, what is this about this here boy that the servants are a-talking on? said Blathers. Nothing at all, replied the doctor. One of the frightened servants chose to take it into his head that he had something to do with this attempt to break into the house. But it's nonsense. Sheer absurdity. Very easy disposed of, if it is, remarked Duff. What he says is quite correct, observed Blathers, nodding his head in a confirmatory way and playing carelessly with the handcuffs, as if they were a pair of castanets. "'Who is the boy? What account does he give of himself? Where did he come from? He didn't drop out of the clouds, did he, master?' "'Of course not,' replied the doctor, with a nervous glance at the two ladies. "'I know his whole history, but we can talk about that presently. You would like, first, to see the place where the thieves made their attempt, I suppose?' "'Certainly.' rejoined Mr. Blathers. We had better inspect the premises first, and examine the servants afterwards. That's the usual way of doing business." Lights were then procured, and Messrs. Blathers and Duff, attended by the native constable, Brittles, Giles, and everybody else in short, went into the little room at the end of the passage, and looked out at the window, and afterwards went round by way of the lawn, and looked in at the window, and after that had a candle handed out to inspect the shutter with, and after that a lantern to trace the footsteps with, and after that a pitchfork to poke the bushes with. This done, amidst the breathless interest of all beholders, they came in again, and Mr. Giles and Brittles were put through a melodramatic representation of their share in the previous night's adventures, which they performed some six times over, contradicting each other in not more than one important respect the first time, and in not more than a dozen the last. This consummation being arrived at, Blathers and Duff cleared the room, and held a long council together, compared with which, for secrecy and solemnity, a consultation of great doctors on the knottiest point in medicine would be mere child's play. Meanwhile the doctor walked up and down the next room, in a very uneasy state, and Mrs. Maylie and Rose looked on with anxious faces. "'Upon my word!' he said, making a halt, after a great number of very rapid turns, I hardly know what to do. Surely, said Rose, the poor child's story, faithfully repeated to these men, will be sufficient to exonerate him. I doubt it, my dear young lady, said the doctor, shaking his head. I don't think it would exonerate him, either with them, or with legal functionaries of a higher grade. What is he, after all, they would say? A runaway. Judged by mere worldly considerations and probabilities, his story is a very doubtful one." "'You believe it, surely,' interrupted Rose. "'I believe it, strange as it is. And perhaps I may be an old fool for doing so,' rejoined the doctor. "'But I don't think it is exactly the tale for a practical police officer, nevertheless.' "'Why not?' demanded Rose. "'Because, my pretty cross-examiner, replied the doctor, because, viewed with their eyes, there are many ugly points about it. He can only prove the parts that look ill, and none of those that look well. Confound the fellows! They will have the why and the wherefore, and will take nothing for granted. On his own showing, you see, he has been the companion of thieves for some time past. He has been carried to a police officer, on a charge of picking a gentleman's pocket, he has been taken away forcibly from that gentleman's house to a place which he cannot describe or point out, and of the situation of which he has not the remotest idea. He is brought down to Chertsey by men who seem to have taken a violent fancy to him, whether he will or no, and is put through a window to rob a house. And then, just at the very moment when he is going to alarm the inmates, and so do the very thing that would set him all to rights, there rushes into the way a blundering dog of a half-bred butler, and shoots him, as if on purpose to prevent his doing any good for himself. Don't you see all this?' "'I see it, of course,' 
replied Rose, smiling at the doctor's impetuosity. "'But still I do not see anything in it to criminate the poor child.' "'No,' replied the doctor. "'Of course not. Bless the bright eyes of your sex. They never see, whether for good or bad, more than one side of any question, and that is always the one which first presents itself to them.' Having given vent to this result of experience, the doctor put his hands into his pockets, and walked up and down the room with even greater rapidity than before. "'The more I think of it,' said the doctor, "'the more I see that it will occasion endless trouble and difficulty if we put these men in possession of the boy's real story. I am certain it will not be believed, and even if they can do nothing to him in the end, Still the dragging it forward, and giving publicity to all the doubts that will be cast upon it, must interfere materially with your benevolent plan of rescuing him from misery." "'Oh! What is to be done?' cried Rose. "'Dear, dear! Why did they send for these people?' "'Why, indeed!' exclaimed Mrs. Maylie. "'I would not have had them here for the world.' "'All I know is,' said Mr. Losburn, at last, sitting down with a kind of desperate calmness, that we must try and carry it off with a bold face. The object is a good one, and that must be our excuse. The boy has strong symptoms of fever upon him, and is in no condition to be talked to any more. That's one comfort. We must make the best of it, and if bad be the best, it is no fault of ours. Come in." "'Well, master,' said Blathers, entering the room followed by his colleague, and making the door fast, before he said any more. "'This warn't a put-up thing.' "'And what the devil's a put-up thing?' demanded the doctor impatiently. "'We call it a put-up robbery, ladies,' said Blathers, turning to them, as if he pitied their ignorance, but had a contempt for the doctors. "'When the servants is in it.' "'Nobody suspected them in this case,' said Mrs. Maylie. "'Very likely not, ma'am.' replied Blathers, but they might have been in it for all that. "'More likely on that wery account,' said Duff. "'We find it was a town and said Blathers, continuing his report, "'for the style of work is first-rate.' "'Wery pretty indeed it is,' remarked Duff, in an undertone. "'There was two of em in it,' continued Blathers, "'and they had a boy with em. That's plain from the size of the window. That's all to be said at present. We'll see this lad that you've got upstairs at once, if you please. Perhaps they will take something to drink first, Mrs. Maylie," said the doctor, his face brightening as if some new thought had occurred to him. "'Oh, to be sure!' exclaimed Rose eagerly. "'You shall have it immediately, if you will.' "'Why, thank you, miss,' said Blathers, drawing his coat-sleeve across his mouth. "'It's dry work, this sort of duty.' "'Anything that's handy, miss. Don't put yourself out of the way on our accounts.' "'What shall it be?' asked the doctor, following the young lady to the sideboard. "'A little drop of spirits, master, if it's all the same,' replied Blathers. "'It's a cold ride from London, ma'am, and I always find the spirits comes home warmer to the feelings.' This interesting communication was addressed to Mrs. Maylie, who received it very graciously. While it was being conveyed to her, the doctor slipped out of the room. "'Ah!' said Mr. Blathers, not holding his wine-glass by the stem, but grasping the bottom between the thumb and forefinger of his left hand, and placing it in front of his chest. "'I have seen a good many pieces of business like this in my time, ladies.' "'That crack down in the back lane at Edmonton, Blathers,' said Mr. Duff, assisting his colleague's memory. "'That was something in this way, warn't it?' rejoined Mr. Blathers. "'That was done by Conky Chickweed, that was.' "'You always gave that to him,' replied Duff. "'It was the family pet, I told you. Conky hadn't any more to do with it than I had.' "'Get out,' retorted Mr. Blathers. "'I know better.' "'Do you mind that time when Conky was robbed of his money, though?' What a start that was! <laughs> Better than any novel book I ever see." "'What was that?' inquired Rose, anxious to encourage any symptoms of good humour in the unwelcome visitors. "'It was a robbery, miss, that hardly anybody would have been down upon,' said Blathers. 
This here conky chickweed. Conky means nosy, ma'am, interposed Duff. Of course the lady knows that, don't she? demanded Mr. Blathers. Always interrupting you are, partner. This here conky chickweed, miss, kept a public house over Battlebridge Way, and he had a cellar where a good many young lords went to see cock-fighting and badger-drawing and that, and a very intellectual manner the sports was conducted in, for I seen him often. He warn't one of the family at that time, and one night he was robbed of three hundred and twenty-seven guineas in a canvas bag that was stole out of his bedroom in the dead of night, by a tall man with a black patch over his eye, who had concealed himself under the bed, and after committing the robbery, jumped slap out of the window, which was only a story I. He was very quick about it, but Conky was quick too, for he fired a blunderbuss after him, and roused the neighbourhood. They set up a you and cry directly, and when they came to look about him, found that Conky had hit the robber, for there was traces of blood, all the way to some palings, a good distance off, and there they lost him. However, he made off with the blunt, and consequently, the name of Mr. Chickweed, Licensed Whitler, appeared in the Gazette among the other bankrupts, and all manner of benefits and subscriptions, and I don't know what all, was got up for the poor man, who was in a very low state of mind about his loss, and went up and down the streets for three or four days, a pulling his hair off in such a desperate manner that many people was afraid he might be going to make away with himself. One day he came up to the office, all in a hurry, and had a private interview with the magistrate, who, after a deal of talk, rings the bell, and orders Jem Spires in Jem was an active officer, and tells him to go and assist Mr. Chickweed in apprehending the man as robbed his house. "'I see him, Spires,' said Chickweed. "'Pass my house yesterday morning.' "'Why didn't you up and collar him?' says Spires. "'I was so struck all of a heap, that you might have fractured my skull with a toothpick, says the poor man. But we're sure to have him, for between ten and eleven o'clock at night he passed again. Spires no sooner heard this than he put some clean linen and a comb in his pocket in case he should have to stop a day or two, and away he goes, and sets himself down at one of the public house windows behind the little red curtain, with his hat on, all ready to bolt out at a moment's notice. He was smoking his pipe here late at night, when all of a sudden Chickweed roars out, "'Here he is! Stop, thief! Murder!' Jem Spires dashes out, and there he sees Chickweed a-tearing down the street full cry. Away goes Spires, on goes Chickweed, round turns the people, everybody roars out thieves, and Chickweed himself keeps on shouting all the time like mad. Spires loses sight of him a minute as he turns a corner, shoots round, sees the little crowd, dives in. Which is the man? Damn me, says Chickweed, I've lost him again. It was a remarkable occurrence, but he warn't to be seen nowhere. So they went back to the public house. Next morning, Spires took his old place and looked out from behind the curtain for a tall man with a black patch over his eye till his own two eyes ached again. At last, he couldn't help shutting him, to ease him a minute, and from the very moment he did so, he hears Chickweed a-roaring out, "'Here he is!' Off he starts once more, with Chickweed halfway down the street ahead of him, and after twice as long a run as the yesterday's one, the man's lost again. This was done once or twice more, till one half the neighbours gave out that Mr. Chickweed had been robbed by the devil, who was playing tricks with him afterwards, and the other half, a poor Mr. Chickweed, had gone mad with grief. "'What did Jem Spires say?' inquired the doctor, who had returned to the room shortly after the commencement of the story. "'Jem Spires,' resumed the officer, "'for a long time said nothing at all, and listened to everything without seeming to which showed he understood his business. But, one morning, he walked into the bar, and taking out his snuff-box, says, "'Chickweed, I found out who'd done this here robbery.' "'Have you?' said Chickweed. "'Oh, my dear Spires, only let me have vengeance, 
and I shall die contented. Oh, my dear Spires, where is this villain? Come, said Spires, offering him a pinch of snuff. None of that gammon. You did it yourself. So he had, and a good bit of money he had made by it, too, and nobody would never have found it out if he hadn't been so precious anxious to keep up appearances, said Mr. Blathers, putting down his wine-glass and clinking the handcuffs together. Very curious indeed observed the doctor. Now, if you please, you can walk upstairs. If you please, sir, returned Mr. Blathers. Closely following Mr. Losburn, the two officers ascended to Oliver's bedroom, Mr. Giles preceding the party with a lighted candle. Oliver had been dozing, but looked worse, and was more feverish than he had appeared yet. Being assisted by the doctor, he managed to sit up in bed for a minute or so and looked at the strangers without at all understanding what was going forward, in fact, without seeming to recollect where he was, or what had been passing. "'This,' said Mr. Losburn, speaking softly, but with great vehemence, notwithstanding, "'this is the lad who, being accidentally wounded by a spring-gun in some boyish trespass on Mr. what you call him's ground at the back here, comes to the house for assistance this morning and is immediately laid hold of and maltreated by that ingenious gentleman with the candle in his hand, who has placed his life in considerable danger, as I can professionally certify." Messrs. Blathers and Duff looked at Mr. Giles, as he was thus recommended to their notice. The bewildered butler gazed from them towards Oliver, and from Oliver towards Mr. Losburn, with a most ludicrous mixture of fear and perplexity. "'You don't mean to deny that, I suppose?' said the doctor laying Oliver gently down again. "'He was all done for the, for the best, sir,' answered Giles. "'I am sure I thought it was the boy, or I, I, I wouldn't have meddled with him. I am not of an inhuman disposition, sir.' "'Thought it was what boy?' inquired the senior officer. "'The housebreaker's boy, sir,' replied Giles. "'They, they certainly had a boy.' "'Well?' "'Do you think so now?' inquired Blathers. "'Think what now?' replied Giles, looking vacantly at his questioner. "'Think it's the same boy, stupid Ed,' rejoined Blathers impatiently. "'I don't know. I, I really don't know,' said Giles, with a rueful countenance. "'I couldn't swear to him.' "'What do you think?' asked Mr. Blathers. "'I—' "'I don't know what to think,' replied poor Giles. "'I don't think it is the boy. I, indeed, I, I'm almost certain that it isn't. Y you know, it can't be.' "'Has this man been a-drinking, sir?' inquired Blathers, turning to the doctor. "'What a precious muddle-headed chap you are!' said Duff, addressing Mr. Giles with supreme contempt. Mr. Losburn had been feeling the patient's pulse during this short dialogue, but he now rose from the chair by the bedside, and remarked that if the officers had any doubts upon the subject, they would perhaps like to step into the next room, and have brittles before them. Acting upon this suggestion, they adjourned to a neighbouring apartment, where Mr. Brittles, being called in, involved himself and his respected superior, in such a wonderful maze of fresh contradictions and impossibilities, as tended to throw no particular light on anything. But the fact of his own strong mystification, except indeed his declarations that he shouldn't know the real boy if he were put before him in that instant, that he had only taken Oliver to be he, because Mr. Giles had said he was, and that Mr. Giles had, five minutes previously, admitted in the kitchen that he began to be very much afraid he had been a little too hasty. Among other ingenious surmises, the question was then raised whether Mr. Giles had really hit anybody, and upon examination of the fellow pistol to that which he had fired, it turned out to have no more destructive loading than gunpowder and brown paper, a discovery which made a considerable impression on everybody but the doctor, who had drawn the ball about ten minutes before. Upon no one, however, did it make a greater impression than on Mr. Giles himself who, after labouring for some hours, under the fear of having mortally wounded a fellow-creature, eagerly caught at this new idea, and favoured it to the utmost. 
Finally, the officers, without troubling themselves very much about Oliver, left the Chertsey constable in the house, and took up their rest for that night in the town, promising to return the next morning. With the next morning there came a rumour that two men and a boy were in the cage at Kingston, who had been apprehended overnight under suspicious circumstances, and to Kingston Messrs. Blathers and Duff journeyed accordingly. The suspicious circumstances, however, resolving themselves on investigation into the one fact that they had been discovered sleeping under a haystack, which, although a great crime, is only punishable by imprisonment, and is in the merciful eye of the English law, and its comprehensive love of all the King's subjects, held to be no satisfactory proof, in the absence of all other evidence, that the sleeper, or sleepers, have committed burglary accompanied with violence, and have therefore rendered themselves liable to the punishment of death. Messrs. Blathers and Duff came back again, as wise as they went. In short, after some more examination, and a great deal more conversation, a neighbouring magistrate was readily induced to take the joint bail of Mrs. Maylie and Mr. Losburn for Oliver's appearance, if he should ever be called upon. And Blathers and Duff, being rewarded with a couple of guineas, returned to town with divided opinions on the subject of their expedition. The latter gentleman, on a mature consideration of all the circumstances, inclining to the belief that the burglarious attempt had originated with the family pet, and the former being equally disposed to concede the full merit of it to the great Mr. Conky Chickweed. Meanwhile, Oliver gradually throve and prospered, under the united care of Mrs. Maylie, Rose, and the kind-hearted Mr. Losburn. If fervent prayers, gushing from hearts overcharged with gratitude, be heard in heaven, and if they be not what prayers are, the blessings which the orphan child called down upon them, sunk into their souls, diffusing peace and happiness. End of chapter 31「Chapter thirty two of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter thirty two. Of the happy life Oliver began to lead with his kind friends. Oliver's ailings were neither slight nor few. In addition to the pain and delay attendant on a broken limb, his exposure to the wet and cold had brought on fever and ague, which hung about him for many weeks, and reduced him sadly. But at length he began, by slow degrees, to get better, and to be able to say sometimes, in a few tearful words, how deeply he felt the goodness of the two sweet ladies, and how ardently he hoped that when he grew strong and well again, he could do something to show his gratitude, only something which would let them see the love and duty with which his breast was full. Something, however slight, which would prove to them that their gentle kindness had not been cast away, but that the poor boy, whom their charity had rescued from misery or death, was eager to serve them with his whole heart and soul. "'Poor fellow,' said Rose, when Oliver had been, one day, feebly endeavouring to utter the words of thankfulness, had rose to his pale lips. "'You shall have many opportunities of serving us, if you will. "'We are going into the country, and my aunt intends that you shall accompany us. "'The quiet place, the pure air, and all the pleasure and beauties of spring will restore you in a few days. "'We will employ you in a hundred ways, when you can bear the trouble.' "'The trouble!' cried Oliver. "'Oh, dear lady, if I could but work for you. If I could only give you pleasure by watering your flowers, or watching your birds, or running up and down the whole day long to make you happy, what would I give to do it? You shall give nothing at all, said Miss Maylie, smiling, for, as I told you before, we shall employ you in a hundred ways, and if you only take half the trouble to please us that you promise now, you will make me very happy indeed. "'Happy, ma'am?' cried Oliver. "'How kind of you to say so!' "'You will make me happier than I can tell you,' replied the young lady. "'To think that my dear good aunt should have been the means of rescuing any one from such sad misery as you have described to us, 
would be an unspeakable pleasure to me. But to know that the object of her goodness and compassion was sincerely grateful and attached, in consequence, would delight me more than you can well imagine. Do you understand me? she inquired, watching Oliver's thoughtful face. Oh, yes, ma'am, yes, replied Oliver eagerly. But I was thinking that I am ungrateful now. To whom? inquired the young lady. To the kind gentleman, and the dear old nurse, who took so much care of me before," rejoined Oliver. "'If they knew how happy I am, they would be pleased, I am sure.' "'I am sure that they would,' rejoined Oliver's benefactress. "'And Mr. Losburn has already been kind enough to promise that when you are well enough to bear the journey, he will carry you to see them.' "'Has he, ma'am? cried Oliver, his face brightening with pleasure. "'I don't know what I shall do for joy when I see their kind faces once again.' In a short time, Oliver was sufficiently recovered to undergo the fatigue of this expedition. One morning he and Mr. Losburn set out, accordingly, in a little carriage which belonged to Mrs. Maylie. When they came to Chertsey Bridge, Oliver turned very pale, and uttered a loud exclamation. "'What's the matter with the boy?' cried the doctor, as usual, all in a bustle. "'Do you see anything, hear anything, feel anything, eh?' "'That, sir,' cried Oliver, pointing out of the carriage window, "'that house.' "'Yes. Well, one of it. Stop, coachman. Pull up here,' cried the doctor. "'What of the house, my man, eh?' "'The thieves. The house they took me to,' whispered Oliver. "'The devil it is.' cried the doctor. "'Hello there! Let me out!' But before the coachman could dismount from his box, he had tumbled out of the coach, by some means or other, and, running down to the deserted tenement, began kicking at the door like a madman. "'Hello!' said a little, ugly, humpbacked man, opening the door so suddenly that the doctor, from the very impetus of his last kick, nearly fell forward into the passage. "'What's the matter here?' "'Matter?' exclaimed the other, collaring him, without a moment's reflection. "'A good deal. Robbery is the matter.' "'There'll be murder the matter, too,' replied the humpback man coolly. "'If you don't take your hands off, do you hear me?' "'I hear you,' said the doctor, giving his captive a hearty shake. "'Where's—' "'Confound the fellow! What's his rascally name? Sykes! That's it!' "'Where's Sykes, you thief?' The humpback man stared, as if in excess of amazement and indignation, then, twisting himself dexterously from the doctor's grasp, growled forth a volley of horrid oaths, and retired into the house. Before he could shut the door, however, the doctor had passed into the parlour without a word of parley. He looked anxiously round. Not an article of furniture, not a vestige of anything, animate or inanimate, not even the position of the cupboards, answered Oliver's description. "'Now,' said the humpback man, who had watched him keenly, "'what do you mean by coming into my house in this violent way? Do you want to rob me or to murder me? Which is it?' "'Did you ever know a man come out to do either, in a chariot and pair, you ridiculous old vampire?' said the irritable doctor. "'What do you want, then?' demanded the hunchback. "'Will you take yourself off, before I do you a mischief? Curse you!' "'As soon as I think proper,' said Mr. Losburn, looking into the other parlour, which, like the first, bore no resemblance whatever to Oliver's account of it, "'I shall find you out some day, my friend.' "'Will you?' sneered the ill-favoured cripple. "'If you ever want me, I'm here. I haven't lived here mad and all alone for five and twenty years to be scared by you. You shall pay for this. You shall pay for this." And so saying, the misshapen little demon set up a yell, and danced upon the ground as if wild with rage. "'Stupid enough, this,' muttered the doctor to himself. "'The boy must have made a mistake. Here, put that in your pocket, and shut yourself up again.' With these words, he flung the hunchback a piece of money, and returned to the carriage. 
The man followed to the chariot door, uttering the wildest imprecations and curses all the way. But as Mr. Losburn turned to speak to the driver, he looked into the carriage, and eyed Oliver for an instant with a glance so sharp and fierce, and at the same time so furious and vindictive, that, waking or sleeping, he could not forget it for months afterwards. He continued to utter the most fearful imprecations until the driver had resumed his seat, and when they were once more on their way, they could see him some distance behind, beating his feet upon the ground, and tearing his hair in transports of real or pretended rage. "'I am an ass,' said the doctor, after a long silence. "'Did you know that before, Oliver?' "'No, sir.' "'Then don't forget it another time. An ass,' said the doctor again, after a further silence of some minutes. "'Even if it had been the right place, and the right fellows had been there, what could I have done, single-handed? And if I had had assistance, I see no good that I should have done, except leading to my own exposure, and an unavoidable statement of the manner in which I have hushed up this business. That would have served me right, though. I am always involving myself in some scrape or other by acting on impulse. It might have done me good." Now, the fact was, that the excellent doctor had never acted upon anything but impulse all through his life, and it was no bad compliment to the nature of the impulse which governed him, that so far from being involved in any peculiar troubles or misfortunes, he had the warmest respect and esteem of all who knew him. If the truth must be told, he was a little out of temper for a minute or two, at being disappointed in procuring corroborative evidence of Oliver's story on the very first occasion on which he had a chance of obtaining any. He soon came round again, however, and finding that Oliver's replies to his questions were still as straightforward and consistent, and still delivered with as much apparent sincerity and truth as they had ever been, he made up his mind to attach full credence to them from that time forth. As Oliver knew the name of the street in which Mr. Brownlow resided, they were enabled to drive straight thither. When the coach turned into it, his heart beat so violently that he could scarcely draw his breath. "'Now, my boy, which house is it?' inquired Mr. Losburn. "'That! That!' replied Oliver, pointing eagerly out of the window. "'The White House! Oh, make haste! Pray make haste! I feel as if I should die! It makes me tremble so." "'Come, come,' said the good doctor, patting him on the shoulder. "'You will see them directly, and they will be overjoyed to find you safe and well.' "'Oh, I hope so,' cried Oliver. "'They were so good to me, so very, very good to me.' The coach rolled on. It stopped. No, that was the wrong house. The next door. It went on a few paces and stopped again. Oliver looked up at the windows, with tears of happy expectation coursing down his face. Alas! the White House was empty, and there was a bill in the window to let. "'Knock at the next door,' cried Mr. Losburn, taking Oliver's arm in his. "'What has become of Mr. Brownlow, who used to live in the adjoining house, do you know?' The servant did not know, but would go and inquire. She presently returned, and said that Mr. Brownlow had sold off his goods, and gone to the West Indies six weeks before. Oliver clasped his hands, and sank feebly backward. "'Has his housekeeper gone too?' inquired Mr. Losburn, after a moment's pause. "'Yes, sir,' replied the servant. "'The old gentleman, the housekeeper, and a gentleman who was a friend of Mr. Brownlow's, all went together.' "'Then turn towards home again,' said Mr. Losburn to the driver, "'and don't stop to bait the horses till you get out of this confounded London.' "'The bookstall keeper sir,' said Oliver. "'I know the way there. See him, pray, sir. Do see him.' "'My poor boy, this is disappointment enough for one day,' said the doctor. "'Quite enough for both of us. If we go to the bookstall keepers we shall certainly find that he is dead, or set his house on fire, or run away. No, home again straight.' And in obedience to the doctor's impulse, home they went. This bitter disappointment caused Oliver much sorrow and grief, even in the midst of his happiness, for he had pleased himself many times during his illness with thinking of all that Mr. Brownlow and Mrs. Bedwin would say to him, and what delight it would be to tell them how many long days and nights he had passed in reflecting on what they had done for him, and in bewailing his cruel separation from them. 
the hope of eventually clearing himself with them too, and explaining how he had been forced away, had buoyed him up and sustained him under many of his recent trials. And now, the idea that they should have gone so far, and carried with them the belief that he was an impostor and a robber, a belief which might remain uncontradicted to his dying day, was almost more than he could bear. The circumstance occasioned no alteration, however, in the behaviour of his benefactors. After another fortnight, when the fine warm weather had fairly begun, and every tree and flower was putting forth its young leaves and rich blossoms, they made preparations for quitting the house at Chertsey for some months. Sending the plate, which had so excited Fagin's cupidity, to the bankers, and leaving Giles and another servant in care of the house, they departed to a cottage at some distance in the country, and took Oliver with them. Who can describe the pleasure and delight, the peace of mind and soft tranquillity, the sickly boy felt in the balmy air, and among the green hills and rich woods of an inland village? Who can tell how scenes of peace and quietude sink into the minds of pain-worn dwellers in close and noisy places, and carry their own freshness deep into their jaded hearts? Men who have lived in crowded, pent-up streets through lives of toil, and who have never wished for change, men to whom custom has indeed been second nature, and who have come almost to love each brick and stone that formed the narrow boundaries of their daily walks, even they, with the hand of death upon them, have been known to yearn at last for one short glimpse of nature's face, and, carried far from the scenes of their old pains and pleasures, have seemed to pass at once into a new state of being. Crawling forth from day to day, to some green sunny spot, they have had such memories wakened up within them, by the sight of the sky, and hill, and plain, and glistening water, that a foretaste of heaven itself has soothed their quick decline, and they have sunk into their tombs as peacefully as the sun whose setting they watched from their lonely chamber window but a few hours before, faded from their dim and feeble sight. The memories which peaceful country scenes call up are not of this world, nor of its thoughts and hopes. Their gentle influence may teach us how to weave fresh garlands for the graves of those we loved, may purify our thoughts, and bear down before it old enmity and hatred. But beneath all this there lingers, in the least reflective mind, a vague and half-formed consciousness of having held such feelings long before, in some remote and distant time, which calls up solemn thoughts of distant times to come, and bends down pride and worldliness beneath it. It was a lovely spot to which they repaired. Oliver, whose days had been spent among squalid crowds, and in the midst of noise and brawling, seemed to enter on a new existence there. The rose and honeysuckle clung to the cottage walls, the ivy crept round the trunks of the trees, and the garden flowers perfumed the air with delicious odours. Hard by was a little churchyard, not crowded with tall unsightly gravestones, but full of humble mounds covered with fresh turf and moss, beneath which the old people of the village lay at rest. Oliver often wandered there, and, thinking of the wretched grave in which his mother lay, would sometimes sit him down and sob unseen. But when he raised his eyes to the deep sky overhead, he would cease to think of her as lying in the ground, and would weep for her, sadly but without pain. It was a happy time. The days were peaceful and serene. The nights brought with them neither fear nor care, no languishing in a wretched prison, or associating with wretched men, nothing but pleasant and happy thoughts. Every morning he went to a white-headed old gentleman, who lived near the little church, who taught him to read better, and to write, and who spoke so kindly, and took such pains, that Oliver could never try enough to please him. Then he would walk with Mrs. Maylie and Rose, and hear them talk of books, or perhaps sit near them in some shady place, and listen whilst the young lady read, which he could have done, until it grew too dark to see the letters. Then he had his own lesson for the next day to prepare, and at this he would work hard, in a little room which looked into the garden, till evening came slowly on, when the ladies would walk out again, and he with them, listening with such pleasure to all they said, and so happy if they wanted a flower that he could climb to reach, or had forgotten anything he could run to fetch, that he could never be quick enough about it. When it became quite dark, and they returned home, the young lady would sit down to the piano, 
and play some pleasant air, or sing, in a low and gentle voice, some old song which it pleased her aunt to hear. There would be no candles lighted at such times as these, and Oliver would sit by one of the windows, listening to the sweet music in a perfect rapture. And when Sunday came, how differently the day was spent, from any way in which he had ever spent it yet, and how happily, too, like all the other days in that most happy time. There was the little church in the morning, with the green leaves fluttering at the windows, the birds singing without, and the sweet-smelling air stealing in at the low porch, and filling the homely building with its fragrance. The poor people were so neat and clean, and knelt so reverently in prayer, that it seemed a pleasure, not a tedious duty, their assembling there together. And though the singing might be rude, it was real, and sounded more musical, to Oliver's ears at least, than any he had ever heard in church before. Then there were the walks, as usual, and many calls at the clean houses of the labouring men, and at night Oliver read a chapter or two from the Bible, which he had been studying all the week, and in the performance of which duty he felt more proud and pleased than if he had been the clergyman himself. In the morning Oliver would be afoot by six o'clock, roaming the fields, and plundering the hedges, far and wide, for nosegays of wild flowers, with which he would return laden home, and which it took great care and consideration to arrange, to the best advantage, for the embellishment of the breakfast-table. There was fresh ground soil too, for Miss Maylie's birds, with which Oliver, who had been studying the subject under the able tuition of the village clerk, would decorate the cages in the most approved taste. When the birds were made all spruce and smart for the day, there was usually some little commission of charity to execute in the village, or, failing that, there was rare cricket-playing, sometimes on the green, or, failing that, there was always something to do in the garden, or about the plants, to which Oliver, who had studied this science also, under the same master, who was a gardener by trade, applied himself with hearty good will, until Miss Rose made her appearance when there were a thousand commendations to be bestowed on all he had done. So three months glided away, three months which, in the life of the most blessed and favoured of mortals, might have been unmingled happiness, and which, in Oliver's, were true felicity. With the purest and most amiable generosity on one side, and the truest, warmest, soul-felt gratitude on the other, it is no wonder that, by the end of that short time, Oliver Twist had become completely domesticated with the old lady and her niece, and that the fervent attachment of his young and sensitive heart was repaid by their pride in an attachment to himself. End of chapter 32「Chapter 33 of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter 33. Wherein the happiness of Oliver and his friends experiences a sudden check. Spring flew swiftly by, and summer came. If the village had been beautiful at first, it was now in the full glow and luxuriance of its richness. The great trees, which had looked shrunken and bare in the early months, had now burst into strong life and health and stretching forth their green arms over the thirsty ground, converted open and naked spots into choice nooks, where there was a deep and pleasant shade from which to look upon the wide prospect, steeped in sunshine, which lay stretched beyond. The earth had donned her mantle of brightest green, and shed her richest perfumes abroad. It was the prime and vigour of the year. All things were glad and flourishing. Still the same quiet life went on at the little cottage and the same cheerful serenity prevailed among its inmates. Oliver had long since grown stout and healthy, but health or sickness made no difference in his warm feelings of a great many people. He was still the same gentle, attached, affectionate creature that he had been when pain and suffering had wasted his strength, and when he was dependent for every slight attention and comfort on those who tended him. One beautiful night, when they had taken a longer walk than was customary with them, for the day had been unusually warm, and there was a brilliant moon, and a light wind had sprung up which was unusually refreshing. Rose had been in high spirits too, 
and they had walked on in merry conversation, until they had far exceeded their ordinary bounds. Mrs. Maylie, being fatigued, they returned more slowly home. The young lady, merely throwing off her simple bonnet, sat down to the piano as usual. After running abstractedly over the keys for a few minutes, she fell into a low and very solemn air, and as she played it, they heard a sound, as if she were weeping. "'Rose, my dear,' said the elderly lady. Rose made no reply, but played a little quicker, as though the words had roused her from some painful thoughts. "'Rose, my love,' cried Mrs. Maylie, rising hastily and bending over her, "'what is this? In tears? My dear child, what distresses you?' "'Nothing, aunt, nothing,' replied the young lady. "'I don't know what it is. I can't describe it, but I feel—' "'Not ill, my love?' interposed Mrs. Maylie. "'No, no, oh, oh, not ill,' replied Rose, shuddering as though some deadly chillness were passing over her while she spoke. "'I shall be better presently. Close the window, pray.' Oliver hastened to comply with her request. The young lady, making an effort to recover her cheerfulness, strove to play some livelier tune, but her fingers dropped powerless over the keys. Covering her face with her hands, she sank upon a sofa, and gave vent to the tears which she was now unable to repress. "'My child,' said the elderly lady, folding her arms about her, "'I never saw you so before. "'I would not alarm you if I could avoid it.' rejoined Rose, but indeed I have tried very hard, and cannot help this. I fear I am ill, aunt." She was, indeed, for when the candles were brought, they saw that in the very short time which had elapsed since their return home, the hue of her countenance had changed to a marble whiteness. Its expression had lost nothing of its beauty, but it was changed, and there was an anxious, haggard look about the gentle face which it had never worn before. Another minute, and it was suffused with a crimson flush, and a heavy wildness came over the soft blue eye. Again this disappeared, like the shadow thrown by a passing cloud, and she was once more deadly pale. Oliver, who watched the old lady anxiously, observed that she was alarmed by these appearances, and so in truth was he. But seeing that she affected to make light of them, he endeavoured to do the same and they so far succeeded, that when Rose was persuaded by her aunt to retire for the night, she was in better spirits, and appeared even in better health, assuring them that she felt certain she would rise in the morning quite well. "'I hope,' said Oliver, when Mrs. Maylie returned, "'that nothing is the matter. She don't look well to-night, but—' The old lady motioned to him not to speak, and sitting herself down in a dark corner of the room, remained silent for some time. At length she said, in a trembling voice, "'I hope not, Oliver. I have been very happy with her for some years. Too happy, perhaps. It may be time that I should meet with some misfortune. But I hope it is not this.' "'What?' inquired Oliver. "'The heavy blow said the old lady, of losing the dear girl who has so long been my comfort and happiness. "'Oh, God forbid!' exclaimed Oliver hastily. "'Amen to that, my child,' said the old lady, wringing her hands. "'Surely there is no danger of anything so dreadful,' said Oliver. Two hours ago she was quite well.' "'She is very ill now.' rejoined Mrs. Maylie, and will be worse, I am sure. My dear, dear Rose, oh, what shall I do without her?" She gave way to such great grief, that Oliver, suppressing his own emotion, ventured to remonstrate with her, and to beg earnestly that, for the sake of the dear young lady herself, she would be more calm. "'And consider, ma'am,' said Oliver as the tears forced themselves into his eyes, despite all of his efforts to the contrary. "'Oh, consider how young and good she is, and what pleasure and comfort she gives to all about her. 
I am sure, certain, quite certain, that for your sake, who are so good yourself, and for her own, and for the sake of all she makes so happy, she will not die. Heaven will never let her die so young. Hush! said Mrs. Maylie, laying her hand on Oliver's head. You think like a child, poor boy. But you teach me my duty notwithstanding. I had forgotten it for a moment, Oliver. But I hope I may be pardoned, for I am old, and have seen enough of illness and death to know the agony of separation from the objects of our love. I have seen enough, too, to know that it is not always the youngest and best who are spared to those that love them. But this should give us comfort in our sorrow, for heaven is just. And such things teach us, impressively, that there is a brighter world than this, and that the passage to it is speedy. God's will be done. I love her, and he knows how well. Oliver was surprised to see that as Mrs. Maylie said these words, she checked her lamentations as though by one effort, and drawing herself up as she spoke, became composed and firm. He was still more astonished to find that this firmness lasted, and that, under all the care and watching which ensued, Mrs. Maylie was ever ready and collected, performing all the duties which had devolved upon her, steadily, and, to all external appearances, even cheerfully. But he was young, and did not know what strong minds are capable of under trying circumstances. How should he, when their possessors so seldom know themselves? An anxious night ensued. When morning came, Mrs. Maylie's predictions were but too well verified. Rose was in the first stage of a high and dangerous fever. "'We must be active, Oliver, and not give way to useless grief,' said Mrs. Maylie, laying her finger on her lip, as she looked steadily into his face. "'This letter must be sent, with all possible expedition, to Mr. Losburne. It must be carried to the market-town, which is not more than four miles off, by the footpath across the field, and thence dispatched by an express on horseback straight to Chertsey. The people at the inn will undertake to do this, and I can trust to you to see it done, I know." Oliver could make no reply, but looked his anxiety to be gone at once. "'Here is another letter.' said Mrs. Maylie, pausing to reflect, but whether to send it now, or wait until I see how Rose goes on, I scarcely know. I would not forward it unless I feared the worst. "'Is it for Chertsey too, ma'am?' inquired Oliver, impatient to execute his commission, and holding out his trembling hand for the letter. "'No,' replied the old lady, giving it to him mechanically. Oliver glanced at it and saw that it was directed to Harry Maylie, Esquire, at some great lord's house in the country, where he could not make out. "'Shall it go, ma'am?' asked Oliver, looking up impatiently. "'I think not,' replied Mrs. Maylie, taking it back. "'I will wait until to-morrow.' With these words she gave Oliver her purse, and he started off, without more delay, at the greatest speed he could muster. Swiftly he ran across the fields, and down the little lanes which sometimes divided them, now almost hidden by the high corn on either side, and now emerging on an open field, where the mowers and haymakers were busy at their work. Nor did he stop once, save now and then, for a few seconds, to recover breath, until he came in a great heat and covered with dust on the little market-place of the market-town. Here he paused, and looked about for the inn. There were a white bank a red brewery, and a yellow town hall, and in one corner there was a large house, with all the wood about it painted green, before which was the sign of the George. To this he hastened as soon as it caught his eye. He spoke to a post-boy who was dozing under the gateway, and who, after hearing what he wanted, referred him to the ostler, who, after hearing all he had to say again, referred him to the landlord, who was a tall gentleman in a blue neckcloth, a white hat, drab breeches, and boots with tops to match, leaning against a pump by the stable door, picking his teeth with a silver toothpick. This gentleman walked with much deliberation into the bar, to make out the bill, which took a long time making out, and after it was ready, 
and paid, a horse had to be saddled, and a man to be dressed, which took up ten good minutes more. Meanwhile, Oliver was in such a desperate state of impatience and anxiety, that he felt as if he could have jumped upon the horse himself, and galloped away, full tear, to the next stage. At length, all was ready, and the little parcel having been handed up, with many injunctions and entreaties for its speedy delivery, the man set spurs to his horse, and rattling over the uneven paving of the market-place, was out of the town, and galloping along the turnpike road in a couple of minutes. As it was something to feel certain that assistance was sent for, and that no time had been lost, Oliver hurried up the inn-yard with a somewhat lighter heart. He was turning out of the gateway, when he accidentally stumbled against a tall man wrapped in a cloak, who was at that moment coming out of the inn-door. "'Ha!' cried the man, fixing his eyes on Oliver, and suddenly recoiling. "'What the devil's this?' "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Oliver. "'I was in a great hurry to get home, and didn't see you were coming.' "'Death!' muttered the man to himself, glaring at the boy with his large dark eyes. "'Who would have thought it? Grind him no ashes. He'd start up from a stone coffin to come in my way.' "'I'm sorry.' stammered Oliver, confused by the strange man's wild look. "'I hope I have not hurt you.' "'Rot you!' murmured the man in a horrible passion, between his clenched teeth. "'If I had only had the courage to say the word, I might have been free of you in a night. Curses on your head, and black death on your heart, you imp! What are you doing here?' The man shook his fist as he uttered these words incoherently. He advanced towards Oliver, as if with the intention of aiming a blow at him but fell violently on the ground, writhing and foaming in a fit. Oliver gazed for a moment at the struggles of the madman, for such he supposed him to be, and then darted into the house for help. Having seen him safely carried into the hotel, he turned his face homewards, running as fast as he could, to make up for lost time, and recalling with a great deal of astonishment and some fear the extraordinary behaviour of the person from whom he had just parted. The circumstance did not dwell in his recollection long, however, for when he reached the cottage there was enough to occupy his mind, and to drive all considerations of self completely from his memory. Rose Maylie had rapidly grown worse. Before midnight she was delirious. A medical practitioner, who resided on the spot, was in constant attendance upon her, and after first seeing the patient, he had taken Mrs. Maylie aside, and pronounced her disorder to be one of a most alarming nature. "'In fact,' he said, "'it would be little short of a miracle if she recovered.' How often did Oliver start from his bed that night, and stealing out, with noiseless footsteps, to the staircase, listen for the slightest sound from the sick-chamber! How often did a tremble shake his frame, and cold drops of terror start upon his brow, when a sudden trampling of feet caused him to fear that something too dreadful to think of had even then occurred! and what had been the fervency of all the prayers he had ever muttered, compared with those he poured forth now, in the agony and passion of his supplication for the life and health of the gentle creature who was tottering on the deep grave's verge! Oh, the suspense, the fearful, acute suspense, of standing idly by, while the life of one we dearly love is trembling in the balance! Oh, the racking thoughts that crowd upon the mind, and make the heart beat violently, and the breath come thick, by the force of the images they conjure up before it, the desperate anxiety to be doing something to relieve the pain or lessen the danger which we have no power to alleviate, the sinking of soul and spirit which the sad remembrance of our helplessness produces. What tortures can equal these? What reflections or endeavours can, in the full tide and fever of the time, allay them? Morning came, and the little cottage was lonely and still. People spoke in whispers. Anxious faces appeared at the gate from time to time. Women and children went away in tears. All the live-long day, and for hours after it had grown dark, Oliver paced softly up and down the garden, raising his eyes every instant to the sick chamber, and shuddering to see the darkened window, looking as if death lay stretched inside. Late that night Mr. Losburn arrived. "'It is hard.' said the good doctor, turning away as he spoke. "'So young, so much beloved! But there is very little hope!' Another morning. 
the sun shone brightly, as brightly as if it looked upon no misery or care, and with every leaf and flower in full bloom about her, with life and health and sounds and sights of joy surrounding her on every side, the fair young creature lay wasting fast. Oliver crept away to the old churchyard, and sitting down on one of the green mounds, wept and prayed for her in silence. There was such peace and beauty in the scene, so much of brightness and mirth in the sunny landscape, such blithesome music in the songs of the summer birds, such freedom in the rapid flight of the rook, careering overhead, so much of life and joyousness in all, that, when the boy raised his aching eyes, and looked about, the thought instinctively occurred to him that this was not a time for death, that Rose could surely never die, when humbler things were all so glad and gay, that graves were for cold and cheerless winter, not for sunlight and fragrance. He almost thought that shrouds were for the old and shrunken, and they never wrapped the young and graceful form in their ghastly folds. A knell from the church bell broke harshly on these youthful thoughts. Another. Again. It was tolling for the funeral service. A group of humble mourners entered the gate, wearing white favours, for the corpse was young. They stood uncovered by a grave, and there was a mother, a mother once, among the weeping train. But the sun shone brightly, and the birds sang on. Oliver turned homeward, thinking on the many kindnesses he had received from the young lady, and wishing that the time could come again, that he might never cease showing her how grateful and attached he was. He had no cause for self-reproach on the score of neglect, or want of thought, for he had been devoted to her service, and yet a hundred little occasions rose up before him, on which he fancied he might have been more zealous, and more earnest, and wished he had been. We need be careful how we deal with those about us, when every death carries, to some small circle of survivors, thoughts of so much omitted, and so little done, of so many things forgotten, and so many more which might have been repaired. There is no remorse so deep as that which is unavailing. If we would be spared its tortures, let us remember this in time. When he reached home, Mrs. Maylie was sitting in the little parlour. Oliver's heart sank at sight of her, for she had never left the bedside of her niece, and he trembled to think what change could have driven her away. He learnt that she had fallen into a deep sleep, from which she would waken either to recovery and life, or to bid them farewell and die. They sat, listening, and afraid to speak, for hours. The untasted meal was removed, with looks which showed that their thoughts were elsewhere. They watched the sun as he sank lower and lower, and, at length, cast over sky and earth those brilliant hues which herald his departure. Their quick ears caught the sound of an approaching footstep. They both involuntarily darted to the door, as Mr. Losburn entered. "'What of Rose?' cried the old lady. "'Tell me at once. I can bear it. Anything but suspense. Oh, tell me, in the name of heaven!' "'You must compose yourself,' said the doctor, supporting her. "'Be calm. My dear ma'am, pray.' "'Let me go, in God's name. My dear child, she is dead. She is dying.' "'No!' cried the doctor, passionately. "'As he is good and merciful, she will live to bless us all for years to come.' The lady fell upon her knees, and tried to fold her hands together, but the energy which had supported her so long fled up to heaven with her first thanksgiving, and she sank into the friendly arms which were extended to receive her. End of chapter 33Chapter thirty four of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter thirty four. Contains some introductory particulars relative to a young gentleman who now arrives upon the scene, and a new adventure which happened to Oliver. It was almost too much happiness to bear. Oliver felt stunned and stupefied by the unexpected intelligence. He could not weep, or speak, or rest. He had scarcely the power of understanding anything that had passed, 
until, after a long ramble in the quiet evening air, a burst of tears came to his relief, and he seemed to awaken all at once to a full sense of the joyful change that had occurred, and the almost insupportable load of anguish which had been taken from his breast. The night was fast closing in when he returned homeward, laden with flowers which he had culled with peculiar care for the adornment of the sick chamber. As he walked briskly along the road, he heard behind him the noise of some vehicle approaching at a furious pace. Looking round, he saw that it was a post-chaise, driven at great speed, and as the horses were galloping and the road was narrow, he stood leaning against the gate until it should have passed him. As it dashed on, Oliver caught a glimpse of a man in a white nightcap, whose face seemed familiar to him, although his view was so brief that he could not identify the person. In another second or two, the nightcap was thrust out of the chaise window, and a stentorian voice bellowed to the driver to stop, which he did as soon as he could pull up his horses. Then the nightcap once again appeared, and the same voice called Oliver by his name. "'Here!' cried the voice. "'Oliver! What's the news? Miss Rose! Master Oliver!' "'It is you, Giles!' cried Oliver, running up to the chaise door. Giles popped out his nightcap again, preparatory to making some reply, when he was suddenly pulled back by a young gentleman who occupied the other corner of the chaise, and who eagerly demanded what was the news. "'In a word,' cried the gentleman, "'better or worse?' "'Better! Much better!' replied Oliver hastily. "'Thank heaven!' exclaimed the gentleman. "'You are sure?' "'Quite, sir,' replied Oliver. "'The change took place only a few hours ago, and Mr. Losburn says that all danger is at an end.' The gentleman said not another word, but, opening the chaise door, leapt out, and, taking Oliver hurriedly by the arm, led him aside. "'You are quite certain. There is no possibility of any mistake on your part, my boy, is there?' demanded the gentleman, in a tremulous voice. "'Do not deceive me by awakening hopes that are not to be fulfilled.' "'I would not for the world, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Indeed, you may believe me. Mr. Losburn's words were that she would live to bless us all for many years to come. I heard him say so.' The tears stood in Oliver's eyes as he recalled the scene, which was the beginning of so much happiness, and the gentleman turned his face away and remained silent for some minutes. Oliver thought he heard him sob, more than once, but he feared to interrupt him by any fresh remark, for he could well guess what his feelings were, and so stood apart, feigning to be occupied with his nosegay. All this time Mr. Giles, with the white nightcap on, had been sitting on the steps of the chaise, supporting an elbow on each knee, and wiping his eyes with a blue cotton pocket-handkerchief, dotted with white spots. That the honest fellow had not been feigning emotion was abundantly demonstrated by the very red eyes with which he regarded the young gentleman. Then he turned round and addressed him. "'I think you had better go on to my mother's in the chaise, Giles,' said he. "'I would rather walk slowly on, so as to gain a little time before I see her. You can say I am coming.' "'I beg your pardon, Mr. Harry,' said Giles giving a final polish to his ruffled countenance with the handkerchief. "'But if you would leave the postboy to say that, I should be very much obliged to you. It wouldn't be proper for the maids to see me in this state, sir. I should never have any more authority with them if they did.' "'Well,' rejoined Harry Maylie, smiling, "'you can do as you like. Let him go on with the luggage, if you wish, and do you follow with us. Only first exchange that nightcap for some more appropriate covering or we shall be taken for madmen." Mr. Giles, reminded of his unbecoming costume, snatched off and pocketed his nightcap, and substituted a hat of grave and sober shape, which he took out of the chaise. This done, the postboy drove off. Giles, Mr. Maylie, and Oliver followed at their leisure. As they walked along, Oliver glanced from time to time with much interest and curiosity at the newcomer. He seemed about five and twenty years of age and was of the middle height, his countenance was frank and handsome, and his demeanour easy and prepossessing. Notwithstanding the difference between youth and age, he bore so strong a likeness to the old lady, 
that Oliver would have had no great difficulty in imagining their relationship, if he had not already spoken of her as his mother. Mrs. Maylie was anxiously waiting to receive her son when he reached the cottage. The meeting did not take place without great emotion on both sides. "'Mother,' whispered the young man, "'why did you not write before?' "'I did,' replied Mrs. Maylie, "'but on reflection I determined to keep back the letter until I had heard Mr. Losburn's opinion.' "'But why?' said the young man. "'Why run the chance of that occurring, which so nearly happened? If Rose had—I cannot utter that word now. If this illness had terminated differently, how could you ever have forgiven yourself? How could I ever have known happiness again?' "'If that had been the case, Harry,' said Mrs. Maylie, "'I fear your happiness would have been effectually blighted, and that your arrival here, a day sooner or a day later, would have been of very, very little import.' "'And who can wonder if it be so, mother?' rejoined the young man. "'Or why should I say, if, it, it is, it is, oh, you know it, mother, you must know it. I know that she deserves the best and purest love the heart of man can offer,' said Mrs. Maylie. "'I know that the devotion and affection of her nature require no ordinary return, but one that shall be deep and lasting.' If I did not feel this, and know, besides, that a changed behaviour in ones she loved would break her heart, I should not feel my task so difficult of performance, or have to encounter so many struggles in my own bosom, when I take what seems to me to be the strict line of duty." "'This is unkind, mother,' said Harry. "'Do you still suppose that I am a boy, ignorant of my own mind, and mistaking the impulses of my own soul?' "'I think, my dear son,' returned Mrs. Maylie, laying her hand upon his shoulder, "'that youth has many generous impulses which do not last, and that among them are some which, being gratified, become only the more fleeting. Above all, I think,' said the lady, fixing her eyes on her son's face, "'that if an enthusiastic, ardent, and ambitious man marry a wife on whose name there is a stain, which, though it originate in no fault of hers, may be visited by cold and sordid people upon her, and upon his children also, and, in exact proportion to his success in the world, be cast in his teeth, and made the subject of sneers against him. He may, no matter how generous and good his nature, one day repent of the connection he formed in early life and she may have the pain of knowing that he does so. Mother, said the young man impatiently, he would be a selfish brute, unworthy alike of the name of man and of the woman you describe who acted thus. You think so now, Harry, replied his mother, and ever will, said the young man. The mental agony I have suffered during the last two days— "'Rings from me the avowal to you of a passion which, as you well know, is not one of yesterday, nor one I have lightly formed. On Rose, sweet, gentle girl, my heart is set, as firmly as ever heart of man was set on woman. I have no thought, no view, no hope in life beyond her. And if you oppose me in this great stake, you take my peace and happiness in your hands, and cast them to the wind. Mother! Think better of this, and of me, and do not disregard the happiness of which you seem to think so little." "'Harry,' said Mrs. Maylie, "'it is because I think so much of warm and sensitive hearts, that I would spare them from being wounded. But we have said enough, and more than enough, on this matter just now. Let it rest with Rose, then,' interposed Harry. You will not press these overstrained opinions of yours so far as to throw any obstacle in my way?" "'I will not,' rejoined Mrs. Maylie. "'But I would have you consider—' "'I have considered,' was the impatient reply. "'Mother, I have considered years and years. I have considered ever since I have been capable of serious reflection. My feelings remain unchanged, as they ever will. And why should I suffer the pain of a delay in giving them vent, which can be productive of no earthly good? 
No. Before I leave this place, Rose shall hear me. She shall, said Mrs. Maylie. There is something in your manner which would almost imply that she will hear me coldly, mother, said the young man. Not coldly, rejoined the old lady. Far from it. How then? urged the young man. She has formed no other attachment. No, indeed, replied his mother. You have, or I mistake, too strong a hold on her affections already. What I would say, resumed the old lady, stopping her son as he was about to speak, is this. Before you stake your all on this chance, before you suffer yourself to be carried to the highest point of hope, reflect for a few moments, my dear child, on Rose's history, and consider what effect the knowledge of her doubtful birth may have on her decision. Devoted as she is to us, with all the intensity of her noble mind, and with that perfect sacrifice of self which in all matters, great or trifling, has always been her characteristic. "'What do you mean?' "'That I leave you to discover,' replied Mrs. Maylie. "'I must go back to her. God bless you.' "'I shall see you again to-night,' said the young man eagerly. "'By and by,' replied the lady. "'When I leave Rose—' "'You will tell her I am here,' said Harry. "'Of course,' replied Mrs. Maylie. "'And say how anxious I have been, and how much I have suffered, and how I long to see her. You will not refuse to do this, mother?' "'No,' said the old lady. "'I will tell her all.' And pressing her son's hand affectionately, she hastened from the room. Mr. Losburn and Oliver had remained at another end of the apartment, while this hurried conversation was proceeding. The former now held out his hand to Harry Maylie, and hearty salutations were exchanged between them. The doctor then communicated, in reply to multifarious questions from his young friend, a precise account of his patient's situation, which was quite as consolatory and full of promise, as Oliver's statement had encouraged him to hope, and to the whole of which Mr. Giles, who affected to be busy about the luggage, listened with greedy ears. "'Have you shot anything particular lately, Giles?' inquired the doctor, when he had concluded. "'Nothing particular, sir,' replied Mr. Giles, colouring up to the eyes. "'Nor catching any thieves, nor identifying any housebreakers?' said the doctor. "'None at all, sir,' replied Mr. Giles, with much gravity. "'Well,' said the doctor, "'I am sorry to hear it.' "'because you do that sort of thing admirably. "'Pray, how is Brittles?' "'The the boy is very well, sir,' said Mr. Giles, "'recovering his usual tone of patronage, "'and sends his respectful duty, sir.' "'That's well,' said the doctor. "'Seeing you here reminds me, Mr. Giles, "'that on the day before that on which I was called away so hurriedly, "'I executed, at the request of your good mistress, "'a small commission in your favour. "'Just step into this corner a moment, will you?' Mr. Giles walked into the corner with much importance and some wonder, and was honoured with a short whispering conference with the doctor, on the termination of which he made a great many bows, and retired with steps of unusual stateliness. The subject matter of this conference was not disclosed in the parlour, but the kitchen was speedily enlightened concerning it, for Mr. Giles walked straight thither, and having called for a mug of ale, announced, with an air of majesty, which was highly effective, that it had pleased his mistress, in consideration of his gallant behaviour on the occasion of that attempted robbery, to deposit, in the local savings-bank, the sum of five-and-twenty pounds for his sole use and benefit. At this the two women-servants lifted up their hands and eyes, and supposed that Mr. Giles, pulling out his shirt-frill, replied, "'No, no!' and that if they observed that he was at all haughty to his inferiors, he would thank them to tell him so. And then he made a great many other remarks, no less illustrative of his humility, which were received with equal favour and applause, and were withal as original and as much to the purpose as the remarks of great men commonly are. Above the stairs, the remainder of the evening passed cheerfully away, for the doctor was in high spirits, and however fatigued or thoughtful Harry Maylie might have been at first, he was not proof against the worthy gentleman's good humour, 
which displayed itself in a great variety of sallies and professional recollections, and an abundance of small jokes, which struck Oliver as being the drollest things he had ever heard, and caused him to laugh proportionately, to the evident satisfaction of the doctor, who laughed immoderately at himself, and made Harry laugh almost as heartily by the very force of sympathy. So, they were as pleasant a party as, under the circumstances, they could well have been, and it was late before they retired, with light and thankful hearts, to take that rest of which, after the doubt and suspense they had recently undergone, they stood much in need. Oliver rose next morning in better heart, and went about his usual occupations with more hope and pleasure than he had known for many days. The birds were once more hung out to sing in their old places, and the sweetest wild flowers that could be found were once more gathered to gladden Rose with their beauty. The melancholy, which had seemed to the sad eyes of the anxious boy to hang for days past over every object, beautiful as all were, was dispelled by magic. The dew seemed to sparkle more brightly on the green leaves, the air to rustle among them with a sweeter music, and the sky itself to look more blue and bright. Such is the influence which the condition of our own thoughts exercise even over the appearance of external objects. Men who look on nature and their fellow men, and cry that all is dark and gloomy, are in the right, but the sombre colours are reflections from their own jaundiced eyes and hearts. The real hues are delicate and need a clearer vision. It is worthy of remark, and Oliver did not fail to note it at the time, that his morning expeditions were no longer made alone. Harry Maylie, after the very first morning when he met Oliver, coming laden home, was seized with such a passion for flowers, and displayed such a taste in their arrangement, as left his young companion far behind. If Oliver were behindhand in these respects, he knew where the best were to be found, and morning after morning they scoured the country together, and brought home the fairest that blossomed. The window of the young lady's chamber was open now, for she loved to feel the rich summer air stream in, and revive her with its freshness. But they always stood in water, just inside the lattice, one particular little bunch which was made up with great care every morning. Oliver could not help noticing that the withered flowers were never thrown away, although the little vase was regularly replenished, nor could he help observing that whenever the doctor came into the garden, he invariably cast his eyes up to that particular corner, and nodded his head most expressively as he set forth on his morning's walk. Pending these observations, the days were flying by, and Rose was rapidly recovering. Nor did Oliver's time hang heavy on his hands. Although the young lady had not yet left her chamber, and there were no evening walks, save now and then for a short distance with Mrs. Maylie, he applied himself, with redoubled assiduity, to the instructions of the white-headed old gentleman, and laboured so hard that his quick progress surprised even himself. It was while he was engaged in this pursuit that he was greatly startled and distressed by a most unexpected occurrence. The little room in which he was accustomed to sit, when busy at his books, was on the ground floor at the back of the house. It was quite a cottage room, with a lattice window, around which were clusters of jessamine and honeysuckle, that crept over the casement, and filled the place with their delicious perfume. It looked into a garden, whence a wicket gate opened into a small paddock. All beyond was fine meadow-land and wood. There was no other dwelling near, in that direction, and the prospect it commanded was very extensive. One beautiful evening, when the first shades of twilight were beginning to settle upon the earth, Oliver sat at this window, intent upon his books. He had been poring over them for some time, and as the day had been uncommonly sultry, and he had exerted himself a great deal, it is no disparagement to the authors, whoever they may have been, to say that gradually, and by slow degrees, he fell asleep. There is a kind of sleep that steals upon us sometimes, which, while it holds the body prisoner, does not free the mind from a sense of things about it, and enable it to ramble at its pleasure. So far as an overpowering heaviness, a prostration of strength, and an utter inability to control our thoughts or power of motion, can be called sleep, this is it. And yet, we have a consciousness of all that is going on about us. And, if we dream at such a time, words which are really spoken, or sounds which really exist at the moment, 
accommodate themselves with surprising readiness to our visions, until reality and imagination become so strangely blended that it is afterwards almost matter of impossibility to separate the two. Nor is this the most striking phenomenon incidental to such a state. It is an undoubted fact that although our senses of touch and sight be for the time dead, yet our sleeping thoughts and the visionary scenes that pass before us will be influenced and materially influenced by the mere silent presence of some external object which may not have been near us when we close our eyes, and of whose vicinity we have had no waking consciousness. Oliver knew perfectly well that he was in his own little room, that his books were lying on the table before him, that the sweet air was stirring among the creeping plants outside, and yet he was asleep. Suddenly the scene changed, the air became close and confined, and he thought with a glow of terror that he was in the Jew's house again. There sat the hideous old man in his accustomed corner, pointing at him, and whispering to another man, with his face averted, who sat beside him. "'Hush, my dear,' he thought he heard the Jew say. "'It is he, sure enough. Come away.' "'He?' the other man seemed to answer. "'Could I mistake him, think you? If a crowd of ghosts have put themselves into his exact shape, and he stood amongst them, there is something that would tell me how to point him out. If you buried him fifty feet deep and took me across his grave, I fancy I should know, if there wasn't a mark above it that he lay buried there.' The man seemed to say this with such dreadful hatred that Oliver awoke with the fear and started up. Good heaven! What was that which sent the blood tingling to his heart? and deprived him of his voice and of power to move. There, there, at the window, close before him, so close that he could have almost touched him before he started back, with his eyes peering into the room and meeting his. There stood the Jew, and beside him, white with rage or fear or both, were the scowling features of the man who had accosted him in the inn-yard. It was but an instant, a glance, a flash, before his eyes, and they were gone but they had recognised him, and he them, and their look was as firmly impressed upon his memory, as if it had been deeply carved in stone, and set before him from his birth. He stood transfixed for a moment, then, leaping from the window into the garden, called loudly for help. End of chapter 34《of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 35. Containing the unsatisfactory result of Oliver's adventure, and a conversation of some importance between Harry Maylie and Rose. When the inmates of the house, attracted by Oliver's cries, hurried to the spot from which they proceeded, they found him pale and agitated, pointing in the direction of the meadows behind the house, and scarcely able to articulate the words, "'The Jew! The Jew!' Mr. Giles was at a loss to comprehend what this outcry meant, but Harry Maylie, whose perceptions were something quicker, and who had heard Oliver's history from his mother, understood it at once. "'What direction did he take?' he asked catching up a heavy stick which was standing in a corner. "'That,' replied Oliver, pointing out the course the man had taken. "'I missed them in an instant.' "'Then they are in the ditch,' said Harry. "'Follow, and keep as near me as you can.' So saying, he sprang over the hedge, and darted off with a speed which rendered it a matter of exceeding difficulty for the others to keep near him. Giles followed as well as he could and Oliver followed too. And in the course of a minute or two, Mr. Losburn, who had been out walking, and just then returned, tumbled over the hedge after them, and picking himself up with more agility than he could have been supposed to possess, struck into the same course at no contemptible speed, shouting all the while, most prodigiously, to know what was the matter. On they all went, nor stopped they once to breathe, until the leader, striking off into an angle of the field indicated by Oliver, began to search narrowly, the ditch and hedge adjoining, which afforded time for the remainder of the party to come up, 
and for Oliver to communicate to Mr. Losburne the circumstances that had led to so vigorous a pursuit. The search was all in vain. There were not even the traces of recent footsteps to be seen. They stood now on the summit of a little hill, commanding the open fields in every direction for three or four miles. There was a village in the hollow on the left, but, in order to gain that, after pursuing the track Oliver had pointed out, the men must have made a circuit of open ground, which it was impossible they could have accomplished in so short a time. A thick wood skirted the meadowland in another direction, but they could not have gained that covert for the same reason. "'It must have been a dream, Oliver,' said Harry Maylie. "'Oh, no, indeed, sir,' replied Oliver, shuddering at the very recollection of the old wretch's countenance. "'I saw him too plainly for that. I saw them both, as plainly as I see you now.' "'Who was the other?' inquired Harry and Mr. Losburne together. "'The very same man I told you of, who came so suddenly upon me at the inn.' said Oliver. We had our eyes fixed full upon each other, and I could swear to him." "'They took this way?' demanded Harry. "'Are you sure?' "'As I am that the men were at the window,' replied Oliver, pointing down as he spoke to the hedge which divided the cottage garden from the meadow. "'The tall man leapt over just there, and Jew running a few paces to the right, crept through that gap." The two gentlemen watched Oliver's earnest face as he spoke, and looking from him to each other, seemed to feel satisfied of the accuracy of what he said. Still, in no direction were there any appearances of the trampling of men and hurried flight. The grass was long, but it was trodden down nowhere, save where their own feet had crushed it. The sides and brinks of the ditches were of damp clay but in no one place could they discern the print of men's shoes, or the slightest mark which would indicate that any feet had pressed the ground for hours before. "'This is strange,' said Harry. "'Strange?' echoed the doctor. "'Blathers and Duff themselves could make nothing of it.' Notwithstanding the evidently useless nature of their search, they did not desist until the coming on of night rendered its further prosecution hopeless, and even then they gave it up with reluctance. Giles was dispatched to the different alehouses in the village, furnished with the best description Oliver could give of the appearance and dress of the strangers. Of these, the Jew was, at all events, sufficiently remarkable to be remembered, supposing he had been seen drinking or loitering about. But Giles returned without any intelligence, calculated to dispel or lessen the mystery. On the next day, fresh search was made and the inquiries renewed, but with no better success. On the day following, Oliver and Mr. Maylie repaired to the market town, in the hope of seeing or hearing something of the men there, but this effort was equally fruitless. After a few days, the affair began to be forgotten, as most affairs are, when wonder, having no fresh food to support it, dies away of itself. Meanwhile, Rose was rapidly recovering. She had left her room was able to go out, and mixing once more with the family, carried joy into the hearts of all. But, although this happy change had a visible effect on the little circle, and although cheerful voices and merry laughter were once more heard in the cottage, there was at times an unwonted restraint upon some there, even upon Rose herself, which Oliver could not fail to remark. Mrs. Maylie and her son were often closeted together for a long time and more than once Rose appeared with traces of tears upon her face. After Mr. Losburne had fixed a day for his departure to Chertsey, these symptoms increased, and it became evident that something was in progress which affected the peace of the young lady, and of somebody else besides. At length, one morning, when Rose was alone in the breakfast parlour, Harry Maylie entered, and, with some hesitation, begged permission to speak with her for a few moments. "'A few, a very few, will suffice, Rose,' said the young man, drawing his chair towards her. "'What I shall have to say has already presented itself to your mind. The most cherished hopes of my heart are not unknown to you, though from my lips you have not heard them stated.' 
Rose had been very pale, from the moment of his entrance, but that night had been the effect of her recent illness. She merely bowed, and bending over some plants that stood near, waited in silence for him to proceed. "'I—I I ought to have left here before,' said Harry. "'You should, indeed,' replied Rose. "'Forgive me for saying so, but I wish you had.' "'I was brought here by the most dreadful and agonizing of all apprehensions,' said the young man. "'The fear of losing the one dear being on whom my every wish and hope are fixed. You had been dying, trembling between earth and heaven. We know that when the young, the beautiful and good, are visited with sickness, their pure spirits insensibly turn towards their bright home of lasting rest. We know, heaven help us, that the best and fairest of our kind too often fade in blooming. There were tears in the eyes of the gentle girl, as these words were spoken, and when one fell upon the flower over which she bent, and glistened brightly in its cup, making it more beautiful, it seemed as though the outpouring of her fresh young heart claimed kindred naturally with the loveliest things in nature. "'A creature,' continued the young man passionately, "'a creature as fair and innocent of guile as one of God's own angels fluttered between life and death. Oh, who could hope, when the distant world to which she was to kin, half open to her view, that she would return to the sorrow and calamity of this? Rose, Rose, to know that you were passing away like some soft shadow, which a light from above casts upon the earth, to have no hope that you would be spared to those who linger here, hardly to know a reason why you should be, to feel that you belong to that bright sphere whither so many of the fairest and the best have winged their early flight and yet to pray, amid all these consolations, that you might be restored to those who loved you. These were distractions almost too great to bear. They were mine, by day and night, and with them came such a rushing torrent of fears and apprehensions and selfish regrets, lest you should die, and never know how devotedly I loved you, as almost bore down sense and reason in its course. You recovered, day by day, and almost hour by hour, some drop of health came back, and mingling with the spent and feeble stream of life which circulated languidly within you, swelled it again to a high and rushing tide. I have watched you change, almost from death to life, with eyes that turn blind with their eagerness and deep affection. Do not tell me that you wish I had lost this for it has softened my heart to all mankind." "'I did not mean that,' said Rose, weeping. "'I only wish you had left here, that you might have turned to high and noble pursuits again, to pursuits well worthy of you.' "'There is no pursuit more worthy of me, more worthy of the highest nature that exists, than the struggle to win such a heart as yours,' said the young man taking her hand, Rose, my own dear Rose, for years, for years I have loved you, hoping to win my way to fame, and then come home proudly and tell you it had been pursued only for you to share, thinking in my daydreams how I would remind you in that happy moment of the many silent tokens I had given of a boy's attachment and claim your hand, as in redemption of some old mute contract that had been sealed between us. That time has not arrived. But here, with not fame won, and no young vision realized, I offer you the heart so long your own, and stake my all upon the words with which you greet the offer. Your behaviour has ever been kind and noble, said Rose mastering the emotions by which she was agitated, as you believe that I am not insensible or ungrateful. So hear my answer. It is that I may endeavour to deserve you. It is, dear Rose. It is, replied Rose, that you must endeavour to forget me, not as your old and dearly attached companion, for that would wound me deeply, but as the object of your love. Look into the world. 
think how many hearts you would be proud to gain are there. Confide some other passion to me, if you will. I will be the truest, warmest, and most faithful friend you have." There was a pause, during which Rose, who had covered her face with one hand, gave free vent to her tears. Harry still retained the other. "'And your reasons, Rose?' he said at length in a low voice. "'Your reasons for this decision?' "'You have a right to know them,' rejoined Rose. "'You can say nothing to alter my resolution. "'It is a duty that I must perform. "'I owe it, alike to others and to myself.' "'To yourself?' "'Yes, Harry. "'I owe it to myself that I, a friendless, portionless girl, with a blight upon my name, should not give your friends reason to suspect that I had sordidly yielded to your first passion, and fastened myself, a clog, on all your hopes and projects. I owe it to you and yours, to prevent you from opposing, in the warmth of your generous nature, this great obstacle to your progress in the world. "'If your inclinations chime with your sense of duty,' Harry began, "'they do not.' replied Rose, colouring deeply. "'Then you return, my love,' said Harry. "'Say but that, dear Rose, say but that, and soften the bitterness of this hard disappointment. If I could have done so, without doing heavy wrong to him I loved,' rejoined Rose, "'I could have—' "'Have received this declaration very differently,' said Harry. "'Do not conceal that from me at least, Rose.' "'I could,' said Rose. "'Stay,' she added, disengaging her hand. "'Why should we prolong this painful interview? Most painful to me, and yet productive of lasting happiness notwithstanding. For it will be happiness to know that I once held the high place in your regard, which I now occupy, and every triumph you achieve in life will animate me with new fortitude and firmness.' Farewell, Harry. As we have met to-day, we meet no more, but in other relations than those in which this conversation have placed us. We may be long and happily entwined, and may every blessing that the prayers of a true and earnest heart can call down from the source of all truth and sincerity cheer and prosper you." "'Another word, Rose,' said Harry, "'your reason in your own words from your own lips. Let me hear it." "'The prospect before you,' answered Rose firmly, "'is a brilliant one. All the honours to which great talents and powerful connections can help men in public life are in store for you. But those connections are proud, and I will neither mingle with such as may hold in scorn the mother who gave me life, nor bring disgrace or failure on the son of her who has so well supplied that mother's place. "'In a word,' said the young lady, turning away, as her temporary firmness forsook her, "'there is a stain upon my name, which the world visits on innocent heads. I will carry it into no blood but my own, and the reproach shall rest alone on me.' "'One word more, Rose. Dearest Rose, one more,' cried Harry, throwing himself before her. If I had been less, less fortunate, the world would call it, if some obscure and peaceful life had been my destiny, if I had been poor, sick, helpless, would you have turned from me then? Or has my probable advancement to riches and honour given this scruple birth?" "'Do not press me to reply,' answered Rose. "'The question does not arise, and never will. It is unfair almost unkind to urge it." "'If your answer be what I almost dare to hope it is,' retorted Harry, "'it will shed a gleam of happiness upon my lonely way, and light the path before me. It is not an idle thing to do so much by the utterance of a few brief words, for one who loves you beyond all else. Oh, Rose, in the name of my ardent and enduring attachment, in the name of all I have suffered for you, and all you doom me to undergo, 
Answer me this one question. Then, if your lot had been differently cast, rejoined Rose, if you had been even a little, but not so far above me, if I could have been a help and comfort to you, in any humble scene of peace and retirement, and not a blot and drawback in ambitious and distinguished crowds, I should have been spared this trial. I have every reason to be happy, very happy now. But then, Harry, I own, I should have been happier." Busy recollections of old hopes, cherished as a girl long ago, crowded into the mind of Rose while making this avowal. But they brought tears with them, as old hopes will when they come back withered, and they relieved her. "'I cannot help this weakness, and it makes my purpose stronger.' said Rose, extending her hand. "'I must leave you now, indeed.' "'I ask one promise,' said Harry. "'Once, and only once more. Say, within a year, but it may be much sooner. I may speak to you again on this subject, for the last time.' "'Not to press me to alter my right determination,' replied Rose, with a melancholy smile. "'It will be useless.' "'No.' said Harry, to hear you repeat it, if you will. Finally repeat it. I will lay at your feet whatever of station of fortune I may possess, and if you still adhere to your present resolution, will not seek, by word or act, to change it." "'Then let it be so,' rejoined Rose. "'It is but one pang the more, and by that time I may be enabled to bear it better.' She extended her hand again, but the young man caught her to his bosom, and imprinting one kiss on her beautiful forehead, hurried from the room. End of chapter 35「Chapter 36 of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Thirty Six, is a very short one, and may appear of no great importance in its place, but it should be read notwithstanding, as a sequel to the last, and a key to one that will follow when its time arrives. And so you are resolved to be my travelling companion this morning, eh? said the doctor, as Harry Maylie joined him and Oliver at the breakfast table. Why, you are not in the same mind or intention two half hours together. "'You will tell me a different tale one of these days,' said Harry, colouring without any perceptible reason. "'I hope I may have good cause to do so,' replied Mr. Losburn. "'Though I confess, I don't think I shall. But yesterday morning you had made up your mind, in a great hurry, to stay here, and to accompany your mother, like a dutiful son, to the seaside. Before noon you announced that you were going to do me the honour of accompanying me, as far as I go, on your road to London.' and at night you urge me, with great mystery, to start before the ladies are stirring, the consequence of which is that young Oliver here is pinned down to his breakfast when he ought to be ranging the meadows after botanical phenomena of all kinds. Too bad, isn't it, Oliver?" "'I should have been very sorry not to have been at home when you and Mr. Maylie went away, sir,' rejoined Oliver. "'That's a fine fellow,' said the doctor. "'You shall come and see me when you return. But to speak seriously, Harry, has any communication from the great knobs produced this sudden anxiety on your part to be gone?" "'The great knobs,' replied Harry, under which designation I presume you include my most stately uncle, have not communicated with me at all since I have been here, nor at this time of the year is it likely that anything would occur to render necessary my immediate attendance among them." Well said the doctor. You are a queer fellow. But, of course, they will get you into Parliament at the election before Christmas, and these sudden shiftings and changes are no bad preparation for political life. There's something in that. Good training is always desirable, whether the race be for place, cup, or sweepstakes." Harry Maylie looked as if he could have followed up this short dialogue by one or two remarks that would have staggered the doctor not a little but he contented himself with saying, "'We shall see,' and pursued the subject no farther. 
the post-chaise drove up to the door shortly afterwards, and Giles coming in for the luggage, the good doctor bustled out to see it packed. "'Oliver,' said Harry Maylie in a low voice, "'let me speak a word with you.' Oliver walked into the window recess, to which Mr. Maylie beckoned him, much surprised at the mixture of sadness and boisterous spirits which his whole behaviour displayed. "'You can write well now,' said Harry, laying his hand upon his arm. "'I hope so, sir,' replied Oliver. "'I shall not be at home again, perhaps for some time. I wish you would write to me, say, once a fortnight, every alternate Monday, to the General Post Office in London, will you?' "'Oh, certainly, sir. I should be proud to do it,' exclaimed Oliver, greatly delighted with the commission. "'I should like to know how—how how my mother and Miss Maylie are,' said the young man, "'and you can fill up a sheet by telling me what walks you take, and what you talk about, and whether she—they, I mean—seem happy and, and quite well. You understand me?' "'Oh, quite, sir, quite.' replied Oliver. "'I would rather you did not mention it to them,' said Harry, hurrying over his words, "'because it, it might make my mother anxious to write to me oftener, and it is a trouble and a worry to her. Let it be a secret between you and me, and mind you tell me everything. I depend upon you.' Oliver, quite elated and honoured by a sense of his importance, faithfully promised to be secret and explicit in his communications. Mr. Maylie took leave of him, with many assurances of his regard and protection. The doctor was in the chaise. Giles, who it had been arranged should be left behind, held the door open in his hand, and the women servants were in the garden looking on. Harry cast one slight glance at the latticed window, and jumped into the carriage. "'Drive on!' he cried. "'Hard! Fast! Full gallop! Nothing short of flying will keep pace with me to-day!' "'Hello!' cried the doctor, letting down the front glass in a great hurry, and shouting to the postillion, "'Something very short of flying will keep pace with me, do you hear?' Jingling and clattering, till distance rendered its noise inaudible, and its rapid progress only perceptible to the eye, the vehicle wound its way along the road, almost hidden in a cloud of dust, now wholly disappearing, and now becoming visible again, as intervening objects, or the intricacies of the way, permitted. It was not until even the dusty cloud was no longer to be seen, that the gazers dispersed. And there was one looker-on, who remained with eyes fixed upon the spot where the carriage had disappeared, long after it was many miles away. For behind the white curtain, which had shrouded her from view, when Harry raised his eyes towards the window, sat Rose herself. "'He seems in high spirits and happy,' she said at length. "'I feared for a time he might be otherwise.' I was mistaken. I am very, very glad." Tears are signs of gladness as well as grief, but those which coursed down Rose's face, as she sat pensively at the window, still gazing in the same direction, seemed to tell more of sorrow than of joy. End of chapter 36《》Chapter 37 of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 37. In which the reader may perceive a contrast, not uncommon in matrimonial cases. Mr. Bumble sat in the workhouse parlour, with his eyes moodily fixed on the cheerless grate, whence, as it was summer time, no brighter gleam proceeded than the reflection of a certain sickly rays of the sun, which were sent back from its cold and shining surface. A paper fly-cage dangled from the ceiling, to which he occasionally raised his eyes in gloomy thought, and, as the heedless insects hovered round the gaudy network, Mr. Bumble would heave a deep sigh, while a more gloomy shadow overspread his countenance. Mr. Bumble was meditating. It might be that the insects brought to mind some painful passage in his own past life. Nor was Mr. Bumble's gloom the only thing calculated to awaken a pleasing melancholy in the bosom of a spectator. There were not wanting other appearances, and those closely connected with his own person, 
which announced that a great change had taken place in the position of his affairs. The laced coat, and the cocked hat, where were they? He still wore knee-breeches, and dark cotton stockings on his nether limbs, but they were not THE breeches. The coat was wide-skirted, and in that respect like THE coat, but oh, how different! The mighty cocked hat was replaced by a modest round one. Mr. Bumble was no longer a beadle. There are some promotions in life which, independent of the more substantial rewards they offer, require peculiar value and dignity from the coats and waistcoats connected with them. A field marshal has his uniform, a bishop his silk apron, a councillor his silk gown, a beadle his cocked hat. Strip the bishop of his apron, or the beadle of his hat and lace, what are they? Men. Mere men. Dignity, and even holiness, too, sometimes are more questions of coat and waistcoat than some people imagine. Mr. Bumble had married Mrs. Corney, and was master of the workhouse. Another beadle had come into power. On him the cocked hat, gold-laced coat and staff, had all three descended. "'And to-morrow, two months it was done,' said Mr. Bumble with a sigh. "'It seems a age.' Mr. Bumble might have meant that he had concentrated a whole existence of happiness into the short space of eight weeks. But the sigh—there was a vast deal of meaning in the sigh. "'I sold myself,' said Mr. Bumble, pursuing the same train of reflection. "'For six teaspoons, a pair of sugar-tongs, and a milk-pot, with a small quantity of second-hand furniture, and twenty pound in money. I went very reasonable. Cheap. Dirt cheap.' "'Cheap!' cried a shrill voice in Mr. Bumble's ear. "'You would have been dear at any price. And dear enough I paid for you, Lord above knows that!' Mr. Bumble turned, and encountered the face of his interesting consort, who, imperfectly comprehending the few words she had overheard of his complaint, had hazarded the foregoing remark at a venture. "'Mrs. Bumble, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble, with a sentimental sternness. "'Well?' cried the lady. "'Have the goodness to look at me,' said Mr. Bumble, fixing his eyes upon her. "'If she stands such a eye as that,' said Mr. Bumble to himself, "'she can stand anything. It is an eye I never knew to fail with paupers. If it fails with her, my power is gone.' Whether an exceedingly small expansion of eye be sufficient to quell paupers, who, being lightly fed, are in no very high condition, or whether the late Mrs. Corney was particularly proof against eagle glances, are matters of opinion. The matter of fact is, that the matron was in no way overpowered by Mr. Bumble's scowl, but, on the contrary, treated it with great disdain, and even raised a laugh thereat, which sounded as though it were genuine. On hearing this most unexpected sound, Mr. Bumble looked, first incredulous, and afterwards amazed. He then relapsed into his former state, nor did he rouse himself until his attention was again awakened by the voice of his partner. "'Are you going to sit snoring there all day?' inquired Mrs. Bumble. "'I am going to sit here as long as I think proper, ma'am,' rejoined Mr. Bumble. "'And although I was not snoring, I shall snore, gape, sneeze, laugh, or cry, as the humour strikes me, such being my prerogative.' "'Your prerogative,' sneered Mrs. Bumble, with ineffable contempt. "'I said the word, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble. "'The prerogative of a man is to command.' "'And what's the prerogative of a woman in the name of goodness?' cried the relict of Mr. Corney, deceased. "'To obey, ma'am,' thundered Mr. Bumble. "'Your late unfortunate husband should have taught it to you, and then perhaps he might have been alive now.' I wish he was, poor man." Mrs. Bumble, seeing at a glance that the decisive moment had now arrived, and that a blow struck for the mastership on one side or other, must necessarily be final and conclusive, no sooner heard this allusion to the dead and gone, than she dropped into a chair, and with a loud scream that Mr. Bumble was a hard-hearted brute, fell into a paroxysm of tears. But tears were not the things to find their way to Mr. Bumble's soul. His heart was waterproof. Like washable beaver hats, that improve with rain, 
his nerves were rendered stouter and more vigorous by showers of tears, which, being tokens of weakness, and so far tacit admissions of his own power, pleased and exalted him. He eyed his good lady with looks of great satisfaction, and begged, in an encouraging manner, that she should cry her hardest, the exercise being looked upon by the faculty as strongly conducive to health. "'It opens the lungs, washes the countenance, exercises the eyes, and softens down the temper,' said Mr. Bumble. "'So, cry away.' As he discharged himself of this pleasantry, Mr. Bumble took his hat from a peg, and putting it on, rather rakishly, on one side, as a man might, who felt he had asserted his superiority in a becoming manner, thrust his hands into his pockets, and sauntered towards the door, with much ease and waggishness depicted in his whole appearance. Now, Mrs. Corney that was, had tried the tears, because they were less troublesome than a manual assault, but she was quite prepared to make trial of the latter mode of proceeding, as Mr. Bumble was not long in discovering. The first proof he experienced of the fact was conveyed in a hollow sound, immediately succeeded by the sudden flying off of his hat to the opposite end of the room. This preliminary proceeding, laying bare his head, the expert lady, clasping him tightly round the throat with one hand, inflicted a shower of blows, dealt with singular vigour and dexterity, upon it with the other. This done, she created a little variety by scratching his face, and tearing his hair and, having by this time inflicted as much punishment as she deemed necessary for the offence, she pushed him over a chair, which was luckily well situated for the purpose, and defied him to talk about his prerogative again, if he dared. "'Get up,' said Mrs. Bumble, in a voice of command, "'and take yourself away from here, unless you want me to do something desperate.' Mr. Bumble rose with a very rueful countenance, wondering much what something desperate might be. Picking up his hat, he looked towards the door. "'Are you going?' demanded Mrs. Bumble. "'Certainly, uh, my dear, certainly,' rejoined Mr. Bumble, making a quicker motion towards the door. "'I didn't intend to—I am going, my dear. You are so very violent that really I—' At this instant Mrs. Bumble stepped hastily forward to replace the carpet which had been kicked up in the scuffle. Mr. Bumble immediately darted out of the room, without bestowing another thought on his unfinished sentence, leaving the late Mrs. Corney in full possession of the field. Mr. Bumble was fairly taken by surprise, and fairly beaten. He had a decided propensity for bullying, derived no inconsiderable pleasure from the exercise of petty cruelty, and consequently was, it is needless to say, a coward. This is by no means a disparagement to his character, for many official personages, who are held in high respect and admiration, are the victims of similar infirmities. The remark is made, indeed, rather in his favour than otherwise, and with a view of impressing the reader with a just sense of his qualifications for office. But the measure of his degradation was not yet full. After making a tour of the house, and thinking for the first time that the poor laws really were too hard on people, and that men who ran away from their wives, leaving them chargeable to the parish, ought, in justice, to be visited with no punishment at all, but rather rewarded as meritorious individuals who had suffered much. Mr. Mumble came to a room where some of the female paupers were usually employed in washing the parish linen, when the sound of voices in conversation now proceeded. <clears throat> <clears throat> said Mr. Bumble summoning up all his native dignity. "'These women, at least, shall continue to respect the prerogative. Hello? Hello there? What do you mean by this noise, you hussies?' With these words, Mr. Bumble opened the door, and walked in with a very fierce and angry manner, which was at once exchanged for a most humiliated and cowering air, as his eyes unexpectedly rested on the form of his lady wife. "'My dear!' said Mr. Bumble. I didn't know you were here. Didn't know I was here? repeated Mrs. Bumble. What do you do here? I thought they were talking rather too much to be doing their work properly, my dear, replied Mr. Bumble, glancing distractedly at a couple of old women at the wash-tub, who were comparing notes of admiration at the workhouse master's humility. You thought they were talking too much? 
said Mrs. Bumble. "'What business is it of yours?' "'Why, uh, my dear,' urged Mr. Bumble submissively, "'what business is it of yours?' demanded Mrs. Bumble again. "'It's very true, your matron here, my dear,' submitted Mr. Bumble, "'but I thought you mightn't be in the way just then.' "'I'll tell you what, Mr. Bumble,' returned his lady, "'we don't want any of your interference. You're a great deal too fond of poking your nose into things that don't concern you, making everybody in the house laugh the moment your back is turned, and making yourself look like a fool every hour in the day. Be off. Come." Mr. Bumble, seeing with excruciating feelings the delight of the two old paupers, who were tittering together most rapturously, hesitated for an instant. Mrs. Bumble, whose patience brooked no delay, caught up a bowl of soap-suds and motioning him towards the door, ordered him instantly to depart, on pain of receiving the contents upon his portly person. What could Mr. Bumble do? He looked dejectedly round, and slunk away, and, as he reached the door, the titterings of the paupers broke into a shrill chuckle of irrepressible delight. It wanted but this. He was degraded in their eyes. He had lost caste and station before the very paupers. He had fallen from all the height and pomp of beadleship to the lowest depth of the most snubbed hen-peckery. "'All in two months,' said Mr. Bumble, filled with dismal thoughts. Two months! No more than two months ago I was not only my own master, but everybody else's, so far as the parochial workhouse was concerned. And now—' It was too much. Mr. Bumble boxed the ears of the boy who opened the gate for him, for he had reached the portal in his reverie, and walked distractedly into the street. He walked up one street, and down another, until exercise had abated the first passion of his grief, and then the revulsion of feeling made him thirsty. He passed a great many public-houses, but at length paused before one in a byway, whose parlour, as he gathered from a hasty peep over the blinds, was deserted save by one solitary customer. It began to rain heavily at the moment. This determined him. Mr. Bumble stepped in, and ordering something to drink, as he passed the bar, entered the apartment into which he had looked from the street. The man who was seated there was tall and dark, and wore a large cloak. He had the air of a stranger, and seemed, by a certain haggardness in his look, as well as by the dusty soils on his dress, to have travelled some distance. He eyed Bumble askance, as he entered, but scarcely deigned to nod his head in acknowledgment of his salutation. Mr. Bumble had quite dignity enough for two, supposing even that the stranger had been more familiar. So he drank his gin and water, in silence, and read the paper with great show of pomp and circumstance. It so happened, however, as it will happen very often, when men fall into company under such circumstances, that Mr. Bumble felt every now and then, a powerful inducement, which he could not resist, to steal a look at the stranger, and that whenever he did so, he withdrew his eyes, in some confusion, to find that the stranger was at that moment stealing a look at him. Mr. Bumble's awkwardness was enhanced by the very remarkable expression of the stranger's eye, which was keen and bright, but shadowed by a scowl of distrust and suspicion, unlike anything he had ever observed before, and repulsive to behold. When they had encountered each other's glance several times in this way, the stranger, in a harsh, deep voice, broke silence. "'Were you looking for me?' he said, when you peered in at the window. "'Not that I am aware of, unless your uh, Mr.—' Here Mr. Bumble stopped short, for he was curious to know the stranger's name, and thought in his impatience he might supply the blank. "'I see you are not—' said the stranger, an expression of quiet sarcasm playing about his mouth, or you have known my name. You don't know it. I would recommend you not to ask for it." "'I meant no harm, young man,' observed Mr. Bumble majestically. "'And have done none,' said the stranger. Another silence succeeded this short dialogue, which was again broken by the stranger. "'I have seen you before, I think said he. You were differently dressed at that time, and I only passed you in the street, but I should know you again. 
You were a beadle here once, were you not? I was, said Mr. Bumble in some surprise, parochial beadle. Just so, rejoined the other, nodding his head. It was in that character I saw you. What are you now? Master of the workhouse, rejoined Mr. Bumble slowly and impressively, to check any undue familiarity the stranger might otherwise assume. "'Master of the workhouse, young man.' "'You have the same eye to your own interest that you have always had, I doubt not,' resumed the stranger, looking keenly into Mr. Bumble's eyes as he raised them in astonishment at the question. "'Don't scruple to answer freely, man. I know you pretty well, you see.' "'I suppose a married man,' replied Mr. Bumble, shading his eyes with his hand, and surveying the stranger from head to foot in evident perplexity, "'is not more averse to turning a honest penny, when he can, than a single one. Parochial officers are not so well paid that they can afford to refuse any little extra fee when it comes to them in a civil and proper manner.' The stranger smiled, and nodded his head again as much to say he had not mistaken his man, then rang the bell. "'Fill this glass again,' he said, handing Mr. Bumble's empty tumbler to the landlord. "'Let it be strong and hot. You like it so, I suppose?' Uh, "'Not too strong,' replied Mr. Bumble, with a delicate cough. "'You understand what that means, landlord?' said the stranger dryly. The host smiled, disappeared, and shortly afterwards returned with a steaming jorum, of which the first gulp brought the water into Mr. Bumble's eyes. "'Now listen to me,' said the stranger, after closing the door and window. "'I came down to this place to-day, to find you out. And, by one of those chances which the devil throws in the way of his friends, sometimes, you walked into the very room I was sitting in, while you were uppermost in my mind.' I want some information from you. I don't ask you to give it for nothing, slight as it is. Put up that, to begin with." As he spoke, he pushed a couple of sovereigns across the table to his companion, carefully, as though unwilling that the chinking of money should be heard without. When Mr. Bumble had scrupulously examined the coins, to see that they were genuine, and had put them up with much satisfaction in his waistcoat pocket, he went on. "'Carry your memory back. Let me see. Twelve years last winter.' "'It's a long time,' said Mr. Bumble. "'Very good. I've done it. The scene. The workhouse. Good. And the time. Night. Yes. And the place. The crazy hole, wherever it was in which miserable drabs brought forth the life and health so often denied to themselves, gave birth to puling children for the parish to rear, and hid their shame, rot them in the grave. "'The lying-in room, I suppose,' said Mr. Bumble, not quite following the stranger's excited description. "'Yes,' said the stranger. "'A boy was born there.' "'A many boys,' observed Mr. Bumble, shaking his head despondingly. "'A murrain on the young devils!' cried the stranger. "'I speak of one, a meek-looking, pale-faced boy, who was apprenticed down here to a coffin-maker. I wish he had made his coffin and screwed his body in it, and afterwards ran away to London, as it was supposed.' "'Why, you mean Oliver, young Twist,' said Mr. Bumble. "'I remember him, of course. There wasn't an obstinater young rascal.' "'It's not of him I want to hear. I've heard enough of him,' said the stranger, stopping Mr. Bumble in the outset of a tirade on the subject of poor Oliver's vices. "'It's of a woman, the hag that nursed his mother. Where is she?' "'Where is she?' said Mr. Bumble, whom the gin and water had rendered facetious. "'It would be hard to tell. There's no midwifery there. Whichever place she's gone to, so I suppose she's out of employment anyway." "'What do you mean?' demanded the stranger sternly. "'That she died last winter,' rejoined Mr. Bumble. The man looked fixedly at him when he had given this information, and although he did not withdraw his eyes for some time afterwards, his gaze gradually became vacant and abstracted, 
and he seemed lost in thought. For some time he appeared doubtful whether he ought to be relieved or disappointed by the intelligence, but at length he breathed more freely, and withdrawing his eyes, observed that it was no great matter. With that he rose, as if to depart. But Mr. Bumble was cunning enough, and he at once saw that an opportunity was opened for the lucrative disposal of some secret in the possession of his better half. He well remembered the night of old Sally's death, which the occurrences of that day had given him good reason to recollect, as the occasion on which he had proposed to Mrs. Corney. And although that lady had never confided to him the disclosure of which she had been the solitary witness, he had heard enough to know that it related to something that had occurred in the old woman's attendance, as workhouse nurse, upon the young mother of Oliver Twist. Hastily calling this circumstance to mind, he informed the stranger, with an air of mystery, that one woman had been closeted with the old Harridan shortly before she died, and that she could, as he had reason to believe, throw some light on the subject of his inquiry. "'How can I find her?' said the stranger, thrown off his guard, and plainly showing that all his fears, whatever they were, were aroused afresh by the intelligence. "'Only through me,' rejoined Mr. Bumble. "'When?' cried the stranger hastily. "'Tomorrow,' rejoined Bumble. "'At nine in the evening,' said the stranger, producing a scrap of paper, and writing down upon it an obscure address by the waterside, in characters that betrayed his agitation. "'At nine in the evening. Bring her to me there. I needn't tell you to be secret. It's your interest.' With these words he led the way to the door, after stopping to pay for the liquor that had been drunk. Shortly remarking that their roads were different, he departed, without more ceremony than an emphatic repetition of the hour of appointment for the following night. On glancing at the address, the parochial functionary observed that it contained no name. The stranger had not gone far, so he made after him to ask it. "'What do you want?' cried the man, turning quickly round, as Bumble touched him on the arm. "'Following me?' "'Only to ask a question.' said the other, pointing to the scrap of paper. "'What name am I to ask for?' "'Monks,' rejoined the man, and strode hastily away. End of chapter 37「Chapter 38 of Oliver Twist – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Thirty Eight, containing an account of what passed between Mr. and Mrs. Bumble and Mr. Monks at their nocturnal interview. It was a dull, close, overcast summer evening. The clouds, which had been threatening all day, spread out in a dense and sluggish mass of vapour, already yielded large drops of rain, and seemed to presage a violent thunderstorm when Mr. and Mrs. Bumble, turning out of the main street of the town, directed their course towards a scattered little colony of ruinous houses, distant from it some mile and a half, or thereabouts, and erected on a low, unwholesome swamp, bordering upon the river. They were both wrapped in old and shabby outer garments, which might, perhaps, serve the double purpose of protecting their persons from the rain, and sheltering them from observation. The husband carried a lantern, from which, however, no light yet shone, and trudged on a few paces in front, as though, the way being dirty, to give his wife the benefit of treading in his heavy footprints. They went on, in profound silence. Every now and then Mr. Bumble relaxed his pace, and turned his head, as if to make sure that his helpmate was following. Then, discovering that she was close at his heels, he mended his rate of walking, and proceeded, at a considerable increase of speed, towards their place of destination. This was far from being a place of doubtful character, for it had long been known as the residence of none but low ruffians, who, under various pretences of living by their labour, subsisted chiefly on plunder and crime. It was a collection of mere hovels, some hastily built with loose bricks, others of old worm-eaten ship-timber, jumbled together without any attempted order or arrangement and planted, for the most part, within a few feet of the river's bank. A few leaky boats, 
drawn up on the mud, and made fast to the dwarf wall which skirted it, and here and there an oar or coil of rope, appeared at first to indicate that the inhabitants of these miserable cottages pursued some avocation on the river. But a glance at the shattered and useless condition of the articles thus displayed would have led a passer-by, without much difficulty, to the conjecture that they were disposed there, rather for the preservation of appearances than with any view to their being actually employed. In the heart of this cluster of huts, and skirting the river, which its upper stories overhung, stood a large building, formerly used as a manufactory of some kind. It had, in its day, probably furnished employment to the inhabitants of the surrounding tenements, but it had long since gone to ruin. The rat, the worm, and the action of the damp had weakened and rotted the piles on which it stood, and a considerable portion of the building had already sunk down into the water while the remainder, tottering and bending over the dark stream, seemed to wait a favourable opportunity of following its old companion, and involving itself in the same fate. It was before this ruinous building that the worthy couple paused, as the first peal of distant thunder reverberated in the air, and the rain commenced pouring violently down. "'The place should be somewhere here,' said Bumble, consulting a scrap of paper he held in his hand. "'Hello there!' cried a voice from above. Following the sound, Mr. Bumble raised his head, and descried a man looking out of a door, breast-high, on the second story. "'Stand still a minute!' cried the voice. "'I'll be with you directly!' With which the head disappeared, and the door closed. "'Is that the man?' asked Mr. Bumble's good lady. Mr. Bumble nodded in the affirmative. "'Then mind what I told you,' said the matron, "'and be careful to say as little as you can, or you'll betray us at once.' Mr. Bumble, who had eyed the building with very rueful looks, was apparently about to express some doubts relative to the advisability of proceeding any further with the enterprise just then, when he was prevented by the appearance of monks, who opened a small door near which they stood, and beckoned them inwards. "'Come in,' he cried impatiently, stamping his foot upon the ground. "'Don't keep me here!' The woman, who had hesitated at first, walked boldly in, without any other invitation. Mr. Bumble, who was ashamed or afraid to lag behind, followed, obviously very ill at ease, and with scarcely any of that remarkable dignity which was usually his chief characteristic. "'What the devil made you stand lingering there in the wet?' said Monks, turning round and addressing Bumble, after he had bolted the door behind them. "'We, uh, we were only cooling ourselves,' stammered Bumble, looking apprehensively about him. "'Cooling yourselves,' retorted Monks. "'Not all the rain that ever fell or ever will fall will put as much of hell's fire out as a man can carry about with him. You won't cool yourself so easily, don't think it.' With this agreeable speech, Monks turned short upon the matron, and bent his gaze upon her till even she, who was not easily cowed, was fain to withdraw her eyes, and turn them towards the ground. "'This is the woman, is it?' demanded Monks. Um, that is the woman,' replied Mr. Bumble, mindful of his wife's caution. "'You think women never can keep secrets, I suppose?' said the matron, interposing, and returning, as she spoke, the searching look of Monks. "'I know they will always keep one till it's found out,' said Monks. "'And what may that be?' asked the matron. "'The loss of their own good name,' replied Monks. "'So, by the same rule, if a woman's a party to a secret that might hang or transport her, I'm not afraid of her telling it to anybody, not I. Do you understand, mistress?' "'No,' rejoined the matron, slightly colouring as she spoke. "'Of course you don't,' said Monks. "'How should you?' Bestowing something halfway between a smile and a frown upon his two companions, and again beckoning them to follow him, the man hastened across the apartment, which was of considerable extent, but low in the roof. He was preparing to ascend a steep staircase, or rather ladder, leading to another floor of warehouses above, when a bright flash of lightning streamed down the aperture, and a peal of thunder followed, which shook the crazy building to its centre. "'Hear it!' 
he cried, shrinking back. "'Hear it! Rolling and crashing on as if it echoed through a thousand caverns where the devils were hiding from it. I hate the sound!' He remained silent for a few moments, and then, removing his hands suddenly from his face, showed, to the unspeakable discomposure of Mr. Bumble, that it was much distorted and discoloured. "'These fits come over me now and then,' said Monks, observing his alarm, "'and thunder sometimes brings them on. Don't mind me now. It's all over for this once.' Thus speaking, he led the way up the ladder, and hastily closing the window-shutter of the room into which it led, lowered a lantern which hung at the end of a rope and pulley, passed through one of the heavy beams in the ceiling, and which cast a dim light upon an old table and three chairs that were placed beneath it. "'Now,' said Monks, when they had all three seated themselves, "'the sooner we come to our business, the better for all. The woman knows what it is, does she?' The question was addressed to Bumble but his wife anticipated the reply by intimating that she was perfectly acquainted with it. "'He is right in saying that you were with this hag the night she died, and that she told you something?' "'About the mother of the boy you named?' replied the matron, interrupting him. "'Yes.' "'The first question is, of what nature was her communication?' said Monks. "'That's the second, observed the woman, with much deliberation. The first is, what may the communication be worth? Who oh, the devil can tell that without knowing of what kind it is? asked Monks. Nobody better than you, I am persuaded, answered Mrs. Bumble, who did not want for spirit, as her yoke fellow could abundantly testify. Huh, <laughs> said Monks, significantly, and with a look of eager inquiry. There may be money's worth to get, eh? "'Perhaps there may,' was the composed reply. "'Something that was taken from her,' said Monks. "'Something that she wore. "'Something that—' "'You had better bid,' interrupted Mrs. Bumble. "'I've heard enough, already, to assure me that you are the man I ought to talk to.' Mr. Bumble, who had not yet been admitted by his better half into any greater share of the secret than he had originally possessed, listened to this dialogue with outstretched neck and distended eyes, which he directed towards his wife and monks, by turns, in undisguised astonishment, increased, if possible, when the latter sternly demanded what sum was required for the disclosure. "'What's it worth to you?' asked the woman, as collectedly as before. "'It may be nothing. It may be twenty pounds,' replied monks. "'Speak out, and let me know which.' "'Add five pounds to the sum you've named. "'Give me five and twenty pounds in gold,' said the woman, "'and I'll tell you all I know. Not before.' Five and twenty pounds!' exclaimed Monks, drawing back. "'I spoke as plainly as I could,' replied Mrs. Bumble. "'It's not a large sum, either.' "'Not a large sum for a paltry secret. "'That may be nothing when it's told.' cried Monks impatiently, and which has been lying dead for twelve years past or more. "'Such matters keep well, and, like good wine, often double their value in course of time,' answered the matron, still preserving the resolute indifference she had assumed. "'As to lying dead, there are those who will lie dead for twelve thousand years to come, or twelve million, for anything you or I know, who will tell strange tales at last.' "'What if I pay it for nothing?' asked Monks, hesitating. "'You can easily take it away again,' replied the matron. "'I am but a woman, alone here, and unprotected.' <clears throat> "'Not alone, my dear, nor unprotected neither,' submitted Mr. Bumble, in a voice tremulous with fear. "'I am here, my dear, and uh, besides,' said Mr. Bumble, his teeth chattering as he spoke. "'Mr. Monks is too much of a gentleman to attempt any violence on parochial persons. Mr. Monks is aware that I am not a young man, my dear, and also that I am a little run to seed, as I may say. But he has heard—I say I have no doubt Mr. Monks has heard, my dear, that I am a very determined officer, with very uncommon strength, if I'm once roused.' I only want a little rousing, that's all." 
as Mr. Bumble spoke, he made a melancholy feint of grasping his lantern with fierce determination, and plainly showed, by the alarmed expression of every feature, that he did want a little rousing, and not a little, prior to making any very warlike demonstration, unless, indeed, against paupers, or other personal persons trained down for the purpose. "'You are a fool,' said Mrs. Bumble in reply, "'and had better hold your tongue.' "'He had better have it cut out before he came, if he can't speak in a lower tone,' said Monks grimly. "'So, he's your husband, eh?' "'He? My husband?' tittered the matron, parrying the question. "'I thought as much when you came in,' rejoined Monks, marking the angry glance which the lady darted at her spouse as she spoke. "'So much the better.' I have less hesitation in dealing with two people, when I find that there's only one will between them. I'm in earnest. See here." He thrust his hand into a side-pocket, and producing a canvas bag, told out twenty-five sovereigns on the table, and pushed them over to the woman. "'Now,' he said, "'gather them up, and when this cursed peal of thunder, which I feel is coming up to break over the house-top, is gone, let's hear your story. The thunder, which seemed in fact much nearer, and to shiver and break almost over their heads, having subsided, Monks, raising his face from the table, bent forward to listen to what the woman should say. The faces of the three nearly touched, as the two men leant over the small table in their eagerness to hear, and the woman also leant forward to render her whisper audible. The sickly rays of the suspended lantern falling directly upon them, aggravated the paleness and anxiety of their countenances, which, encircled by the deepest gloom and darkness, looked ghastly in the extreme. "'When this woman that we called old Sally died,' the matron began, "'she and I were alone.' "'Was there no one by?' asked Monks in the same hollow whisper. "'No sick wretch or idiot in some other bed? No one who could hear and might, by possibility, understand. "'Not a soul,' replied the woman. "'We were alone. I stood alone beside the body when death came over it.' "'Good,' said Monks, regarding her attentively. "'Go on.' "'She spoke of a young creature,' resumed the matron, "'who had brought a child into the world some years before, not merely in the same room, but in the same bed, in which she then lay dying. Ay, said Monks, with quivering lip, and glancing over his shoulder. Blood! How things come about! The child was the one you named to him last night, said the matron, nodding carelessly towards her husband. The mother, this nurse, had robbed. In life? asked Monks. In death, replied the woman with something like a shudder. She stole from the corpse, when it had hardly turned no one, that which the dead mother had prayed her, with her last breath, to keep for the infant's sake. "'She sold it?' cried Monks, with desperate eagerness. "'Did she sell it? Where? When? To whom? How long before?' "'As she told me, with great difficulty, that she had done this,' said the matron, she fell back and died. "'Without saying more?' cried Monks, in a voice which, from its very suppression, seemed only the more furious. "'It's a lie. I'll not be played with. She said more. I'll tear the life out of you both, but I'll know what it is.' "'She didn't utter another word,' said the woman, to all appearance unmoved, as Mr. Bumble was very far from being, by the strange man's violence. But she clutched my gown, violently, with one hand, which was partly closed, and when I saw that she was dead, and so removed the hand by force, I found it clasped a scrap of dirty paper. "'Which contained?' interposed Monks, stretching forward. "'Nothing,' replied the woman. "'It was a pawnbroker's duplicate.' "'For what?' demanded Monks. "'In good time, I'll tell you,' said the woman. "'I judge that she had kept the trinket for some time, in the hope of turning it to better account, 
and then had pawned it, and had saved or scraped together money to pay the pawnbroker's interest year by year, and prevent its running out, so that if anything came of it, it could still be redeemed. Nothing had come of it, and, as I tell you, she died with a scrap of paper, all worn and tattered, in her hand. The time was out in two days. I thought something might one day come of it, too, and so redeemed the pledge. "'Where is it now?' asked Monks quickly. "'There,' replied the woman, and, as if glad to be relieved of it, she hastily threw upon the table a small kid-bag, scarcely large enough for a French watch, which Monks, pouncing upon, tore open with trembling hands. It contained a little gold locket, in which were two locks of hair, and a plain gold wedding ring. "'It has the word Agnes engraved on the inside,' said the woman. "'There is a blank left for the surname, and then follows the date which is within a year before the child was born. I found out that.' "'And this is all?' said Monks, after a close and eager scrutiny of the contents of the little packet. "'All,' replied the woman. Mr. Bumble drew a long breath, as if he were glad to find that the story was over, and no mention made of taking the five-and-twenty pounds back again, and now he took courage to wipe the perspiration which had been trickling over his nose unchecked during the whole of the previous dialogue. "'I know nothing of the story beyond what I can guess at,' said his wife addressing Monks, after a short silence, and I want to know nothing, for it's safer not. But I may ask you two questions, may I?" "'You may ask,' said Monks, with some show of surprise, but whether I answer or not is another question." "'Which makes three, observed Mr. Bumble, essaying a stroke of facetiousness. "'Is that what you expected to get from me?' demanded the matron. "'It is replied Monks. The other question. What do you propose to do with it? Can it be used against me? Never, rejoined Monks, nor against me either. See here, but don't move a step forward, or your life is not worth a bulrush. With these words, he suddenly wheeled the table aside, and pulling an iron ring in the boarding, threw back a large trap-door, which opened close at Mr. Bumble's feet and caused that gentleman to retire several paces backward with great precipitation. "'Look down,' said Monks, lowering the lantern into the gulf. "'Don't fear me. I could have let you down quietly enough, when you were seated over it, if that had been my game.' Thus encouraged, the matron drew near to the brink, and even Mr. Bumble himself, impelled by curiosity, ventured to do the same. The turbid water swollen by the heavy rain, was rushing rapidly on below, and all other sounds were lost in the noise of its plashing and eddying against the green and slimy piles. There had once been a water-mill beneath, the tide foaming and chafing round the few rotten stakes and fragments of machinery that yet remained, seemed to dart onward with a new impulse, when freed from the obstacles which had unavailingly attempted to stem its headlong course. If you flung a man's body down there, where would it be to-morrow morning?" said Monks, swinging the lantern to and fro in the dark well. Twelve miles down the river, and cut the pieces besides,' replied Bumble, recoiling at the thought. Monks drew the little packet from his breast, where he had hurriedly thrust it, and, tying it to a leaden weight, which had formed a part of some pulley, and was lying on the floor, dropped it into the stream. It fell straight and true as a die, clove the water with a scarcely audible splash, and was gone. The three, looking into each other's faces, seemed to breathe more freely. "'There,' said Monks, closing the trap-door, which fell heavily back into its former position, "'if the sea ever gives up its dead, as books say it will, it will keep its gold and silver to itself, and that trash among it.' We have nothing more to say, and may break up our pleasant party." "'By all means,' observed Mr. Bumble, with great alacrity. "'You'll keep a quiet tongue in your head, will you?' said Monks, with a threatening look. "'I am not afraid of your wife.' 
"'You may depend upon me, young man,' answered Mr. Bumble, bowing himself gradually towards the ladder, with excessive politeness, "'on everybody's account, uh, young man, on my own, you know, uh, Mr. Monks.' "'I'm glad for your sake to hear it,' remarked Monks. "'Light your lantern, and get away from here as fast as you can.' It was fortunate that the conversation terminated at this point, or Mr. Bumble, who had bowed himself to within six inches of the ladder, would infallibly have pitched headlong into the room below. He lighted his lantern, from that which Monks had detached from the rope, and now carried in his hand, and making no effort to prolong the discourse, descended in silence, followed by his wife. Monks brought up the rear, after pausing on the steps to satisfy himself that there were no other sounds to be heard than the beating of the rain without, and the rushing of the water. They traversed the lower room, slowly and with caution, for Monks started at every shadow, and Mr. Bumble, holding his lantern a foot above the ground, walked not only with remarkable care, but with a marvellously light step for a gentleman of his figure looking nervously about him for hidden trap-doors. The gate at which they had entered was softly unfastened and opened by monks, merely exchanging a nod with their mysterious acquaintance, the married couple emerged into the wet and darkness outside. They were no sooner gone than monks, who appeared to entertain an invincible repugnance to being left alone, called to a boy who had been hidden somewhere below, bidding him go first and bear the light, he returned to the chamber he had just quitted. End of chapter 38「Chapter 39 of Oliver Twist – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens – Chapter 39 – Introduces some respectable characters with whom the reader is already acquainted, and shows how Monks and the Jew laid their worthy heads together. On the evening following that upon which the three worthies mentioned in the last chapter disposed of their little matter of business as therein narrated, Mr. William Sykes, awakening from a nap, drowsily growled forth an inquiry what time of night it was. The room in which Mr. Sykes propounded this question was not one of those he had tenanted, previous to the Chertsey expedition, although it was in the same quarter of the town, and was situated at no great distance from his former lodgings. It was not, in appearance, so desirable a habitation as his old quarters, being a mean and badly furnished apartment of very limited size, lighted only by one small window in the shelving roof, and abutting on a close and dirty lane. Nor were there wanting other indications of the good gentleman's having gone down in the world of late, for a great scarcity of furniture, and total absence of comfort, together with the disappearance of all such small movables as spare clothes and linen, bespoke a state of extreme poverty, while the meagre and attenuated condition of Mr. Sykes himself would have fully confirmed these symptoms if they had stood in any need of corroboration. The housebreaker was lying on the bed, wrapped in his white greatcoat, by way of dressing-gown and displaying a set of features in no degree improved by the cadaverous hue of illness, and the addition of a soiled nightcap, and a stiff black beard of a week's growth. The dog sat at the bedside, now eyeing his master with a wistful look, and now pricking his ears, and uttering a low growl, as some noise in the street, or in the lower part of the house, attracted his attention. Seated by the window, busily engaged in patching an old waistcoat, which formed a portion of the robber's ordinary dress, was a female, so pale and reduced, with watching and privation, that there would have been considerable difficulty in recognising her as the same Nancy who has already figured in this tale, but for the voice in which she replied to Mr. Sykes's question. "'Not long gone seven, said the girl. "'How do you feel to-night, Bill?' "'As weak as water,' replied Mr. Sykes, with an imprecation on his eyes and limbs. "'Here, lend us a hand.' and let me get off this thundering bed anyhow." Illness had not improved Mr. Sykes's temper, for, as the girl raised him up, and led him to a chair, he muttered various curses on her awkwardness, and struck her. "'Whining, are you?' said Sykes. "'Come, don't stand slivelling there. If you can't do anything better than that, cut off altogether. Do you hear me?' "'I hear you,' 
returned the girl, turning her face aside and forcing a laugh. <laughs> what a fancy have you got in your head now? Oh, you've thought better of it, have you? growled Sykes, marking the tear which trembled in her eye. All the better for you, you have. Why, you don't mean to say you'd be hard upon me to-night, Bill? said the girl, laying her hand upon his shoulder. No, cried Mr. Sykes. Why not? Such a number of nights, said the girl, with the touch of woman's tenderness, which communicated something like sweetness of tone, even to her voice. Such a number of nights as I've been patient with you, nursing and caring for you, as if you'd been a child, and this the first that I've seen you like yourself. You wouldn't have served me as you did just now, if you'd thought of that, would you? Come, come, say you wouldn't. Well, then, rejoined Mr. Sykes, I wouldn't. Why, damn, now the girl's whining again. It's nothing, said the girl, throwing herself into a chair. Don't you seem to mind me? It'll soon be over. What'll be over? demanded Mr. Sykes in a savage voice. What foolery are you up to now again? Get up and bustle about, and don't come over me with your woman's nonsense. At any other time, this remonstrance and the tone in which it was delivered would have had the desired effect. But the girl, being really weak and exhausted, dropped her head over the back of the chair, and fainted, before Mr. Sykes could get out a few of the appropriate oaths with which, on similar occasions, he was accustomed to garnish his threats. Not knowing very well what to do, in this uncommon emergency, for Miss Nancy's hysterics were usually of that violent kind which the patient fights and struggles out of, without much assistance, Mr. Sykes tried a little blasphemy and finding that mode of treatment wholly ineffectual, called for assistance. "'What's the matter here, my dear?' said Fagin, looking in. "'Lend a hand to the girl, can't you?' replied Sykes impatiently. "'Don't stand chattering and grinning at me!' With an exclamation of surprise, Fagin hastened to the girl's assistance, while Mr. John Dawkins, otherwise the artful dodger, who had followed his venerable friend into the room, hastily deposited on the floor a bundle with which he was laden, and snatching a bottle from the grasp of Master Charles Bates, who came close at his heels, uncorked it in a twinkling with his teeth, and poured a portion of its contents down the patient's throat, previously taking a taste himself to prevent mistakes. "'Give her a whiff of fresh air with the bellows, Charlie,' said Mr. Dawkins, "'and you, slap her hands, Fagin, while Bill undoes the petticoats.' These united restoratives, administered with great energy, especially that department consigned to Master Bates, who appeared to consider his share in the proceedings a piece of unexampled pleasantry, were not long in producing the desired effect. The girl gradually recovered her senses, and, staggering to a chair by the bedside, hid her face upon the pillow, leaving Mr. Sykes to confront the newcomers in some astonishment at their unlooked-for appearance. "'Why, what evil wind has blowed you here?' he asked Fagin. "'No evil wind at all, my dear, for evil winds blow nobody any good, and I brought something good with me that you'll be glad to see. Dodger, my dear, open the bundle, and give Bill the little trifles that we spent all our money on this morning.' In compliance with Mr. Fagin's request, the artful untied this bundle, which was of large size, and formed of an old tablecloth, and handed the articles it contained, one by one, to Charlie Bates, who placed them on the table with various encomiums on their rarity and excellence. "'Sit your rabbit pie, Bill!' exclaimed that young gentleman, disclosing to view a huge pasty. "'Sit delicate creatures with sit tender limbs, Bill, out of weary bones melt in your mouth, and there's no occasion to pick em. Half a pound of seven and sixpenny green!' so precious strong that if you mix it with bile and water, it'll go night to blow the lid off the teapot. Off! A pound and a half of moist sugar that the niggers didn't work at at all, afore they got it up to sich a pitch of goodness. Oh, no! Two half quartern brands, pound of best fresh, piece of double Gloucester, and, to wind up, all, some of the richest sort you ever blushed." Uttering this last panegyric, Master Bates produced, from one of his extensive pockets, a full-sized wine-bottle, carefully corked, 
while Mr. Dawkins, at the same instant, poured out a wine-glassful of raw spirits from the bottle he carried, which the invalid tossed down his throat without a moment's hesitation. "'Ah!' said Fagin, rubbing his hands with great satisfaction. "'You'll do, Bill. You'll do now.' "'Do!' exclaimed Mr. Sykes. "'I might have been done for, twenty times over, afore you'd have done anything to help me. What do you mean by leaving a man in this state? Three weeks and more, you false-hearted wagabond. "'Only hear him, boys,' said Fagin, shrugging his shoulders, "'and us come to bring him all these beautiful things. "'The things is well enough in their way,' observed Mr. Sykes, a little soothed, as he glanced over the table. "'But what have you got to say for yourself? "'Why, you should leave me here, down in the mouth, health, blunt, and everything else, "'and take no more notice of me, all this mortal time, than if I was that here dog. "'Drive him down, Charlie.' "'I never see such a jolly dog as that,' cried Master Bates, doing as he was desired. "'Smelling the grub, like an old lady a going to market. "'He'd make his fortune on the stage, that dog would, and revive the draymar besides.' "'Hold your din,' cried Sykes, as the dog retreated under the bed, still growling angrily. "'What have you got to say for yourself, you withered old fence, eh?' "'I was away from London a week or more, my dear, on a plant,' replied the Jew. "'And what about the other fortnight?' demanded Sykes. "'What about the other fortnight, that you've left me lying here like a sick rat in his hole?' "'I couldn't help it, Bill. I can't go into a long explanation before the company, but I couldn't help it, upon my honour. "'Upon your what?' growled Sykes with excessive disgust. "'Here, cut me off a piece of that pie, one of you boys, to take the taste of that out of my mouth, or it'll choke me dead.' "'Don't be out of temper, my dear.' urged Fagin submissively. "'I've never forgot you, Bill. Never once. No, I'll pound it that you ain't," replied Sykes with a bitter grin. "'You've been scheming and plotting away every hour that I have laid shivering and burning here. And Bill was to do this, and Bill was to do that, and Bill was to do it all dirt cheap as soon as he got well and was quite poor enough for your work. If it hadn't been for the girl, I might have died." "'Then now, Bill,' remonstrated Fagin, eagerly catching at the word, "'if it hadn't been for the girl. Who but poor old Fagin was the means of your having such a handy girl about you?' "'He says true enough there,' said Nancy, coming hastily forward. "'Let him be! Let him be!' Nancy's appearance gave a new turn to the conversation, for the boys, receiving a sly wink from the wary old Jew, began to ply her with liquor, of which, however, she took very sparingly, while Fagin, assuming an unusual flow of spirits, gradually brought Mr. Sykes into a better temper, by affecting to regard his threats as a little pleasant banter, and, moreover, by laughing very heartily at one or two rough chokes, which, after repeated applications to the spirit-bottle, he condescended to make. "'It's all very well,' said Mr. Sykes, "'but I must have some blunt from you to-night.' "'I haven't a piece of coin about me,' replied the Jew. "'Then you've got lots at home,' retorted Sykes, "'and I must have some from there.' "'Lots!' cried Fagin, holding up his hands. "'I haven't so much as would—I don't know how much you've got, and I dare say you hardly know yourself, as it would take a pretty long time to count it,' said Sykes. "'But I must have some. Tonight. And that's flat.' "'Well, well,' said Fagin, with a sigh, "'I'll send Artful round presently. You won't do nothing of the kind,' rejoined Mr. Sykes. "'The Artful's a deal too Artful.' and will forget to come, or lose his way, or get dodged by traps, and so be perwented, or anything for an excuse if you put him up to it. Nancy shall go to the ken and fetch it, 
to make all sure, and I'll lie down and have a snooze while she's gone. After a deal of haggling and squabbling, Fagin beat down the amount of the required advance from five pounds to three pounds four and sixpence, protesting with many solemn asseverations that that would only leave him eighteen pence to keep house with, Mr. Sykes sullenly remarking that if he couldn't get any more, he must accompany him home, with the Dodger and Master Bates put the eatables in the cupboard. The Jew then, taking leave of his affectionate friend, returned homeward, attended by Nancy and the boys. Mr. Sykes, meanwhile, flinging himself on the bed, and composing himself to sleep away the time until the young ladies return. In due course they arrived at Fagin's abode, where they found Toby Crackett and Mr. Chitling intent upon their fifteenth game at cribbage, which it is scarcely necessary to say the latter gentleman lost, and with it his fifteenth and last sixpence, much to the amusement of his young friends. Mr. Crackett, apparently somewhat ashamed at being found relaxing himself with a gentleman so much his inferior in station and mental endowments, yawned, and inquiring after Sykes, took up his hat to go. "'Has nobody been, Toby?' asked Fagin. "'Not a living leg,' answered Mr. Crackett, pulling up his collar. "'It's been as dull as swipes. You ought to stand something handsome, Fagin, to recompense me for keeping out so long. Damn!' I'm as flat as a juryman, and should have gone to sleep, as fast as Newgate, if I hadn't had the good nature to amuse this youngster. Horrid dull, I'm blessed if I ain't. With these and other ejaculations of the same kind, Mr. Toby Crackett swept up his winnings, and crammed them into his waistcoat pocket, with a haughty air, as though such small pieces of silver were wholly beneath the consideration of a man of his figure. This done, he swaggered out of the room with so much elegance and gentility, that Mr. Chitling, bestowing numerous admiring glances on his legs and boots till they were out of sight, assured the company that he considered his acquaintance cheap at fifteen sixpences at an interview, and that he didn't value his losses as the snap of his little finger. "'What a rum chap you are, Tom!' said Master Bates, highly amused by this declaration. "'Not a bit of it,' replied Mr. Chitling. "'How am I, Fagin?' "'A very clever fellow, my dear,' said Fagin, patting him on the shoulder, and winking to his other pupils. "'And Mr. Crackett is a heavy swell, ain't he, Fagin?' asked Tom. "'No doubt at all of that, my dear. "'And it is a creditable thing to have his acquaintance, ain't it, Fagin?' pursued Tom. "'Very much so indeed, my dear.' They're only jealous, Tom, because he won't give it to them. Ah! cried Tom triumphantly. That's where it is. He has cleaned me out. But I can go and earn some more when I like, can't I, Fagin? To be sure you can. And the sooner you go, the better, Tom. So make up your loss at once, and don't lose any more time. Dodger? Charlie? "'It's time you were on the lay. Come, it's nearly ten, and nothing done yet.' In obedience to this hint, the boys, nodding to Nancy, took up their hats and left the room, the Dodger and his vivacious friend indulging, as they went, in many witticisms at the expense of Mr. Chitling, in whose conduct it is but justice to say there was nothing very conspicuous or peculiar, inasmuch as there are a great number of spirited young bloods upon town who pay a much higher price than Mr. Chitling for being seen in good society, and a great number of fine gentlemen, composing the good society aforesaid, who established their reputation upon very much the same footing as Flash Toby Crackett. "'Now,' said Fagin, when they had left the room, "'I'll go and get you that cash, Nancy. This is only the key of a little cupboard where I keep a few odd things the boys get, my dear. I never lock up my money, <laughs> for I've got none to lock up, my dear. <laughs> none to lock up. It's a poor trade, Nancy, and no thanks. But I'm fond of seeing the young people about me, and I bear it all. I bear it all. Shh, he said hastily concealing the key in his breast. "'Who's that? Listen!' The girl, who was sitting at the table with her arms folded, 
appeared in no way interested in the arrival, or to care whether the person, whoever he was, came or went, until the murmur of a man's voice reached her ears. The instant she caught the sound, she tore off her bonnet and shawl with the rapidity of lightning, and thrust them under the table. The Jew, turning round immediately afterwards, she muttered a complaint of the heat, in a tone of languor that contrasted very remarkably with the extreme haste and violence of this action, which, however, had been unobserved by Fagin, who had his back towards her at the time. "'Bah!' he whispered, as though nettled by the interruption. "'It's the man I expected before. He's coming downstairs. Not a word about the money while he's here, Nance. He won't stop long. Not ten minutes, my dear.' Laying his skinny forefinger upon his lip, the Jew carried a candle to the door, as a man's step was heard upon the stairs without. He reached it at the same moment as the visitor, who, coming hastily into the room, was close upon the girl before he observed her. It was Monks. "'Only one of my young people,' said Fagin, observing that Monks drew back on beholding a stranger. "'Don't move, Nancy.' The girl drew closer to the table and glancing at Monks with an air of careless levity, withdrew her eyes. But as he turned towards Fagin, she stole another look, so keen and searching and full of purpose, that if there had been any bystander to observe the change, he could hardly have believed the two looks to have proceeded from the same person. "'Any news?' inquired Fagin. "'Great.' "'And, and, good?' asked Fagin, hesitating as though he feared to vex the other man by being too sanguine. "'Not bad, anyway,' replied Monks with a smile. "'I've been prompt enough this time. Let me have a word with you.' The girl drew closer to the table, and made no offer to leave the room, although she could see that Monks was pointing to her. The Jew, perhaps fearing she might say something aloud about the money if he endeavoured to get rid of her, pointed upward, and took Monks out of the room. "'Not that infernal hole we were in before,' she could hear the man say as they went upstairs. Fagin laughed, and making some reply which did not reach her, seemed, by the creaking of the boards, to lead his companion to the second story. Before the sound of their footsteps had ceased to echo through the house, the girl had slipped off her shoes, and drawing her gown loosely over her head, and muffling her arms in it, stood at the door, listening with breathless interest. The moment the noise ceased, she glided from the room, ascended the stairs with incredible softness and silence, and was lost in the gloom above. The room remained deserted for a quarter of an hour or more. The girl glided back with the same unearthly tread, and immediately afterwards the two men were heard descending. Monks went at once into the street, and the Jew crawled upstairs again for the money. When he returned, the girl was adjusting her shawl and bonnet as if preparing to be gone. "'Why, Nance!' exclaimed the Jew, starting back as he put down the candle. "'How pale you are!' "'Pale?' echoed the girl, shading her eyes with her hands, as if to look steadily at him. "'Quite horrible! What have you been doing to yourself?' "'Nothing that I know of, except sitting in this close place for I don't know how long and all.' replied the girl carelessly. "'Come, let me get back, that's a dear.' With a sigh for every piece of money, Fagin told the amount into her hand. They parted without more conversation, merely interchanging a good night. When the girl got into the open street, she sat down upon a doorstep, and seemed, for a few moments, wholly bewildered and unable to pursue her way. Suddenly she arose, and hurrying on, in a direction quite opposite to that in which Sykes was awaiting her return, quickened her pace until it gradually resolved into a violent run. After completely exhausting herself, she stopped to take breath, and, as if suddenly recollecting herself, and deploring her inability to do something she was bent upon, wrung her hands and burst into tears. It might be that her tears relieved her, or that she felt the full hopelessness of her condition, but she turned back, and hurrying with nearly as great rapidity in the contrary direction, partly to recover lost time, and partly to keep pace with the violent current of her own thoughts, soon reached the dwelling where she had left the housebreaker. If she betrayed any agitation, when she presented herself to Mr. Sykes, 
he did not observe it, for merely inquiring if she had brought the money, and receiving a reply in the affirmative, he uttered a growl of satisfaction, and replacing his head upon the pillow, resumed the slumbers which her arrival had interrupted. It was fortunate for her that the possession of money occasioned him so much employment next day, in the way of eating and drinking, and withal had so beneficial an effect in smoothing down the asperities of his temper, that he had neither time nor inclination to be very critical upon her behaviour and deportment. That she had all the abstracted and nervous manner of one who is on the eve of some bold and hazardous step, which it has required no common struggle to resolve upon, would have been obvious to the lynx-eyed Fagin, who would most probably have taken the alarm at once. But Mr. Sykes, lacking the niceties of discrimination, and being troubled with no more subtle misgivings than those which resolve themselves into a dogged roughness of behaviour towards everybody, and being furthermore in an unusually amiable condition, as has been already observed, saw nothing unusual in her demeanour, and indeed troubled himself so little about her, that, had her agitation been far more perceptible than it was, it would have been very unlikely to have awakened his suspicions. As that day closed in, the girl's excitement increased, and, when night came on, and she sat by, watching until the housebreaker should drink himself asleep, there was an unusual paleness in her cheek, and a fire in her eye, that even Sykes observed with astonishment. Mr. Sykes, being weak from the fever, was lying in bed, taking hot water with his gin to render it less inflammatory, and had pushed his glass towards Nancy to be replenished for the third or fourth time, when these symptoms first struck him. "'Why, burn my body!' said the man, raising himself on his hands as he stared the girl in the face. "'You look like a corpse come to life again. What's the matter?' "'Matter?' replied the girl. "'Nothing. What do you look at me so hard for?' "'What foolery is this?' demanded Sykes, grasping her by the arm and shaking her roughly. "'What is it? What do you mean? What are you thinking of?' "'Of many things, Bill,' replied the girl, shivering, and as she did so, pressing her hands upon her eyes. "'But, Lord, what odds in that?' The tone of forced gaiety in which the last words were spoken seemed to produce a deeper impression on Sykes and the wild and rigid look which had preceded them. "'I tell you what it is,' said Sykes, "'if you haven't caught the fever, and got it coming on now, there's something more than usual in the wind, and something dangerous, too. You're not going to—' "'No, damn, you wouldn't do that.' "'Do what?' asked the girl. "'There ain't,' said Sykes fixing his eyes upon her, and muttering the words to himself, "'There ain't a stauncher-hearted gal going, or I'd have cut her throat three months ago. She's got the fever coming on, that's it.' Fortifying himself with this assurance, Sykes drained the glass to the bottom, and then, with many grumbling oaths, called for his physic. The girl jumped up with great alacrity, poured it quickly out, but with her back towards him, and held the vessel to his lips while he drank off the contents. "'Now,' said the robber, "'come and sit aside of me, and put on your own face, or I'll alter it so that you won't know it again when you do want it.' The girl obeyed. Sykes, locking her hand in his, fell back upon the pillow, turning his eyes upon her face. They closed, opened again, closed once more, again opened. He shifted his position restlessly, and, after dozing again and again for two or three minutes, and as often springing up with a look of terror, and gazing vacantly about him, was suddenly stricken, as it were, while in the very attitude of rising, into a deep and heavy sleep. The grasp of his hand relaxed. The upraised arm fell languidly by his side, and he lay like one in a profound trance. "'The laudanum has taken effect at last,' murmured the girl as she rose from the bedside, I may be too late even now." She hastily dressed herself in her bonnet and shawl, looking fearfully round from time to time, as if, despite the sleeping draught, she expected every moment to feel the pressure of Sykes' heavy hand upon her shoulder. Then, stooping softly over the bed, she kissed the robber's lips, and then opening and closing the room door with noiseless touch, hurried from the house. 
a watchman was crying half-past nine, down a dark passage through which he had to pass, in gaining the main thoroughfare. "'Has it long gone the half-hour?' asked the girl. "'He'll strike the hour in another quarter,' said the man, raising his lantern to her face. "'And I cannot get there in less than an hour or more,' muttered Nancy, brushing swiftly past him, and gliding rapidly down the street. Many of the shops were already closing in the back lanes and avenues through which she tracked her way, in making from Spitalfields towards the west end of London. The clock struck ten, increasing her impatience. She tore along the narrow pavement, elbowing the passengers from side to side, and darting almost under the horses' heads, crossed crowded streets, where clusters of persons were eagerly watching their opportunity to do the like. "'The woman is mad,' said people turning to look after her as she rushed away. When she reached the more wealthy quarter of the town, the streets were comparatively deserted, and here her headlong progress excited a still greater curiosity in the stragglers whom she hurried past. Some quickened their pace behind, as though to see whither she was hasting at such an unusual rate, and a few made head upon her, and looked back, surprised at her undiminished speed. But they fell off one by one, and when she neared her place of destination, she was alone. It was a family hotel, in a quiet but handsome street near Hyde Park. As a brilliant light of the lamp which burned before its door guided her to the spot, the clock struck eleven. She had loitered for a few paces as though irresolute, and making up her mind to advance, but the sound determined her, and she stepped into the hall. The porter's seat was vacant. She looked round with an air of incertitude, and advanced towards the stairs. "'Now, young woman,' said a smartly-dressed female, looking out from a door behind her, "'what do you want here?' "'A lady who is stopping in this house,' answered the girl. "'A lady?' was the reply, accompanied with a scornful look. "'What lady?' "'Miss Miley,' said Nancy. The young woman, who had by this time noted her appearance, replied only by a look of virtuous disdain, and summoned a man to answer her. To him, Nancy repeated her request. "'What name am I to say?' asked the waiter. "'It's of no use saying any,' replied Nancy. "'Nor business?' said the man. "'No, nor that neither,' rejoined the girl. "'I must see the lady.' "'Come,' said the man, pushing her towards the door. "'None of this. Take yourself off.' "'I shall be carried out if I go,' said the girl violently and I can make that a job that two of you won't like to do. Isn't there anybody here?" she said, looking round, that will see a simple message carried for a poor wretch like me. This appeal produced an effect on a good-tempered faced man cook, who with some of the other servants was looking on, and who stepped forward to interfere. Take it up for a joke, can't you? said this person. Oh, what's the good? replied the man. You don't suppose a young lady will see such as her, do you?" This allusion to Nancy's doubtful character raised a vast quantity of chaste wrath in the bosoms of four housemaids, who remarked, with great fervour, that the creature was a disgrace to her sex, and strongly advocated her being thrown ruthlessly into the kennel. "'Do what you like with me,' said the girl, turning to the men again. "'But do what I ask you first and I ask you to give this message for God Almighty's sake." The soft-hearted cook added his intercession, and the result was that the man who had first appeared undertook its delivery. "'What's it to be?' said the man, with one foot on the stairs. "'That a young woman earnestly asks to speak to Miss Maylie alone,' said Nancy, "'and that if the lady will only hear the first word she has to say, she will know whether to hear her business, or to have her turned out of doors as an impostor. "'I say,' said the man, "'you're coming it strong.' "'You give the message,' said the girl firmly, "'and let me hear the answer.' The man ran upstairs. Nancy remained pale and almost breathless, listening with quivering lip to the very audible expressions of scorn, of which the chaste housemaids were very prolific, and of which they became still more so when the man returned, and said the young woman was to walk upstairs. "'It's no good being proper in this world,' said the first housemaid. "'Brass can do better than the gold what has stood the fire,' said the second. The third contented herself with wondering what ladies was made of, and the fourth took the first in a quartet of shameful, 
with which the Dianas concluded. Regardless of all this, for she had weightier matters at heart, Nancy followed the man, with trembling limbs, to a small antechamber, lighted by a lamp from the ceiling. Here he left her, and retired. End of chapter 39Chapter Forty of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Forty. A strange interview, which is a sequel to the last chamber. The girl's life had been squandered in the streets, and among the most noisome of the stews and dens of London, but there was something of the woman's original nature left in her still and when she heard a light step approaching the door opposite to that by which she had entered, and thought of the wide contrast which the small room would in another moment contain, she felt burdened with the sense of her own deep shame, and shrunk as though she could scarcely bear the presence of her with whom she had sought this interview. But struggling with these better feelings was pride, the vice of the lowest and most debased creatures, no less than of the high and self-assured. The miserable companion of thieves and ruffians, the fallen outcast of low haunts, the associate of the scourings of the jails and hulks, living within the shadow of the gallows itself, even this degraded being felt too proud to betray a feeble gleam of the womanly feeling which he thought a weakness, but which alone connected her with that humanity of which her wasting life had obliterated so many, many traces when a very child. She raised her eyes sufficiently to observe that the figure which presented itself was that of a slight and beautiful girl. Then, bending them on the ground, she tossed her head with affected carelessness, as she said, "'It's a hard matter to get to see you, lady. If I had taken offence and gone away, as many would have done, you'd have been sorry for it one day, and not without reason, either.' "'I am very sorry if any one has behaved harshly to you,' replied Rose. "'Do not think of that.' "'Tell me why you wish to see me. I am the person you inquired for.' The kind tone of this answer, the sweet voice, the gentle manner, the absence of any accent of haughtiness or displeasure, took the girl completely by surprise, and she burst into tears. "'Oh, lady, lady,' she said, clasping her hands passionately before her face, "'if there was more like you, there would be fewer like me. There would. There would.' "'Sit down,' said Rose earnestly. "'If you are in poverty or affliction, I shall be truly glad to relieve you if I can. I shall indeed. Sit down.' "'Let me stand, lady,' said the girl, still weeping. "'And do not speak to me so kindly till you know me better. It is growing late. Is, is that door shut?' "'Yes,' said Rose, recoiling a few steps, as if to be nearer assistance in case she should require it. Why, because, said the girl, I am about to put my life and the lives of others in your hands. I am the girl that dragged little Oliver back to old Fagan's on the night he went out from the house in Pentonville. You? said Rose Maylie. I, lady, replied the girl. I am the infamous creature you have heard of that lives among the thieves and that never from the first moment i can recollect my eyes and senses opening on london streets have known any better life or kinder words than they have given me so help me god do not mind shrinking openly from me lady i am younger than you would think to look at me but i am well used to it the poorest women fall back as i make my way along the crowded pavement what dreadful things are these said rose involuntarily falling from her strange companion "'Thank heaven, upon your knees, dear lady,' cried the girl, "'that you have friends to care for, and keep you in your childhood, and that you were never in the midst of cold and hunger, and riot and drunkenness, and, and, and something worse than all, as I have been from my cradle. I may use the word, for the alley and the gutter were mine, as they will be my deathbed.' "'I pity you,' said Rose, in a broken voice. "'It wrings my heart to hear you.' "'Heaven bless you for your goodness,' rejoined the girl. "'If you knew what I am sometimes, 
you would pity me indeed. But I have stolen away from those who would surely murder me if they knew I had been here, to tell you what I have overheard. Do you know a man named Monks? No, said Rose. He knows you, replied the girl, and knew you were here, for it was by hearing him tell the place that I found you out. I never heard the name, said Rose. Then he goes by some other amongst us, rejoined the girl, which I more than thought before. Some time ago, and soon after Oliver was put into your house on the night of the robbery, I, suspecting this man, listened to a conversation held between him and Fagin in the dark. I found out, from what I heard, that Monks, the man I asked you about, you know— Yes, said Rose, I understand. That Monks, pursued the girl, had seen him accidentally with two of our boys on the day we first lost him, and had known him directly to be the same child that he was watching for, though I couldn't make out why. A bargain was struck with Fagin, that if Oliver was got back, he should have a certain sum, and he was to have more for making him a thief, which this Monks wanted for some purpose of his own. For what purpose? asked Rose. He caught sight of my shadow on the wall as I listened, in the hope of finding out," said the girl, and there are not many people besides me that could have got out of their way in time to escape discovery, but I did, and I saw him no more till last night. And what occurred then? I'll tell you, lady. Last night he came again. Again they went upstairs, and I, wrapping myself up so that my shadow would not betray me, again listened at the door. The first words I heard Monk say were these. So the only proofs of the boy's identity lie at the bottom of the river, and the old hag that received them from the mother is rotting in her coffin. They laughed, and talked of his success in doing this, and Monks, talking on about the boy, and getting very wild, said that though he had got the young devil's money safely now, he'd rather have had it the other way, for what a game it would have been to have brought down the boast of the father's will by driving him through every jail in town, and then hauling him up for some capital felony which Fagin could easily manage after having made a good profit of him besides. "'What is all this?' said Rose. "'The truth, lady, though it comes from my lips,' replied the girl. Then he said, with oaths common enough in my ears, but strange to yours, that if he could gratify his hatred by taking the boy's life without bringing his own neck in danger, he would. But, as he couldn't, he'd be upon the watch to meet him at every turn in life. And if he took advantage of his birth and history, he might harm him yet. In short, Fagin, he says, Jew as you are, you never laid such snares as I'll contrive for my young brother, Oliver. His brother? exclaimed Rose. "'Those were his words,' said Nancy, glancing uneasily round, as she had scarcely ceased to do, since she began to speak, for a vision of Sykes haunted her perpetually. "'And more, when he spoke of you and the other lady, and said it seemed contrived by heaven, or the devil, against him, that Oliver should come into your hands, he laughed, and said there was some comfort in that too, for how many thousands and hundreds of thousands of pounds would you not give, if you had them, to know who your two-legged spaniel was? You do not mean, said Rose, turning very pale, to tell me that this was said in earnest? He spoke in hard and angry earnest, if a man ever did, replied the girl, shaking her head. He is an earnest man when his hatred is up. I know many who do worse things, but I rather listen to them all a dozen times and to that monk's wants. It is growing late, and I have to reach home without suspicion of having been on such an errand as this. I must get back quickly. But what can I do? said Rose. To what use can I turn this communication without you? Back? Why do you wish to return to companions you paint in such terrible colours? If you repeat this information to a gentleman whom I can summon in an instant from the next room— you can be consigned to some place of safety, without half an hour's delay." "'I wish to go back,' said the girl. "'I must go back, because, 
how can I tell such things to an innocent lady like you? Because among the men I have told you of, there is one, the most desperate among them all, that I can't leave, no, not even to be saved from the life I am leading now. You're having interfered in this dear boy's behalf before, said Rose. Your coming here, at so great a risk, to tell me what you have heard, your manner, which convinces me of the truth of what you say, your evident contrition and sense of shame, all lead me to believe that you might yet be reclaimed. Oh, said the earnest girl, folding her hands as the tears coursed down her face, do not turn a deaf ear to the entreaties of one of your own sex. The first, the first, I do believe, who have appealed to you in the voice of pity and compassion. Do hear my words, and let me save you yet for better things." "'Lady,' cried the girl, sinking on her knees, "'dear, sweet angel lady, you are the first that ever blessed me with such words as these, and if I had heard them years ago, they might have turned me from a life of sin and sorrow. But it's too late. It is too late. It is never too late," said Rose, for penitence and atonement. "'It is,' cried the girl, writhing in agony of her mind. "'I cannot leave him now. I could not be his death.' "'Why should you be?' asked Rose. "'Nothing could save him,' cried the girl. "'If I told others what I have told you, and led to their being taken, he would be sure to die. He is the boldest and has been so cruel." "'Is it possible,' cried Rose, "'that for such a man as this you can resign every future hope, and the certainty of immediate rescue? It is madness!' "'I don't know what it is,' answered the girl. "'I only know that it is so, and not with me alone, but with hundreds of others as bad and wretched as myself. I must go back. Whether it is God's wrath for the wrong I have done, I do not know, but I am drawn back to him through every suffering and ill usage, and I should be, I believe, if I knew that I was to die by his hand at last." "'What am I to do?' said Rose. "'I should not let you depart from me thus.' "'You should, lady, and I know you will,' rejoined the girl, rising. "'You will not stop my going, because I have trusted in your goodness and forced no promise from you, as I might have done. Of what use, then, is the communication you have made?" said Rose. This mystery must be investigated, or how will its disclosure to me benefit Oliver, whom you are anxious to serve? You must have some kind gentleman about you that will hear it as a secret, and advise you what to do," rejoined the girl. But where can I find you again when it is necessary? asked Rose. I do not seek to know where these dreadful people live, but where will you be walking or passing at any settled period from this time? Will you promise me that you will have my secret strictly kept, and come alone, or with the only other person that knows it, and that I shall not be watched or followed?" asked the girl. I promise you solemnly," answered Rose. Every Sunday night, from eleven until the clock strikes twelve, said the girl, without hesitation. I will walk on London Bridge, if I am alive." "'Stay another moment,' interposed Rose, as the girl moved hurriedly towards the door. "'Think once again on your own condition, and the opportunity you have of escaping from it. You have a claim on me, not only as a voluntary bearer of this intelligence, but as a woman lost almost beyond redemption. Will you return to this gang of robbers, and to this man? when a word can save you? What fascination is it that can take you back and make you cling to wickedness and misery? Oh! Is there no chord in your heart that I can touch? Is there nothing left to which I can appeal against this terrible infatuation?" "'When ladies as young and good and beautiful as you are,' replied the girl steadily, "'give away your hearts. Love will carry you all lengths, even such as you who have home, friends, other admirers, everything to fill them. When such as I, who have no certain roof but the coffin lid, and no friend in sickness or death but the hospital nurse, 
set our rotten hearts on any man, and let me fill the place that has been a blank through all our wretched lives, who can hope to cure us? Pity us, lady, pity us for having only one feeling of the woman left, and for having that turned, by every judgment, from a comfort and a pride, into a new means of violence and suffering. You will, said Rose, after a pause, take some money from me, which may enable you to live without dishonesty at all events until we meet again. Not a penny, replied the girl, waving her hand. Do not close your heart against all my efforts to help you, said Rose, stepping gently forward. I wish to serve you indeed. You would serve me best, lady, replied the girl, wringing her hands, if you could take my life at once, for I felt more grief to think of what I am to-night than I ever did before, and it would be something not to die in the hell in which I have lived. God bless you, sweet lady, and send as much happiness on your head as I have brought shame on mine." Thus speaking, and sobbing aloud, the unhappy creature turned away, while Rose Maylie, overpowered by this extraordinary interview, which had more the semblance of a rapid dream than an actual occurrence, sank into a chair and endeavoured to collect her wandering thoughts. End of chapter 40《Chapter Forty One of Oliver Twist》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Forty One. Containing fresh discoveries, and showing that surprises, like misfortunes, seldom come alone. Her situation was, indeed, one of no common trial and difficulty while she felt a most eager and burning desire to penetrate the mystery in which Oliver's history was enveloped, she could not but hold sacred the confidence which the miserable woman with whom she had just conversed had reposed in her, as a young and guileless girl. Her words and manner had touched Rose Maylie's heart, and, mingled with her love for her young charge, and scarcely less intense in its truth and fervour, was her fond wish to win the outcast back to repentance and hope. They purposed remaining in London only three days, prior to departing for some weeks to a distant part of the coast. It was now midnight of the first day. What course of action could she determine upon, which could be adopted in eight and forty hours? Or how could she postpone the journey without exciting suspicion? Mr. Losburn was with them, and would be for the next two days, but Rose was too well acquainted with the excellent gentleman's impetuosity and foresaw too clearly the wrath with which, in the first explosion of his indignation, he would regard the instrument of Oliver's recapture, to trust him with the secret, when her representations in the girl's behalf could be seconded by no experienced person. These were all reasons for the greatest caution, and most circumspect behaviour in communicating it to Mrs. Maylie, whose first impulse would infallibly be to hold a conference with the worthy doctor on the subject. As to resorting to any legal adviser, even if she had known how to do so, it was scarcely to be thought of for the same reason. Once the thought occurred to her of seeking assistance from Harry, but this awakened the recollection of their last parting, and it seemed unworthy of her to call him back when the tears rose to her eyes as she pursued this train of reflection. He might have by this time learnt to forget her, and to be happier away. Disturbed by these different reflections, inclining now to one course and then to another, and again recoiling from all, as each successive consideration presented itself to her mind, Rose passed a sleepless and anxious night. After more communing with herself next day, she arrived at the desperate conclusion of consulting Harry. "'If it be painful to him,' she thought, "'to come back here, how painful it will be to me. But perhaps he will not come.' He may write, or he may come himself, and studiously abstain from meeting me. He did when he went away. I hardly thought he would, but it was better for us both. And here Rose dropped the pen, and turned away, as though the very paper which was to be her messenger should not see her weep. She had taken up the same pen, and laid it down again fifty times, and had considered and reconsidered the first line of her letter without writing the first word, when Oliver, 
who had been walking in the streets with Mr. Giles for a bodyguard, entered the room in such breathless haste and violent agitation as seemed to betoken some new cause of alarm. "'What makes you look so flurried?' asked Rose, advancing to meet him. "'I hardly know how. I feel as if I should be choked.' replied the boy. "'Oh, dear! To think that I should see him at last, and you should be able to know that I have told you the truth!' "'I never thought you had told us anything but the truth,' said Rose, soothing him. "'But what is this? Of whom do you speak?' "'I have seen the gentleman,' replied Oliver, scarcely able to articulate. "'The gentleman who was so good to me, Mr. Brownlow!' that we have so often talked about." "'Where?' asked Rose. "'Getting out of a coach,' replied Oliver, shedding tears of delight, "'and going into a house. I didn't speak to him. I couldn't speak to him, for he didn't see me, and I trembled so that I was not able to go up to him. But Giles asked for me whether he lived there, and they said he did. Look here,' said Oliver, opening a scrap of paper. "'Here it is. Here's where he lives. I'm going there directly. Oh, dear me, dear me, what shall I do when I come to see him and hear him speak again?" With her attention not a little distracted by these and a great many other incoherent exclamations of joy, Rose read the address, which was Craven Street in the Strand. She very soon determined upon turning the discovery to account. Quick, she said, tell them to fetch a hackney coach, and be ready to go with me. I will take you there directly, without a minute's loss of time. I will only tell my aunt that we are going out for an hour, and be ready as soon as you are." Oliver needed no prompting to dispatch, and in little more than five minutes they were on their way to Craven Street. When they arrived there, Rose left Oliver in the coach, under pretence of preparing the old gentleman to receive him, and sending up her card by the servant, requested to see Mr. Brownlow on very pressing business. The servant soon returned, to beg that she would walk upstairs, and following him into an upper room, Miss Maylie was presented to an elderly gentleman of benevolent appearance, in a bottle-green coat. At no great distance from whom was seated another old gentleman, in nankeen breeches and gaiters, who did not look particularly benevolent, and who was sitting with his hands clasped on the top of a thick stick, and his chin propped thereupon. "'Dear me!' said the gentleman in the bottle-green coat hastily rising with great politeness. "'I beg your pardon, young lady. I imagined it was some importunate person who—I beg you will excuse me. Be seated, pray.' "'Mr. Brownlow, I believe, sir,' said Rose, glancing from the other gentleman to the one who had spoken. "'That is my name,' said the old gentleman. "'This is my friend Mr. Grimwig. Grimwig, will you leave us for a few minutes?' "'I believe—' interposed Miss Maylie, that at this period of our interview I need not give that gentleman the trouble of going away. If I am correctly informed, he is cognizant of the business on which I wish to speak to you." Mr. Brownlow inclined his head. Mr. Grimwig, who had made one very stiff bow, and risen from his chair, made another very stiff bow, and dropped into it again. "'I shall surprise you very much, I have no doubt,' said Rose, naturally embarrassed but you once showed great benevolence and goodness to a very dear young friend of mine, and I am sure you will take an interest in hearing of him again." "'Indeed?' said Mr. Brownlow. "'Oliver Twist, you knew him as,' replied Rose. The words no sooner escaped her lips than Mr. Grimwig, who had been affecting to dip into a large book that lay on the table, upset it with a great crash, and falling back in his chair discharged from his features every expression but one of unmitigated wonder, and indulged in a prolonged and vacant stare. Then, as if ashamed of having betrayed so much emotion, he jerked himself, as it were, by a convulsion, into his former attitude, and looking out straight before him, emitted a long, deep whistle, which seemed, at last, not to be discharged on empty air, but to die away in the innermost recesses of his stomach. Mr. Brownlow was no less surprised, although his astonishment was not expressed in the same eccentric manner. He drew his chair nearer to Miss Maylie's, and said, "'Do me the favour, my dear young lady, to leave entirely out of the question 
that goodness and benevolence of which you speak, and of which nobody else knows anything. And if you have it in your power to produce any evidence which will alter the unfavourable opinion I was once induced to entertain of that poor child, in heaven's name put me in possession of it. A bad one. I'll eat my head if he's not a bad one, growled Mr. Grimwig, speaking by some ventriloquial power, without moving a muscle of his face. "'He is a child of a noble nature and a warm heart,' said Rose, colouring, "'and that power, which has thought fit to try him beyond his years, has planted in his breast affections and feelings which would do honour to many who have numbered his days six times over.' "'I'm only sixty-one said Mr. Grimwig, with the same rigid face, and as the devil's in it, if this Oliver is not twelve years old at least, I don't see the application of that remark. "'Do not heed my friend, Miss Maylie,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'He does not mean what he says. Yes, he does,' growled Mr. Grimwig. "'No, he doesn't,' said Mr. Brownlow, obviously rising in wrath as he spoke. "'He'll eat his head if he doesn't,' growled Mr. Grimwig. "'He would deserve to have it knocked off if he does.' said Mr. Brownlow. "'And he'd uncommonly like to see any man offer to do it,' responded Mr. Grimwig, knocking his stick upon the floor. Having gone thus far, the two old gentlemen severally took snuff, and afterwards shook hands, according to their invariable custom. "'Now, Miss Maylie,' said Mr. Brownlow, "'to return to the subject in which your humanity is so much interested, will you let me know what intelligence you have of this poor child?' allowing me to promise that I exhausted every means in my power of discovering him, and that since I have been absent from this country, my first impression that he had imposed upon me, and had been persuaded by his former associates to rob me, has been considerably shaken." Rose, who had had time to collect her thoughts, at once related, in a few natural words, all that had befallen Oliver since he left Mr. Brownlow's house reserving Nancy's information for that gentleman's private ear, and concluding with the assurance that his only sorrow, for some months past, had been not being able to meet with his former benefactor and friend. "'Thank God!' said the old gentleman. "'This is great happiness to me, great happiness. But you have not told me where he is now, Miss Maylie. You must pardon my finding fault with you, but why not have brought him?' "'He is waiting in the coach at the door,' replied Rose. "'At this door?' cried the old gentleman, with which he hurried out of the room, down the stairs, up the coach steps, and into the coach, without another word. When the room door closed behind him, Mr. Grimwig lifted up his head, and converting one of the hind legs of his chair into a pivot, described three distinct circles, with the assistance of his stick and the table, sitting in it all the time. After performing this evolution, he rose and limped as fast as he could up and down the room at least a dozen times, and then stopping suddenly before Rose, kissed her without the slightest preface. "'Shh!' he said, as the young lady rose in some alarm at this unusual proceeding. "'Don't be afraid. I'm old enough to be your grandfather. You're a sweet girl. I like you. Here they are.' In fact, as he threw himself at one dexterous dive into his former seat, Mr. Brownlow returned, accompanied by Oliver, whom Mr. Grimwig received very graciously, and if the gratification of that moment had been the only reward for all her anxiety and care in Oliver's behalf, Rose Maylie would have been well repaid. "'There is somebody else who should not be forgotten, by the by,' said Mr. Brownlow, ringing the bell. "'Send Mrs. Bedwin here, if you please.' The old housekeeper answered the summons with all dispatch, and dropping a curtsey at the door, waited for orders. "'Why, you get blinder every day, Bedwin,' said Mr. Brownlow, rather testily. "'Well, that I do, sir,' replied the old lady. "'People's eyes at my time of life don't improve with age, sir.' "'I could have told you that,' rejoined Mr. Brownlow. "'But put on your glasses, and see if you can't find out what you were wanted for, will you?' The old lady began to rummage in her pocket for her spectacles, but Oliver's patience was not proof against this new trial and yielding to his first impulse, he sprang into her arms. "'God be good to me!' 
cried the old lady, embracing him. "'It is my innocent boy!' "'My dear old nurse!' cried Oliver. "'He would come back. I knew he would,' said the old lady, holding him in her arms. "'How well he looks, and how like a gentleman's son he is dressed again! Where have you been this long, long while? Ah, the same sweet face, but not so pale, the same soft eye, but not so sad. I have never forgotten them, or his quiet smile, but have seen them every day, side by side with those of my own dear children, dead and gone since I was a lightsome young creature. Running on thus, and now holding Oliver from her to mark how he had grown, now clasping him to her, and passing her fingers fondly through his hair, the good soul laughed and wept upon his neck by turns. Leaving her and Oliver to compare notes at leisure, Mr. Brownlow led the way into another room, and there heard from Rose a full narration of her interview with Nancy, which occasioned him no little surprise and perplexity. Rose also explained her reasons for not confiding in her friend Mr. Losburn in the first instance. The old gentleman considered that she had acted prudently, and readily undertook to hold solemn conference with the worthy doctor himself. To afford him an early opportunity for the execution of this design, it was arranged that he should call at the hotel at eight o'clock that evening, and that in the meantime Mrs. Maylie should be cautiously informed of all that had occurred. These preliminaries adjusted, Rose and Oliver returned home. Rose had by no means overrated the measure of the good doctor's wrath. Nancy's history was no sooner unfolded to him than he poured forth a shower of mingled threats and execrations, threatened to make her the first victim of the combined ingenuity of Messrs. Blathers and Duff, and actually put on his hat preparatory to sallying forth to obtain the assistance of those worthies. And doubtless he would, in this first outbreak, have carried the intention into effect without a moment's consideration of the consequences if he had not been restrained, in part, by corresponding violence on the side of Mr. Brownlow, who was himself an irascible temperament, and party by such arguments and representations as seemed best calculated to dissuade him from his hot-brained purpose. "'Then what the devil is to be done?' said the impetuous doctor, when they had rejoined the two ladies. "'Are we to pass a vote of thanks to all these vagabonds, male and female?' and beg them to accept a hundred pounds, or so, apiece, as a trifling mark of our esteem, and some slight acknowledgment of their kindness to Oliver?" "'Not exactly that,' rejoined Mr. Brownlow, laughing. "'But we must proceed gently, and with great care.' "'Gentleness and care!' exclaimed the doctor. "'I'd send them one and all to—' "'Never mind where,' interposed Mr. Brownlow. "'But reflect whether sending them anywhere is likely to attain the object we have in view." "'What object?' asked the doctor. "'Simply the discovery of Oliver's parentage, and regaining for him the inheritance of which, if this story be true, he has been fraudulently deprived.' "'Ah!' said Mr. Losburn, cooling himself with his pocket-handkerchief. "'I almost forgot that. You see,' pursued Mr. Brownlow, Placing this poor girl entirely out of the question, and supposing it were possible to bring these scoundrels to justice without compromising her safety, what good should we bring about? "'Hanging a few of them at least in all probability,' suggested the doctor, "'and transporting the rest.' "'Very good,' replied Mr. Brownlow, smiling. "'But no doubt they will bring that about for themselves in the fullness of time.' and if we step in to forestall them, it seems to me that we shall be performing a very quixotic act in direct opposition to our own interest, or at least to Oliver's, which is the same thing." "'How?' inquired the doctor. "'Thus. It is quite clear that we shall have extreme difficulty in getting to the bottom of this mystery, unless we can bring this man, Monks, upon his knees. That can only be done by stratagem, and by catching him when he is not surrounded by these people. For, suppose he were apprehended, we have no proof against him. He is not even, so far as we know, or as the facts appear to us, concerned with the gang in any of their robberies. If he were not discharged, 
it is very unlikely that he could receive any further punishment than being committed to prison as a rogue and vagabond, and, of course, ever afterwards his mouth would be so obstinately closed that he might as well, for our purposes, be deaf, dumb, blind, and an idiot. Then, said the doctor impetuously, I put it to you again, whether you think it reasonable that this promise to the girl should be considered binding, a promise made with the best and kindest intentions, but really do not discuss the point, my dear young lady, pray, said Mr. Brownlow, interrupting Rose as she was about to speak. The promise shall be kept. I don't think it will, in the slightest degree, interfere with our proceedings. But before we can resolve upon any precise course of action, it will be necessary to see the girl, to ascertain from her whether she will point out this Monks, on the understanding that he is to be dealt with by us, and not by the law, or, if she will not, or cannot do that, to procure from her such an account of his haunts and descriptions of his person as will enable us to identify him. She cannot be seen until next Sunday night. This is Tuesday. I would suggest that in the meantime we remain perfectly quiet, and keep these matters secret, even from Oliver himself. Although Mr. Losburn received with many wry faces a proposal involving a delay of five whole days, he was fain to admit that no better course occurred to him just then. And as both Rose and Mrs. Maylie sided very strongly with Mr. Brownlow, that gentleman's proposition was carried unanimously. "'I should like,' he said, "'to call in the aid of my friend Grimwig. He is a strange creature, but a shrewd one, and might prove of material assistance to us. I should say that he was bred a lawyer, and quitted the bar in disgust, because he had only one brief and emotion, of course, in twenty years, though whether that is recommendation or not you must determine for yourselves. "'I have no objection to your calling in your friend, if I may call in mine,' said the doctor. "'We must put it to the vote,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'Who may he be?' "'That lady's son, and this young lady's very old friend,' said the doctor, motioning towards Mrs. Maylie and concluding with an expressive glance at her niece. Rose blushed deeply, but she did not make any audible objection to this motion. Possibly she felt in a hopeless minority. And Harry Maylie and Mr. Grimwig were accordingly added to the committee. "'We stay in town, of course,' said Mrs. Maylie, "'while there remains the slightest prospect of prosecuting this inquiry with a chance of success.' I will spare neither trouble nor expense in behalf of the object in which we are all so deeply interested, and I am content to remain here, if it be for twelve months, so long as you assure me that any hope remains. Good, rejoined Mr. Brownlow, and as I see on the faces about me a disposition to inquire how it happened that I was not in the way to corroborate Oliver's tale, and had so suddenly left the kingdom, let me stipulate that I shall be asked no questions, until of such time as I may deem it expedient to forestall them by telling my own story. Believe me, I make this request with good reason, for I might otherwise excite hopes destined never to be realised, and only increase difficulties and disappointments, already quite numerous enough. Come, supper has been announced, and young Oliver, who is all alone in the next room, will have begun to think by this time that we have wearied of his company, and entered into some dark conspiracy to thrust him forth upon the world." With these words the old gentleman gave his hand to Mrs. Maylie, and escorted her into the supper-room. Mr. Losburn followed, leading Rose, and the council was, for the present, effectually broken up. End of chapter 41 Chapter forty two of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter forty two. An old acquaintance of Oliver's, exhibiting decided marks of genius, becomes a public character in the metropolis. Upon the night when Nancy, having lulled Mr. Sykes to sleep, 
hurried on her self-imposed mission to Rose Maylie, there advanced towards London, by the Great North Road, two persons upon whom it is expedient that this history should bestow some attention. They were a man and woman, or perhaps they would be better described as a male and female, for the former was one of those long-limbed, knock-kneed, shambling, bony people, to whom it is difficult to assign any precise age, looking as they do, when they are yet boys, like undergrown men, and when they are almost men, like overgrown boys. The woman was young, but of a robust and hardy make, as she need have been to bear the weight of the heavy bundle which was strapped to her back. Her companion was not encumbered with much luggage, as they merely dangled from a stick which he carried over his shoulder, a small parcel wrapped in a common handkerchief, and apparently light enough. This circumstance, added to the length of his legs, which were of unusual extent, enabled him with much ease to keep some half-dozen paces in advance of his companion, to whom he occasionally turned with an impatient jerk of the head, as if reproaching her tardiness and urging her to greater exertion. Thus they had toiled along the dusty road, taking little heed of any object within sight, save when they stepped aside to allow a wider passage for the mail-coaches which were whirling out of town, until they passed through Highgate Archway, when the foremost traveller stopped and called impatiently to his companion, "'Come on, can't you? What a lazy bones you are, Charlotte!' "'It's a heavy load, I can tell you,' said the female, coming up almost breathless with fatigue. "'Heavy? What are you talking about? What are you made for?' rejoined the male traveller, changing his own little bundle as he spoke to the other shoulder. "'Now, oh, there you are, resting again. Well, if you ain't enough to tire anybody's patience out, I don't know what is." "'Is it much farther?' said the woman, resting herself against a bank, and looking up with the perspiration streaming from her face. "'Much farther? You're as good as there,' said the long-legged tramper, pointing out before him. "'Look there! Those are the lights of London!' "'They're a good two mile off, at least,' said the woman despondingly. "'Never mind whether they're two mile off or twenty, said Noah Claypole, for he it was. "'But get up and come on, or I'll kick you, and so I give you notice.' As Noah's red nose grew redder with anger, and as he crossed the road while speaking, as if fully prepared to put his threat into execution, the woman rose without any further remark, and trudged onward by his side. "'Where do you mean to stop for the night, Noah?' she asked after they had walked a few hundred yards. "'How should I know?' replied Noah, whose temper had been considerably impaired by walking. "'Near, I hope,' said Charlotte. "'No, not near,' replied Mr. Claypole. "'There, not near, so don't think it.' "'Why not?' "'When I tell you that I don't mean to do a thing, that's enough, without any why or because either,' replied Mr. Claypole with dignity. "'Well, you needn't be so cross,' said his companion. "'A pretty thing it would be, wouldn't it, to go and stop at the very first public house outside the town, so that Sowerberry, if he come up after us, might poke in his old nose and have us taken back in a cart with handcuffs on,' said Mr. Claypole, in a jeering tone. "'No, I shall go and lose myself among the narrowest streets I can find, and not stop till we come to the very out of the wayest house I can set eyes on. God, you may thanks your stars I've got ahead, for if we hadn't gone at first the wrong road o' purpose and come back across the country, you'd have been locked up hard and fast a week ago, my lady, and serve you right for being a fool. I know I ain't as cunning as you are replied Charlotte. But don't put all the blame on me, and say I should have been locked up. You would have been, if I had been, anyway. You took the money from the till, you know you did, said Mr. Claypole. I took it for you, Noah, dear, rejoined Charlotte. Did I keep it? asked Mr. Claypole. No, you trusted in me, and let me carry it like a dear, and so you are, said the lady chucking him under the chin, and drawing her arm through his. This was indeed the case, but as it was not Mr. Claypole's habit to repose a blind and foolish confidence in anybody, it should be observed, in justice to that gentleman, 
that he had trusted Charlotte to this extent, in order that, if they were pursued, the money might be found on her, which would leave him an opportunity of asserting his innocence of any theft, and would greatly facilitate his chances of escape. Of course, he entered at this juncture into no explanation of his motives, and they walked on very lovingly together. In pursuance of this cautious plan, Mr. Claypole went on, without halting, until he arrived at the Angel at Islington, where he wisely judged, from the crowd of passengers and numbers of vehicles, that London began in earnest. Just pausing to observe, which appeared the most crowded streets, and consequently the most to be avoided, he crossed into St. John's Road, and was soon deep in the obscurity of the intricate and dirty ways which, lying between Gray's Inn Lane and Smithfield, render that part of the town one of the lowest and worst that improvement has left in the midst of London. Through these streets, Noah Claypole walked, dragging Charlotte after him, now stepping into the kennel to embrace at a glance the whole external character of some small public-house, now jogging on again, as some fancied appearance induced him to believe it too public for his purpose. At length he stopped in front of one, more humble in appearance, and more dirty than any he had yet seen, and, having crossed over and surveyed it from the opposite pavement, graciously announced his intention of putting up there for the night. "'So, give us the bundle,' said Noah, unstrapping it from the woman's shoulders, and slinging it over his own, "'and don't you speak, except when you are spoke to.' "'What's the name of the house? Three what "'Cripples,' said Charlotte. Three cripples,' repeated Noah, "'and a very good sign, too. "'Now, then, keep close at my heels and come along.' With these injunctions he pushed the rattling door with his shoulder, and entered the house, followed by his companion. There was nobody in the bar but a young Jew, who, with his two elbows on the counter, was reading a dirty newspaper. He stared very hard at Noah, and Noah stared very hard at him. If Noah had been attired in his charity boy's dress, there might have been some reason for the Jew opening his eyes so wide. But as he had discarded the coat and badge, and wore a short smock-frock over his leathers, there seemed no particular reason for his appearance exciting so much attention in a public house. "'Is this the three cripples?' asked Noah. "'That is the dabe of this house.' replied the Jew. "'A gentleman we met on the road, coming up from the country, recommended us here,' said Noah, nudging Charlotte, perhaps to call her attention to this most ingenious device for attracting respect, and perhaps to warn her to betray no surprise. "'We want to sleep here to-night.' "'I be dut certed you cad,' said Barney, who was the attendant sprite. "'But I'll inquire. "'Show us the tap.' "'And give us a bit of cold meat and a drop of beer while you're inquiring, will you?' said Noah. Barney complied, by ushering them into a small back room, and setting the required viands before them. Having done which, he informed the travellers that they could be lodged that night, and left the amiable couple to their refreshment. Now, this back room was immediately behind the bar, and some steps lower, so that any person connected with the house, undrawing a small curtain, which concealed a single pane of glass fixed in the wall of the last-named apartment, about five feet from its flooring, could not only look down upon any guests in the back room, without any great hazard of being observed, the glass being in a dark angle of the wall, between which and a large upright beam the observer had to thrust himself, but could, by applying his ear to the partition, ascertain with tolerable distinctness their subject of conversation. The landlord of the house, had not withdrawn his eye from this place of espial for five minutes, and Barney had only just returned from making the communication above related, when Fagin, in the course of his evening's business, came into the bar to inquire after some of his young pupils. Hush, said Barney, strategers in the next room. Strangers, repeated the old man in a whisper. Ah. "'And rubbins, too,' added Barney, "'from the country, but something in your way, or I'm mistaked.' Fagin appeared to receive this communication with great interest. Mounting a stool, he cautiously applied his eye to the pane of glass, 
from which secret post he could see Mr. Claypole taking cold beef from the dish, and porter from the pot, and administering homeopathic doses of both to Charlotte, who sat patiently by, eating and drinking at his pleasure. Aha! he whispered, looking round to Barney. "'I like that fellow's looks. He'd be of use to us. He knows how to train the girl already. Don't make as much noise as a mouse, my dear, and let me hear him talk. Let me hear him.' He again applied his eye to the glass, and, turning his ear to the partition, listened attentively, with a subtle and eager look upon his face, that might have appertained to some old goblin. "'So I mean to be a gentleman,' said Mr. Claypole, kicking out his legs, and continuing a conversation, the commencement of which Fagin had arrived too late to hear. "'No more jolly old coffins, Charlotte, but a gentleman's life for me, and if you like, you shall be a lady.' "'I should like that well enough, dear,' replied Charlotte. "'But tills ain't to be emptied every day, and people to get clear off after it.' "'Tills be blowed!' said Mr. Claypole. "'There's more things besides tills to be emptied.' "'What do you mean?' asked his companion. "'Pockets, women's ridicules, houses, mail-coaches, banks,' said Mr. Claypole, rising with the porter. "'But you can't do all that, dear,' said Charlotte. "'I shall look out to get into company with them as can,' replied Noah. "'They'll be able to make us useful some way or another.' "'Why, you yourself are worth fifty women. I never see such a preciously sly and deceitful creature as you can be when I let you.' "'Law! How nice it is to hear you say so!' exclaimed Charlotte, imprinting a kiss upon his ugly face. "'There, that'll do. Don't you be too affectionate, in case I'm cross with you,' said Noah, disengaging himself with great gravity. "'I should like to be the captain of some band, and have the whopping of him, and following them about unbeknown to themselves. That would suit me, if there was good profit. And if we could only get in with some gentleman of this sort, I say it would be cheap at that twenty-pound note you've got, especially as we don't very well know how to get rid of it ourselves." After expressing this opinion, Mr. Claypole looked into the porter-pot with an aspect of deep wisdom, and having well shaken its contents, nodded condescendingly to Charlotte, and took a draught, wherewith he appeared greatly refreshed. He was meditating another, when the sudden opening of the door, and the appearance of a stranger, interrupted him. The stranger was Mr. Fagin, and very amiable he looked, and a very low bow he made as he advanced, and setting himself down at the nearest table, ordered something to drink of the grinning Barney. "'A pleasant night, sir, but cool for the time of year,' said Fagin, rubbing his hands. "'From the country, I see, sir.' "'How do you see that?' asked Noah Claypole. "'We have not so much dust as that in London,' replied Fagin, pointing from Noah's shoes to those of his companion, and from them to the two bundles. "'You're a sharp feller,' said Noah. <laughs> "'Only hear that, Charlotte.' "'Why, one need be sharp in this town, my dear.' replied the Jew, sinking his voice to a confidential whisper, "'And that's the truth!' Fagin followed up this remark by striking the side of his nose with his right forefinger, a gesture which Noah attempted to imitate, though not with complete success, in consequence of his own nose not being large enough for the purpose. However, Mr. Fagin seemed to interpret the endeavour as expressing a perfect coincidence with his opinion, and put about the liquor which Barney reappeared with in a very friendly manner. "'Good stuff, that,' observed Mr. Claypole, smacking his lips. "'Dear,' said Fagin, "'a man need be always emptying a till, or a pocket, or a woman's reticule, or a house, or a mail-coach, or a bank, if he drinks it regularly.' Mr. Claypole no sooner heard this extract from his own remarks than he fell back in his chair and looked from the Jew to Charlotte, with a countenance of ashy paleness and excessive terror. "'Don't mind me, my dear,' said Fagin, drawing his chair closer. 
it was lucky it was only me that heard you by chance. It was very lucky it was only me. I didn't take it, stammered Noah, no longer stretching out his legs like an independent gentleman, but coiling them up as well as he could under his chair. It was all her doing. You have got it now, Charlotte. You know you have. No matter who's got it, or who did it, my dear, replied Fagin, glancing nevertheless with a hawk's eye at the girl and the two bundles. I'm in that way myself, and I like you for it. In what way? asked Mr. Claypole, a little recovering. In that way of business, rejoined Fagin, and so are the people of the house. You've hit the right nail upon the head, and are as safe here as you could be. There's not a safer place in all this town than is the cripples. That is, when I like to make it so. And I have taken a fancy to you and the young woman, so I've said the word, and you may make your minds easy. Noah Claypole's mind might have been at ease after this assurance, but his body certainly was not for he shuffled and writhed about into various uncouth positions, eyeing his new friend, meanwhile, with mingled fear and suspicion. "'I'll tell you more,' said Fagin, after he had reassured the girl by dint of friendly nods and muttered encouragements. "'I have got a friend that I think can gratify your darling wish, and put you in the right way, where you can take whatever department of the business you think will suit you best at first, and be taught all the others. "'You speak as if you were in earnest,' replied Noah. "'What advantage would it be to me to be anything else?' inquired Fagin, shrugging his shoulders. "'Here, let me have a word with you outside.' "'There's no occasion to trouble ourselves to move,' said Noah, getting his legs by gradual degrees abroad again. She'll take the luggage upstairs the while. Charlotte, see to them bundles." This mandate, which had been delivered with great majesty, was obeyed without the slightest demur, and Charlotte made the best of her way off with the packages, while Noah held the door open and watched her out. "'She's kept tolerably well under, ain't she?' he asked as he resumed his seat, in the tone of a keeper who had tamed some wild animal. "'Quite perfect.' rejoined Fagin, clapping him on the shoulder. "'You're a genius, my dear.' "'Why, I suppose if I wasn't, I shouldn't be here,' replied Noah. "'But I say, she'll be back if you lose time.' "'Now, what do you think?' said Fagin. "'If you was to like my friend, could you do better than join him?' "'Is he in a good way of business? That's where it is.' responded Noah, winking one of his little eyes. "'The top of the tree employs a power of hands as the very best society in the profession.' "'Regular town-maiders?' asked Mr. Claypole. "'Not a countryman among them. And I don't think he'd take you, even on my recommendation, if he didn't run rather short of assistance just now,' replied Fagin. "'Should I have to hand over?' said Noah, slapping his breeches pocket. "'It couldn't possibly be done without,' replied Fagin, in a most decided manner. Twenty pound, though. It's a lot of money.' "'Not when it's in a note you can't get rid of,' retorted Fagin. "'Number and date taken, I suppose. Payment stopped at the bank. Ah! It's not worth much to him. It'll have to go abroad and he couldn't sell it for a great deal in the market. "'When could I see him?' asked Noah doubtfully. "'Tomorrow morning.' "'Where?' "'Here.' "'Hm,' said Noah. "'What's the wages?' "'Live like a gentleman. Board and lodging, pipes and spirits free, half of all you earn, and half of all the young woman earns,' replied Mr. Fagin. Whether Noah Claypole, whose rapacity was none of the least comprehensive, would have acceded even to these glowing terms, had he been a perfectly free agent, is very doubtful. But as he recollected that, in the event of his refusal, 
it was in the power of his new acquaintance to give him up to justice immediately, and more unlikely things had come to pass. He gradually relented, and said he thought that would suit him. "'But you see,' observed Noah, "'as she will be able to do a good deal, I should like to take something very light.' "'A little fancy work?' suggested Fagin. "'Ah, something of that sort,' replied Noah. "'What you think would suit me now? Something not too trying for the strength, and not very dangerous, you know. That's the sort of thing.' "'I heard you talk of something in the spy way upon the others, my dear,' said Fagin. "'My friend wants somebody who would do that well, very much.' "'Why, I did mention that, and I shouldn't mind turning my hand to it sometimes,' rejoined Mr. Claypole slowly. "'But it wouldn't pay by itself, you know.' "'That's true,' observed the Jew, ruminating, or pretending to ruminate. "'Now—' It might not. What do you think, then? asked Noah, anxiously regarding him. Something in the sneaking way, where it was pretty sure work, and not much more risk than being at home. What do you think of the old ladies? asked Fagin. There's a good deal of money made in snatching their bags and parcels, and running round the corner. Don't they holler out a good deal, and scratch sometimes? asked Noah, shaking his head. I don't think that would answer my purpose. Ain't there any other line open?" "'Stop,' said Fagin, laying his hand on Noah's knee. "'The Kinchin lay.' "'What's that?' demanded Mr. Claypole. "'The Kinchins, my dear,' said Fagin, "'is the young children that's sent on errands by their mothers, with sixpences and shillings, and the lay is just to take their money away. They've always got it ready in their hands. Then knock him into the kennel, and walk off very slow, as if there were nothing else the matter but a child fallen down and hurt itself. <laughs> Roared Mr. Claypole, kicking up his legs in an ecstasy. Lord, that's the very thing. To be sure it is, replied Fagin and you can have a few good beats chalked out in Camden Town, and Battle Bridge, and neighbourhoods like that, where they're always going errands, and you can upset as many kinchins as you want, any hour in the day." <laughs> With this, Fagin poked Mr. Claypole in the side, and they joined in a burst of laughter, both long and loud. Well. "'That's all right,' said Noah, when he had recovered himself, and Charlotte had returned. "'What time to-morrow shall we say?' "'Will ten do?' asked Fagin, adding, as Mr. Claypole nodded assent, "'What name shall I tell my good friend?' "'Mr. Bolter,' replied Noah, who had prepared himself for such emergency. "'Mr. Maurice Bolter. This is Mrs. Bolter.' "'Mrs. Bolter's humble servant,' said Fagin, bowing with grotesque politeness. "'I hope I shall know her better very shortly.' "'Do you hear the gentleman, Charlotte?' thundered Mr. Claypole. "'Yes, Noah, dear,' replied Mrs. Bolter, extending her hand. "'She calls me Noah as a sort of fond way of talking,' said Mr. Morris Bolter, late Claypole, turning to Fagin. Uh, "'You understand?' "'Oh, yes, I understand, perfectly,' replied Fagin, telling the truth for once. "'Good night, good night.' With many adieus and good wishes, Mr. Fagin went his way. Noah Claypole, bespeaking his good lady's attention, proceeded to enlighten her relative to the arrangement he had made, with all that haughtiness and air of superiority becoming not only a member of the sterner sex, but a gentleman who appreciated the dignity of a special appointment on the Kinchin Lay in London and its vicinity. End of chapter 42「Chapter 43 of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 43. 
wherein is shown how the artful Dodger got into trouble. "'And so it was you that was your own friend, was it?' asked Mr. Claypole, otherwise Bolter, when, by virtue of the compact entered into between them, he had removed next day to Fagin's house. "'Cod! I thought as much last night!' "'Every man's his own friend, my dear,' replied Fagin, with his most insinuating grin. "'He hasn't as good a one as himself, anywhere.' "'Except sometimes,' replied Morris Bolter, assuming the air of a man of the world. "'Some people are nobody's enemies but their own, you know.' "'Don't believe that,' said Fagin. "'When a man's his own enemy.' It's only because he's too much his own friend, not because he's careful for everybody but himself. Poo, poo, there ain't such a thing in nature. There oughtn't to be if there is, replied Mr. Bolter. That stands to reason. Some conjurers say that number three is the magic number, and some say number seven. It's neither, my friend, neither. It's number one. Ha, 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 cried Mr. Bolter. Number one forever. In a little community like ours, my dear, said Fagin, who felt it necessary to qualify his position, we have a general number one, without considering me too as the same, and all the other young people. Oh, the devil! exclaimed Mr. Bolter. "'You see,' pursued Fagin, affecting to disregard this interruption, "'we are so mixed up together and identified in our interests that it must be so. For instance, it's your object to take care of number one, meaning yourself.' "'Certainly,' replied Mr. Bolter. "'You're about right there.' "'Well, you can't take care of yourself, number one without taking care of me, number one. "'Number two, you mean?' said Bolter, who was largely endowed with the quality of selfishness. "'No, I don't,' retorted Fagin. "'I'm of the same importance to you as you are to yourself.' "'I say,' interrupted Mr. Bolter, "'you're a very nice man, and I'm very fond of you, but we ain't quite so thick together as all it comes to.' "'Only think,' said Fagin, shrugging his shoulders and stretching out his hands, "'only consider. You've done what's a very pretty thing, and what I love you for doing, but what at the same time would put the cravat round your throat, that's so very easily tied, and so very difficult to unloose. In plain English, the altar.' Mr. Bolter put his hand to his neckerchief as if he felt it inconveniently tight, and murmured an assent, qualified in tone, but not in substance. "'The gallows,' continued Fagin, "'the gallows, my dear, is an ugly finger-post, which points out a very short and sharp turning that has stopped many a bold fellow's career on the broad highway. To keep in the easy road, and keep it at a distance, is object number one with you. Of course it is, replied Mr. Bolter. What do you talk about such things for? Only to show you my meaning clearly, said the Jew, raising his eyebrows. To be able to do that, you depend upon me. To keep my little business all snug, I depend upon you. The first is your number one, the second my number one. The more you value your number one, the more careful you must be of mine. So we come at last to what I told you at first, that a regard for number one holds us all together, and must do so, unless we would all go to pieces in company." "'That's true,' rejoined Mr. Bolter thoughtfully. "'Oh, you're a cunning old codger. Mr. Fagin saw, with delight, that this tribute to his powers was no mere compliment, but that he had really impressed his recruit with a sense of his wily genius, which it was most important that he should entertain in the outset of their acquaintance. 
to strengthen an impression so desirable and useful, he followed up the blow by acquainting him, in some detail, with the magnitude and extent of his operations, blending truth and fiction together, as best served his purpose, and bringing both to bear with so much art, that Mr. Bolter's respect visibly increased, and became tempered at the same time with a degree of wholesome fear which it was highly desirable to awaken. "'It's this mutual trust we have in each other that consoles me under heavy losses,' said Fagin. "'My best hand was taken from me yesterday morning.' "'You don't mean to say he died?' cried Mr. Bolter. "'No, no,' replied Fagin. "'Not as bad as that. Not quite so bad.' "'What? I suppose he was wanted,' interposed Fagin. "'Yes, he was wanted.' "'Very particular?' inquired Mr. Bolter. "'No,' replied Fagin. "'Not very. He was charged with attempting to pick a pocket, and they found a silver snuff-box on him. His own, my dear, his own, for he took snuff himself and was very fond of it. They remanded him till to-day, for they thought they knew the owner.' Ah, he was worth fifty boxes, and I'd give the price of as many to have him back. You should have known the Dodger, my dear. You should have known the Dodger. Well, but I shall know him, I hope, don't you think so? said Mr. Bolter. I'm doubtful about it, replied Fagin with a sigh. If they don't get any fresh evidence, it'll only be a summary conviction and we shall have him back again after six weeks or so. But if they do, it's a case of lagging. They know what a clever lad he is. He'll be a lifer. They'll make the artful nothing less than a lifer." "'What do you mean by lagging and a lifer?' demanded Mr. Bolter. "'What's the good of talking in that way to me? Why don't you speak so as I can understand you?' Fagin was about to translate these mysterious expressions into the vulgar tongue, and, being interpreted, Mr. Bolter would have been informed that they represented that combination of words, transportation for life, when the dialogue was cut short by the entry of Master Bates, with his hands in his breeches' pockets, and his face twisted into a look of semi-comical woe. "'It's all up, Fagin,' said Charlie, when he and his new companion had been made known to each other. "'What do you mean?' they found the gentleman as owns the box. Two or three moors are coming to identify him, and the artful's booked for a passage out," replied Master Bates. "'I must have a full suit of mourning, Fagin, and a hat-band to wizard him in, afore he sets out upon his travels. To think of Jack Dawkins, lummy Jack, the dodger, the artful dodger, going abroad for a common tumpney apney sneeze box I never thought he'd have done it under a gold watch chain and seals at the lowest. Oh, why didn't he rob some rich old gentleman of all his wallables, and, and, and go out as a gentleman, and not like a common prig, without no honour nor glory?" With this expression of feeling for his unfortunate friend, Master Bates sat himself on the nearest chair, with an aspect of chagrin and despondency. "'What do you talk about his having neither honour nor glory for?' exclaimed Fagin, darting an angry look at his pupil. "'Wasn't he always the top sawyer among you all? Is there one of you that could touch him or come near him on any scent, eh?' "'Not one,' replied Master Bates, in a voice rendered husky by regret. "'Not one.' "'And what do you talk of?' replied Fagin angrily. "'What are you blubbering for?' "'Of course, it isn't on the record, is it?' said Charlie, chafed into perfect defiance of his venerable friend, by the current of his regrets. "'Of course, it can't come out in the diamond. "'Cause nobody will never know half of what he was. "'How will he stand in the Newgate calendar? "'Perhaps not be there at all. "'Oh, my eye, my eye, what a blow it is!' "'Ha, ha, ha, ha!' cried Fagin, extending his right hand, and turning to Mr. Bolter in a fit of chuckling, which shook him as though he had the palsy. "'See what a pride they take in their profession, my dear! Ain't it beautiful?' 
Mr. Bolter nodded assent, and Fagin, after contemplating the grief of Charlie Bates for some seconds with evident satisfaction, stepped up to that young gentleman and patted him on the shoulder. "'Never mind, Charlie,' said Fagin soothingly. "'It'll come out. It'll be sure to come out. They'll all know what a clever fellow he was. He'll show it himself, and not disgrace his old pals and teachers. Think how young he is, too. What a distinction, Charlie, to be lagged at his time of life.' "'Well, it is an honour, that is,' said Charlie, a little consoled. "'He shall have all he wants,' continued the Jew. "'He shall be kept in the stone jug, Charlie, like a gentleman, like a gentleman, with his beer every day, and money in his pocket to pitch and toss with, if he can't spend it.' "'No, shall he, though?' cried Charlie Bates. "'Aye!' "'That he shall,' replied Fagin. "'And we'll have a big wig, Charlie. "'One that's got the greatest gift of the gab, "'to carry on his defence. "'And he shall make a speech for himself, too, if he likes, "'and we'll read it all in the papers. "'Artful dodger, shrieks of laughter. "'Here the court was convulsed. "'Eh, hey, Charlie, eh? Hey? <laughs> laughed Master Bates. What a lark that would be, wouldn't it, Fagin? I say, how the artful would bother him, wouldn't he? Would, cried Fagin. He shall. He will. Ah, oh, to be sure, so he will, repeated Charlie, rubbing his hands. I think I see him now, cried the Jew, bending his eyes upon his pupil. So do I, cried Charlie Bates. <laughs> so do I. I see it all afore me, upon my soul I do, Fagin. What a game! What a regular game! All the big wigs trying to look solemn, and Jack Dawkins addressing of him as intimate and comfortable as if he was the judge's own son making a speech at a dinner. <laughs> In fact, Mr. Fagin had so well humoured his young friend's eccentric disposition that Master Bates, who had at first been disposed to consider the imprisoned dodger rather in the light of a victim, now looked upon him as the chief actor in a scene of most uncommon and exquisite humour, and felt quite impatient for the arrival of the time when his old companion should have so favourable an opportunity of displaying his abilities. "'We must know how he gets on to-day, by some handy means or other,' said Fagin. "'Let me think.' "'Shall I go?' asked Charlie. "'Not for the world,' replied Fagin. "'Are you mad, my dear? Stark mad, that you'd walk into the very place where—' "'No, Charlie, no. One is enough to lose at a time.' "'You don't mean to go yourself, I suppose?' said Charlie, with a humorous leer. "'That wouldn't quite fit,' replied Fagin, shaking his head. "'Then why don't you send this new cove?' asked Master Bates, laying his hand on Noah's arm. "'Nobody knows him.' "'Why, if he didn't mind,' observed Fagin. "'Mind?' interposed Charlie. "'What should he have to mind?' "'Really nothing, my dear,' said Fagin, turning to Mr. Bolter. "'Really nothing.' "'Oh, I dare say about that, you know,' observed Noah, backing towards the door and shaking his head with a kind of sober alarm. "'No, no, none of that. It's not in my department, that ain't.' "'What department has he got, Fagin?' inquired Master Bates, surveying Noah's lank form with much disgust. "'The cutting away when there's anything wrong, and the eating all the whittles when there's everything right. Is that his branch?' "'Never mind,' retorted Mr. Bolter. "'And don't you take liberties with your superiors, little boy, or you'll find yourself in the wrong shop.' Master Bates laughed so vehemently at this magnificent threat that it was some time before Fagin could interpose, and represent to Mr. Bolter that he incurred no possible danger in visiting the police office, that, inasmuch as no account of the little affair in which he had engaged, nor any description of his person had yet been forwarded to the metropolis, it was very probable that he was not even suspected of having resorted to it for shelter, and that, if he were properly disguised, 
it would be as safe a spot for him to visit as any in London, inasmuch as it would be, of all places, the very last to which he could be supposed likely to resort of his own free will. Persuaded in part by these representations, but overborne in a much greater degree by his fear of Fagin, Mr. Bolter at length consented, with a very bad grace, to undertake the expedition. By Fagin's directions, he immediately substituted for his own attire a wagoner's frock, velveteen breeches, and leather leggings, all of which articles the Jew had at hand. He was likewise furnished with a felt hat well garnished with turnpike tickets and a carter's whip. Thus equipped, he was to saunter into the office as some country fellow from Covent Garden Market might be supposed to do for the gratification of his curiosity and as he was as awkward, ungainly, and raw-boned a fellow as need be, Mr. Fagin had no fear but that he would look the part to perfection. These arrangements completed, he was informed of the necessary signs and tokens by which to recognise the artful dodger, and was conveyed by Master Bates through dark and winding ways to within a very short distance of Bow Street. Having described the precise situation of the office, and accompanied it with copious directions, how he was to walk straight up the passage, and when he got into the side, and pull off his hat as he went into the room. Charlie Bates bade him hurry on alone, and promised to bide his return on the spot of their parting. Noah Claypole, or Morris Bolter, as the reader pleases, punctually followed the directions he had received, which, Master Bates being pretty well acquainted with the locality, were so exact that he was enabled to gain the magisterial presence without asking any question or meeting with any interruption by the way. He found himself jostled among a crowd of people, chiefly women, who were huddled together in a dirty, frowsy room, at the upper end of which was a raised platform, railed off from the rest, with a dock for the prisoners on the left hand against the wall, a box for the witnesses in the middle, and a desk for the magistrates on the right, the awful locality last named, being screened off by a partition which concealed the bench from the common gaze and left the vulgar to imagine, if they could, the full majesty of justice. There were only a couple of women in the dock, who were nodding to their admiring friends, while the clerk read some depositions to a couple of policemen, and a man in plain clothes, who leant over the table. A jailer stood reclining against the dock rail, tapping his nose listlessly with a large key, except when he repressed an undue tendency to conversation among the idlers, by proclaiming silence or looked sternly up to bid some woman, "'Take that baby out!' when the gravity of justice was disturbed by feeble cries, half smothered in the mother's shawl, from some meagre infant. The room smelt close and unwholesome, the walls were dirt discoloured, and the ceiling blackened. There was an old smoky bust over the mantel-shelf, and a dusty clock above the dock, the only thing present that seemed to go on as it ought, for depravity or poverty, or an habitual acquaintance with both, had left a taint on all the animate matter, hardly less unpleasant than the thick, greasy scum on every inanimate object that frowned upon it. Noah looked eagerly about him for the dodger, but although there were several women who would have done very well for that distinguished character's mother or sister, and more than one man who might be supposed to bear a strong resemblance to his father, nobody at all answering the description given him of Mr. Dawkins was to be seen. He waited in a state of much suspense and uncertainty, until the women, being committed for trial, went flaunting out, and then was quickly relieved by the appearance of another prisoner, who he felt at once could be no other than the object of his visit. It was indeed Mr. Dawkins, who, shuffling into the office with the big coat-sleeves tucked up as usual, his left hand in his pocket, and his hat in his right hand, preceded the jailer with a rolling gait altogether indescribable and, taking his place in the dock, requested in an audible voice to know what he was placed in that ear disgraceful situation for. "'Hold your tongue, will you?' said the jailer. "'I'm an Englishman, ain't I?' rejoined the dodger. "'Where are my privileges?' "'You'll get your privileges soon enough,' retorted the jailer, "'and pepper with them.' "'We'll see what the Secretary of State for the Home Affairs has got to say to the beaks, if I don't,' replied Mr. Dawkins. Now then, what is this here business? I shall thank the magistrates to dispose of this here little affair, and not to keep me while they read the paper, for I've got an appointment with a gentleman in the city, 
and as I am a man of my word and very punctual in business matters, he'll go away if I ain't there to my time, and then perhaps there won't be an action for damages against them as kept me away. Oh, no, certainly not. At this point, the Dodger, with a show of being very particular with a view to proceedings to be had thereafter, desired the jailer to communicate the names of them two files as was on the bench, which so tickled the spectators that they laughed almost as heartily as Master Bates could have done if he had heard the request. "'Silence there!' cried the jailer. "'What is this?' inquired one of the magistrates. "'A pickpocket in case, Your Worship. Has the boy ever been here before?' "'He ought to have been a many times.' replied the jailer. He has been pretty well everywhere else. I know him well, your worship." "'Oh! You know me, do you?' cried the artful, making a note of the statement. "'Very good. That's a case of defamation of character, anyway.' Here there was another laugh, and another cry of silence. "'Now then, where are the witnesses?' said the clerk. "'Ah, that's right,' added the dodger. "'Where are they? I should like to see them.' This wish was immediately gratified, for a policeman stepped forward, who had seen the prisoner attempt the pocket of an unknown gentleman in a crowd, and indeed take a handkerchief therefrom, which, being a very old one, he deliberately put it back again, after trying it on his own countenance. For this reason he took the dodger into custody as soon as he could get near him, and the said dodger, being searched, had upon his person a silver snuff-box with the owner's name engraved upon the lid. This gentleman had been discovered on reference to the court guide, and being then and there present, swore that the snuff-box was his, and that he had missed it on the previous day, the moment he had disengaged himself from the crowd before referred to. He had also remarked a young gentleman in the throng, particularly active in making his way about, and that young gentleman was the prisoner before him. "'Have you anything to ask this witness, boy?' said the magistrate. "'I wouldn't abase myself by descending to hold no conversation with him,' replied the Dodger. "'Have you anything to say at all?' "'Do you hear his worship ask if you've anything to say?' inquired the jailer, nudging the silent Dodger with his elbow. "'I beg your pardon,' said the Dodger, looking up with an air of abstraction. "'Did you redress yourself to me, my man?' "'I never see such an out-and-out young vagabond, your worship.' observed the officer with a grin. "'Do you mean to say anything, you young shaver?' "'No,' replied the Dodger. "'Not here, for this ain't the shop for justice. Besides which, my attorney is a breakfast in this morning with the Vice-President of the House of Commons. But I shall have something to say elsewhere, and so will he, and so will a very numerous and spectable circle of acquaintance as'll make them beaks wish they'd never been born, or that they got their footmen to hang em up to their own hat-pegs, afore they let em come out this morning to try it on upon me. I'll—' "'There! He's fully committed,' interposed the clerk. "'Take him away.' "'Come on,' said the jailer. "'Oh, ah! I'll come on,' replied the Dodger, brushing his hat with the palm of his hand. "'Ah!' to the bench. "'It's no use your looking frightened. I won't show you no mercy, not a haperth of it. You pay for this, my fine fellers. I wouldn't be you for something. I wouldn't go free now, if you was to fall down on your knees and ask me. Here, carry me off to prison. Take me away." With these last words, the Dodger suffered himself to be led off by the collar, threatening, till he got into the yard, to make a parliamentary business of it, and then grinning in the officer's face with great glee and self-approval. Having seen him locked up by himself in a little cell, Noah made the best of his way back to where he had left Master Bates. After waiting here some time, he was joined by that young gentleman, who had prudently abstained from showing himself until he had looked carefully abroad from a snug retreat, and ascertained that his new friend had not been followed by any impertinent person. The two hastened back together to bear to Mr. Fagin the animating news that the Dodger was doing full justice to his bringing up, and establishing for himself a glorious reputation. End of chapter 43「forty four of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Forty Four. The time arrives for Nancy to redeem her pledge to Rose Maylie. She fails. Adept as she was in all the arts of cunning and dissimulation, the girl Nancy could not wholly conceal the effect which the knowledge of the step she had taken wrought upon her mind. She remembered that both the crafty Jew and the brutal Sykes had confided to her schemes, which had been hidden from all others, in the full confidence that she was trustworthy and beyond the reach of their suspicion. Vile as those schemes were, desperate as were their originators, and bitter as were her feelings towards Fagin, who had led her, step by step, deeper and deeper, down into an abyss of crime and misery, whence was no escape. Still, there were times when, even towards him, she felt some relenting, lest her disclosure should bring him within the iron grasp he had so long eluded, and he should fall at last, richly as he merited such a fate, by her hand. But these were the mere wanderings of a mind unable wholly to detach itself from old companions and associations, though enabled to fix itself steadily on one object, and resolved not to be turned aside by any consideration. Her fears for Sykes would have been more powerful inducements to recoil, while there was yet time, but she had stipulated that her secret should be rigidly kept. She had dropped no clue which could lead to his discovery. She had refused, even for his sake, a refuge from all the guilt and wretchedness that encompasses her. And what more could she do? She was resolved. Though all her mental struggles terminated in this conclusion, they forced themselves upon her again and again, and left their traces too. She grew pale and thin, even within a few days. At times she took no heed of what was passing before her, or no part in conversations where once she would have been the loudest. At other times she laughed without merriment, and was noisy without a moment afterwards. She sat silent and dejected, brooding with her head upon her hands, while the very effort by which she roused herself told more forcibly than even these indications that she was ill at ease, and that her thoughts were occupied with matters very different and distant from those in the course of discussion by her companions. It was Sunday night, and the bell of the nearest church struck the hour. Sykes and the Jew were talking, but they paused to listen. The girl looked up from the low seat on which she crouched, and listened too. Eleven. "'An hour this side of midnight,' said Sykes, raising the blind to look out and returning to his seat. "'Dark and heavy it is, too. A good night for business, this.' "'Ah!' replied Fagin. "'What a pity, Bill, my dear, that there's none quite ready to be done.' "'You're right for once.' replied Sykes, gruffly. "'He is a pity, for I'm in a humour, too.' Fagin sighed and shook his head despondingly. "'We must make up for lost time, when we've got things into a good train. That's all I know,' said Sykes. "'That's the way to talk, my dear,' replied Fagin, venturing to pat him on the shoulder. "'It does me good to hear you. Does you good, does it?' cried Sykes. "'Well, so be it.' <laughs> laughed Fagin, as if he were relieved by even this concession. "'You're like yourself to-night, Bill. Quite like yourself.' "'I don't feel like myself when you lay that withered old claw on my shoulder, so take it away,' said Sykes, casting off the Jew's hand. "'It makes you nervous, Bill. Reminds you of being nabbed, does it?' said Fagin, determined not to be offended. "'Reminds me of being nabbed by the devil,' returned Sykes. "'There never was another man with such a face as yours, unless it was your father, and I suppose he is singeing his grizzled red beard by this time, unless you came straight from the old un, without any father at all betwixt you, which I shouldn't wonder at a bit.' Fagin offered no reply to this compliment, but, pulling Sykes by the sleeve, pointed his finger towards Nancy, who had taken advantage of the foregoing conversation to put on her bonnet, and was now leaving the room. "'Hallo!' cried Sykes. "'Nance, 
Where's the gal going to at this time of night? Not far. What answer's that? retorted Sykes. Do you hear me? I don't know where, replied the girl. Then I do, said Sykes, more in the spirit of obstinacy than because he had any real objection to the girl going where she listed. Nowhere. Sit down. I'm not well. I told you that before, rejoined the girl. I want a breath of air. Put your head out of the window, replied Sykes. There's not enough there, said the girl. I want it in the street. Then you won't have it, replied Sykes, with which assurance he rose, locked the door, took the key out, and pulled her bonnet from her head, flung it up to the top of an old press. There, said the robber. Now stop quietly where you are, will you? It's not such a matter as a bonnet would keep me, said the girl, turning very pale. What do you mean, Bill? Do you know what you're doing? No, what I'm— Oh, cried Sykes, turning to Fagin. She's out of her senses, you know. Or she daren't talk to me in that way. You'll drive me on the something desperate, muttered the girl, placing both hands upon her breast, as though to keep down by force some violent outbreak. Let me go, will you? This minute, this instant. No, said Sykes. "'Tell him to let me go, Fagin. He had better. It will be better for him. Do you hear me?' cried Nancy, stamping her foot upon the ground. "'Hear you?' repeated Sykes, turning round in his chair to confront her. "'Aye. And if I hear you for half a minute longer, the dog shall have such a grip on your throat as will tear some of that screaming voice out. What's come over you, you jade? What is it?' "'Let me go,' said the girl, with great earnestness. Then, sitting herself down on the floor before the door, she said, "'Bill, let me go. You don't know what you're doing. You don't, indeed. For only one hour. Do, do!' "'Cut my limbs off one by one,' cried Sykes, seizing her roughly by the arm. "'If I don't think the gal's stark raving mad, get up!' "'Not till you let me go!' "'Not till you let me go! Never! Never!' screamed the girl. Sykes looked on for a minute, watching his opportunity, and suddenly pinioning her hands, dragged her, struggling and wrestling with him by the way, into a small room adjoining, where he sat himself on a bench, and thrusting her into a chair, held her down by force. She struggled and implored by turns until twelve o'clock had struck, and then, wearied and exhausted, cease to contest the point any further. With a caution, backed by many oaths, to make no more efforts to go out that night, Sykes left her to recover at leisure, and rejoined Fagin. "'Phew!' said the housebreaker, wiping the perspiration from his face. "'What a precious strange girl that is!' "'You may say that, Bill,' replied Fagin thoughtfully. "'You may say that.' "'What did she take it into her head to go out to-night for, do you think?' asked Sykes. "'Come, you should know her better than me. What does it mean?' "'Obstinacy. Woman's obstinacy, I suppose, my dear.' "'Well, I suppose it is,' growled Sykes. "'I thought I had tamed her, but she's as bad as ever.' "'Worse,' said Fagin thoughtfully. I never knew her like this for such a little cause. Nor I, said Sykes. I think she's got a touch of that fever in her blood yet, and it won't come out, eh? Like enough. I'll let her a little blood, without troubling the doctor, if she's took that way again, said Sykes. Fagin nodded an expressive approval of this mode of treatment. She was hanging about me all day and night, too, when I was stretched on me back, and you, like a black-hearted wolf as you are, kept yourself aloof," said Sykes. "'We was poor, too, all the time, and I think, one way or other, it's worried and fretted her, and that being shut up here so long has made her restless, eh?' "'That's it, my dear,' replied the Jew in a whisper. "'Hush!' As he uttered these words, the girl herself appeared and resumed her former seat. Her eyes were swollen and red. 
she rocked herself to and fro, tossed her head, and after a little time burst out laughing. "'Why, now she's on the other tack!' exclaimed Sykes, turning a look of excessive surprise on his companion. Fagin nodded to him to take no further notice just then, and, in a few minutes, the girl subsided into her accustomed demeanour. Whispering Sykes that there was no fear of her relapsing, Fagin took up his hat and bade him good-night. He paused when he reached the room door, and, looking round, asked if somebody would light him down the dark stairs. "'Light him down?' said Sykes, who was filling his pipe. "'It's a pity he should break his neck himself, and disappoint the sightseers. Show him a light.' Nancy followed the old man downstairs with a candle. When they reached the passage, he laid his finger on his lip, and drawing close to the girl, said in a whisper, "'What is it, Nancy, dear?' "'What do you mean?' replied the girl in the same tone. "'The reason of all this,' replied Fagin, "'if he—he pointed with his skinny forefinger up the stairs—is so hard with you, he's a brute, Nancy, a brute beast. Why don't you—' "'Well,' said the girl, as Fagin paused, with his mouth almost touching her ear, and his eyes looking into hers, "'No matter just now. We'll talk of this again. You have a friend in me, Nance, a staunch friend. I have the means at hand, quiet and close. If you want revenge on those that treat you like a dog, like a dog, worse than his dog, for he humours him sometimes, come to me. I say, come to me. He is the mere hound of a day, but you know me of old Nance." "'I know you well,' replied the girl, without manifesting the least emotion. "'Good night.' She shrank back, as Fagin offered to lay his hand on hers, but said good night again, in a steady voice, and answering his parting look with a nod of intelligence, closed the door between them. Fagin walked towards his home intent upon the thoughts that were working within his brain. He had conceived the idea, not from what had just passed, though that had tended to confirm him, but slowly and by degrees, that Nancy, wearied of the housebreaker's brutality, had conceived an attachment for some new friend. Her altered manner, her repeated absences from home alone, her comparative indifference to the interests of the gang, of which she had once been so zealous, and added to these her desperate impatience to leave home that night at a particular hour, all favoured the supposition, and rendered it to him, at least, almost matter of certainty. The object of this new liking was not among his myrmidons. He would be a valuable acquisition with such an assistant as Nancy, and must, thus Fagin argued, be secured without delay. There was another and a darker object to be gained. Sykes knew too much, and his ruffian taunts had not galled Fagin the less, because the wounds were hidden. The girl must know well that if she shook him off, she could never be safe from his fury, and that it would be surely wreaked to the maiming of limbs, or perhaps the loss of life, on the object of her more recent fancy. With a little persuasion, thought Fagin, what more likely than that she would consent to poison him? Women have done such things, and worse, to secure the same object before now. There would be the dangerous villain, the man I hate, gone, another secured in his place, and my influence over the girl, with the knowledge of this crime to back it, unlimited. These things passed through the mind of Fagin, during the short time he sat alone in the housebreaker's room, and, with them uppermost in his thoughts, he had taken the opportunity afterwards afforded him of sounding the girl in the broken hints he threw out at parting. There was no expression of surprise, no assumption of an inability to understand his meaning. The girl clearly comprehended it. Her glance at parting showed that. But perhaps she would recoil from a plot to take the life of Sykes, and that was one of the chief ends to be attained. How, thought Fagin, as he crept homeward, can I increase my influence with her? What new power can I acquire? 
such brains are fertile in expedients. If, without extracting a confession from herself, he laid a watch, discovered the object of her altered regard, and threatened to reveal the whole history to Sykes, of whom she stood in no common fear, unless she entered into his designs, could he not secure her compliance? "'I can,' said Fagin, almost aloud. "'She durst not refuse me, then. Not for her life, not for her life. I have it all. The means are ready, and shall be set to work. I shall have you yet.' He cast back a dark look, and a threatening motion of the hand, towards the spot where he had left the bolder villain, and went on his way, busying his bony hands in the folds of his tattered garment, which he wrenched tightly in his grasp, as though there were a hated enemy crushed with every motion of his fingers. End of chapter 44